You've waited all year, and now it's time. The largest event purse in United Kennel Club history. The field is whittled down from over 1,300 qualifiers. 96 of the best advance to the finals and take their shot at the $250,000 total purse. It's the United Kennel Club's Tournament of Champions. Who will go home with $50,000? Let's make history. It's time. Are you ready? Welcome to the United Kennel Club 2022 Tournament of Champions. I'm your host tonight, Jay Paul Jackson, here in Greencastle, Indiana, host city of the UKC Tournament of Champions this year. The biggest, by far, coonhound competition anywhere in the country with a purse of $250,000. And later on tonight, or I should say tomorrow morning, we're going to be crowning a champion. That Tournament of Champions winner is going to receive a check for $50,000. So we're here with the live stream. We're going to be here until it's all over with in the wee hours of the morning. And I've also got with me my co-host and expert analyst, Rick Stretch and Steve Burkholder. Guys, great to be back tonight, isn't it? It's exciting. I'm telling you, the, the, the closer we get to the finals, the more I've got the jitters. And, and I'm, I'm tickled for everybody out there tonight. Absolutely. You know, this is uh, what we all dream of and uh, down to the final six and really looking forward to see how it unfolds. It's a, a lot of really good dogs left and just some awesome people that are competing. So really exciting. Yes, sir. And so to get here, we started out with a field of 96 dogs that were eligible to come here to, Green, to Greencastle, Indiana. We actually had 94 dogs. We had one dog that was lost uh, for unknown reasons and another your dog, Steve, I believe, that actually came into season. From the original 94, we pared the field down to 24 last night to go out for the second hunt of the night. And then from those 24 that went out in six casts to four each, we got a cast winner to bring us to the final six semifinalists. Uh, as you can see, there were over 1,000 dogs, 1,336 that had five cast wins in 2021. Uh, to be eligible to go to the regionals and qualify. Uh, 795 dogs did that, and 96 of those were eligible to come here to Greencastle for the Tournament of Champions. Tonight, we're going to have two hunts. In the first hunt, we've got our top six finalists, semifinalists going out. These dogs are going to go out in three casts of two dogs each. There'll be a winner, of course, from each cast, and then later on this evening, we will come back with the final three dogs that will go all out head to head in that finals to determine a winner. A lot of great action tonight. We're gonna recap, of course, everything that happened last night for you guys. We're gonna also follow these first six casts as they go into the field. We've got Alan Gingrich, Director of Sporting Operations for the United Kennel Club here with us tonight, who's gonna be bringing us the scores as they come in. And also here at the top of the show in a few minutes, we're gonna bring in um, one of our favorite people, Miss Lynn Carradine from Yukonuba. Of course, we're really, really proud of our United Kennel Club partners. Um, Yukonuba is the official sporting dog food of the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. And we also have a new partner in Dogtra with their GPS tracking collars. So we're going to hear a little bit from Lynn and Yukonuba here in uh, just a few minutes. And we're going to come right back after this break and bring you guys up to date on how we got here and the rest of the action that's going to unfold tonight. The United Kennel Club's Tournament of Champions is brought to you by our official performance dog nutrition partner, Yukonuba. Fuel up, train hard, get after it. And by our official GPS collar partner, Dogtra. Make every dog exceptional.
their partners, ready to do whatever it takes. Athletes that pound for pound can outrun, outwork, and outperform anybody you're watching on Sunday. No contract required. You don't waste that kind of potential. You train it, fuel it, unleash it. You activate the power that sits ready and waiting inside every fiber of muscle. You fill every last cell with the energy to push harder than whatever gets in the way. You turn drive into overdrive, natural ability into legendary status. And to do it, you need nutrition that holds nothing back. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. Built to run full throttle on protein and fat, then find another gear. Made with nutrients that are customized for what your dog does. GI technology that supports optimal nutrient delivery. And an antioxidant cocktail that helps day three feel like day one. Where your dog peaks depends on how far their fuel can take them. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. Four formulas to hold nothing back. Check out the United Kennel Club online store for all of our magazine subscriptions and UKC merchandise. Go to shop.ukcdogs.com and you'll find all the best gear to support your UKC lifestyle. Snag a new hat, hoodie, or t-shirt and subscribe to our many publications, including our world-leading coonhound publication, Coonhound Bloodlines. We even have research pedigrees and rule books available to purchase. Why wait? Shop now. Play music played in bands when I was younger. I remember the very first time I ever went on stage and first time I'm playing in front of a real crowd I walk up to that stage to that trailer and all of a sudden I feel my knees knocking against the side and I'm like oh my god I'm getting butterflies here. I get that same feeling especially in a hunt that is a big deal. It's one thing just to uh, participate at your local club, but when you come to an event like the World Championship was always one of those for me. This is an, an important event, something that you put a lot of work into with your dog, and now the time is here and you hope your dog is going to perform like he had been, you know. Get out of the truck, go back, get your dog out, pet him up a couple times, you know, talk to him a little bit. And here we go, and then it's like you just feel those same type of butterflies. And I always thought that it's good to have butterflies. If you don't get a little bit of that excitement, you probably don't have that passion. It's amazing how many people you get to know in a sport like this. And there's a lot of sports like that, but just a lot of good people that share their passion for dogs, you know? <laughs> Welcome back to the 2022 United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. 
I'm host Jay Paul Jackson here in the studio and was very, very fortunate during the break to have Miss Lynn Carradine from Yukonubo, of course, our premium performance sporting dog food partner for the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions to join us here. Lynn, welcome to the set. Good to see you again. Good being here. Thank you, Jay Paul. Tell you, we've got a really, really great field here. And, and these dogs that we have running, they truly are canine athletes. You know, over the course of the two-day competition here, the, the dogs that make it to the finals, they're going to run for a total of about eight hours spent in the field within a 48-hour period. And if, while they're out there, these dogs really are giving it everything that they have. And uh, that's really important for these guys that they have the proper nutrition. I know at our kennels, we feed Yukonuba Premium Performance and really love it for the dogs for lots of reasons. But tell us what sets your sporting dog foods apart. Well, um, we, like you said, there's a different dog and a different need and a different nutritional need for each one of these dogs. Um, some of these dogs will be running for eight hours at a time. Some of them are just weekend warriors, and so they just need bursts of energy. And so in 2020, we released our premium performance line of products in order to be able to meet the need for those individual dogs and their sporting needs. So we have four different formulas. We have the Sprint formula, which is a intense and short burst of energy formula. The second formula is the exercise formula, and it is for shortened but sustained energy needs. So a dog that's pretty much working, you know, about three minutes or less. Um, the next formula is our sport formula and our most popular. Um, it is affectionately known as the 3020. That one is kind of the R fix all for dogs that are doing activities for four hours or less, but they need more sustained energy um, and then consistent energy, but then they, they need a little dose of uh, muscle recovery. And then we have a fourth formula, which is a little bit less no, well known um, because it's four dogs that are working for eight hours at a time and things like that. And that is our work formula. Good deal. So basically, You've got four formulas out there, no matter you know, what your dog does. I mean, obviously, if you're running a dog, say, in the Iditarod, you know, you're going to want that work formula because that dog is going to be pushing it for a long period of time. You know, uh, like me, we run United Kennel Club HRC hunt test, and our dogs typically are only in the field for seven or eight minutes. So what would you recommend there? Maybe the sprint formula? Actually, for um, those dogs, um, competition time, we'd probably talk about the exercise or sport formula for that seven to eight minute exercise period. Mm -hmm. But what people don't consider is that during training, those are longer, elongated periods where we ask for specific movements or specific training needs. Um, and so you may have to feed a formula during training season that might be a little bit higher power than what you need when you're actually going to competition. So that's always something to consider. So, you know, a lot of us have dogs, e even guys in the coonhound world, that for periods of time, they're not going to be running. There's, you know, a lot of guys taking off season work will not necessarily allow them to be out in the field year round. So for somebody that is going to spend a lot of time, um, let's say, out in the field, you know, seven or eight months of the year, but then they're going to have some downtime. How do you suggest they feed? So that's kind of the beauty of this performance line is you'll be able to feed for the need of what that activity needs are for, you know, that season. So, you know, you might be feeding a work or a sport formula, you know, when you're in the height of training or, you know, moving down to sport when you're doing competition and then moving down to an exercise or sprint formula so that you still get that added muscle recovery, quality nutrition, good balance but you're feeding for a dog that's just not doing as much activity as in the hunt season or during training. So what you're saying is you, know, you may not feed the exact same food all year round. Exactly. You know, we have found through you know, lots of scientific studies that these needs change. Um, and if you really meet exactly what that dog needs at that moment, you know, that's, you know, optimizing the amount of nutrition, it's, pushing their genetic potential as much as humanly possible. And then it's lowering the amount of excess that you're, you're giving. And we all know that balance is, is the, the most important thing. So that performance line makes it so that you can move up and down that line, still get all the benefits of a quality diet, a performance diet, mm -hmm. and still be able to feed for the need of that dog at that time. So 
Obviously, we're here at the Tournament of Champions, a coon hound uh, event. From the description you gave me, it sounds like the 3020 formula would probably be the best choice for just about all of our competitors. Yes. So most of the sport formulas are very good for the competitor dogs. There is the occasional, you know, like, for example, your treeing walkers um, are a little bit higher in metabolism than your blue ticks. And so those possibly may need a work formula um, instead of, you know, a sport formula. But it's truly determining what dog you're actually working and how that dog works, how high his metabolism is, and things like that. It's really evaluating that animal's individual needs. So a guy's feeding, the, let's say, the 30-20 formula. Um, what would be the key indicators that he should look for in his dog that would indicate to him maybe he needs to go a little hotter, if you will, uh, to the work maybe, or back off to the exercise or even the sprint? What, what are those indicators that that person should look for to know? So there's a couple of indicators that we look at. First and foremost is body condition. You know, plain and simple, we always want to make sure that your dog has a phenomenal body condition. They should have good muscle tone, they should have some tuck up, but body condition is probably your fastest indicator of if you need to go down in formula or go up in formula. Your secondary key indicator is of course performance. If you see that your dog is maybe gassing out a little too fast, that dog probably needs more of a you know, fattier food because it needs more sustained energy. Um, but in addition to that, like you can go the opposite way. If you have a dog that's gaining a little weight and you know doesn't seem like he's doing as much, you probably need to move down in the performance line so that you're not giving them too much energy. And then while you're giving them too much energy, causing them to have too much weight gain. And so that is something we want to avoid. But generally, it's going to be body condition. Secondarily, you know, the performance of the animal. And then of course, um, I know no one wants to talk about it, but amount of fecal matter. Um, if your poops are solid and um, consistent and smaller in nature, then you're probably on the right formula. But if they start to soften, you may be feeding too much. Or if they're very, very tiny and very hard, then you may not be feeding enough. Gotcha. So yeah, there's a whole heck of a lot that you really can learn from your dog's feces. I mean, that's something that in our kennel, you know, we're very cognizant of what's going on there because it, it's going to tell you whether you're feeding the appropriate amount, you're feeding too much, um, maybe need to feed that dog twice a day instead of once a day to get them on a good balance out there. And, and speaking of feeding practices in the kennel, uh, for these guys that are running these hounds at events like this, what, what kind of feeding pattern would you suggest in the morning only, in the evening only, twice a day? You know, what are your thoughts there? So um, because these dogs are doing activity for long periods of time, we would like to have them be fed before that activity starts. Now, granted, we want to make sure that they have digested before they start the activity. So um, I would say you know, feeding early in the morning um, so that you can get, I recommend two feedings a day so that that dog can be able to digest more of those feedings instead of digesting a large volume at one time. So um, two times a day, I would do early in the morning and then maybe you know, 30 minutes to an hour before a hunt minimum. Um, generally, we like to see about two hours before you're out and going and doing activity so that dog can digest that meal completely. And then he's got all of that energy stored up from that digested meal in order to, to be able to, to perform all the way to all of his you know, possibilities. So I would say very early in the morning, which means I know that um, a lot of these coon hounds are out late at night. So maybe after the hunt, I would recommend 30, 30 minutes after activity. So after you're out at night, maybe feed that first meal and then a meal about two hours before you're going to go out. So when you're taking a look at the volume that you're going to feed and you're breaking it up over two different meals, uh, is one going to be a little bit bigger than the other? I know we've always, you know, when we feed twice a day, particularly if we're going to run, uh, if we're going to run in the middle of the day and when we feed in the morning, we generally feed a little bit less to reduce uh, a phenomenon called sequel slap. Yeah. Uh, and we feed a little more after exercise. So it is ideal for you to feed a little bit more after exercise because what you're doing is letting the dog be able to recover. Um, and so we want good muscle recovery. And then in addition to that, as that dog is building muscle, recovering, you know, recovering organ and, and then even energy levels wise, um, you know, that dog will come back stronger. Um, so yes, uh, you know, I would say, you know, the, the meal after activity should be a little bit more than the meal before activity.
Gotcha. Well, I'll tell you what, as always, you've been a world of information to us. We really appreciate you, and we appreciate the support, of course, that you can give us all of the sporting dog breeds, particularly the United Kennel Club and the Tournament of Champions here. Great to have had you with us this evening, Lynn. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I look forward to having you back on set again soon. Sounds good. Guys, be sure and stick with us. We're about to take another short break. This one will be pretty doggone brief. And when we come back, we're going to bring back in our expert analyst, Rick Stretch and Steve Burkholder. And we're going to start to break down the field of the six dogs that uh, are going to be going out in the three cast tonight to start off our semifinal round. And we're going to talk to these guys a little bit about who they like in these casts, get to know the owners a little bit, and follow these dogs as they go out into the field. So stick with us. We'll be back with Steve and Rick in just a moment. They're partners, ready to do whatever it takes. Athletes that pound for pound can outrun, outwork, and outperform anybody you're watching on Sunday. No contract required. You don't waste that kind of potential. You train it, fuel it, unleash it. You feed nutrition that holds nothing back. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. This is no ordinary puppy. And this is no ordinary story. This is the tale of a hero in the making. He is born, raised, and fed to rise to any challenge. Because he is no ordinary dog. He's a Yukonuba dog. Yukonuba provides animal proteins and high levels of DHA for a strong body and mind. Feed the extraordinary in your puppy and make your dog a Yukonuba dog. Welcome back to the United Kennel Club Tournament Champions here in Greencastle, Indiana. Uh, once again, I'm J. Paul Jackson, your host tonight, joined back on the set with our experts, Mr. Steve Burkholder and Rick Stretch, and glad to have you guys back. And uh, I tell you, I'm excited about this format tonight with the three cast, two dogs going head to head. That's, a, that's typically a tough round. When you're going head to head against, uh, against another dog, we, uh, we typically see some uh, very competitive cast out there with that. And uh, I, I think we'll see some some good scores tonight. The, coon, the raccoons were moving like crazy last night. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I think it was 170 some seen and 140 wow. some scored on. And uh, I think we'll see the same thing again tonight. Yeah, and, and I know that our Masters Bounds, of course, have you know picked some of the best areas around here and reserved those, held those back for the semifinals and the finals later on tonight. We're going to bring you a lot of the action, and we're really fortunate tonight to also, in addition to these guys, have here in the studio Alan Gingrich, the Director of Hunting Operations for the United Kennel Club. And Alan, you're going to be bringing us a whole lot of information. Tell us what your role is going to be tonight and what you're going to be doing here for us. Yeah, I'm going to have a fun job tonight, and I'm going to bring you all the updates of uh, this round, this first early round. Uh, the Heads Up cast, cast one, two, and three, we've got infield reporters out there. So they're going to give us a start time tonight, so that's going to be my first report for each cast, and then followed by a 30-minute update, a 60-minute update, and then my last update will be the 90-minute, or at 90 minutes, and that's when uh, the cast will be over. All three of them will be 90-minute hunts, so we're looking forward to that. Great. Really looking forward to hearing from Alan also. It's always a lot more exciting when we're getting details and scores as they come in throughout the evening. Uh, this format, 
It is a little bit different. Normally you would have four dogs going out in the cast or, or three to four, depending on how they pan out and they'd be going out for two hours at a time. What do you think about this head to head 90 minute hunt? Well, I've always felt like the, the heads up uh, cast is always one of the toughest casts to win because, you know, you would think competing against three others, you know, you have three that you have to beat, so that would be a little tougher. But actually in the heads up cast, uh, the way the, the strikes are and the way the trees are, you know, uh, when you're hunting four dogs, there's more dogs there to keep the strike open versus two dogs. And it's just, uh, it's a tough round. I mean, a lot of times you can see individual efforts uh, from dogs a little more so. And uh, it, it's exciting. I, you know, uh, getting through this round, I can guarantee you coming in, every one of these guys knew this round was coming, and that's the round they was worried about. Good deal. What are your thoughts on the head-to-head -head competition, Rick? It, it, I agree with Steve. It's tough. Um, if you start out, if you start out uh, low, then you got to climb your way out of that. If you start out high, you need to stay high. And uh, man, it, it, of course, it's a team effort between handler and dog. But if one of you slacks in any any which way possible, you're gonna you're gonna be regretting it later on in the cast. Um, I, I would always rather start out high and try to hang on to it than start out in the hole and try to build my way out. Yes, sir. I'm sure that's probably the strategy of most of these guys. They're going to want to go out there, get their dog loose on a raccoon as quickly as they possibly can and try to be the first one to get up there on the scoreboard. Right. Yep. Well, as I said, we got six dogs going out there tonight. Let's take a look at the cast and the six dogs that we have uh, coming out there. Who all made the draw, Steve? Well, we have, uh, there's, uh, there's, si there's six dogs that, uh, that got here this far, and uh, I got to rib Rick a little bit. Uh, we, uh, yesterday in the pick him, he says he, he lost the paperwork, his paperwork when we picked him yesterday. But uh, we have six dogs, and uh, we, we, I think we uh, mutually felt that all six of them was very capable of getting here. But the first dog we have is uh, um, a dog that's called uh, Night Champion PR Heartland Bonnie. Uh, is the first one that they're competing in cast uh, one, uh, owned by uh, Eldon Corrick uh, and uh, Zach McBee. And uh, uh, in that cast also, they're going to be competing against the dog called Piper that's uh, owned by Ike Rainey and handled by Dual Murphy. Good deal. So let's talk a little bit uh, uh, before we go and take a look at all these. And by the way, folks, we will have... Uh, Get to show you a little bit of an in-close, up-person look. We had the good fortune of talking to all of these handlers today that, are made, that have made it here to the semifinals. So in a few moments, we're going to take a look at all these guys individually, hear their thoughts as well. But before we go down that road and, and throw up the graphic of, of each cast, let's just talk about the six dogs uh, a little bit individually. So who are the two that we have in cast one? Um, well, the, the, the Bonnie female in cast one um, is obviously a female that um, uh, I've, got the, I've had the fortune of hunting with a, a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a little two-year-old female that is just, um, you know, first off, she's, she's owned by a great tandem. Uh, we got to talk to him today, me and Rick both did. Uh, uh, the interview was supposed to last like 15 minutes, and I think we was out there for an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, these are guys that you could literally sit and listen to for, for hours. Uh, Eldon obviously brings, a, uh, you know, he's been around this sport a long time. Uh, this is a, this is a hunt that's it's a dream come true for them to be at this uh, you know be this far in this hunt. Uh, this little female they've won a bunch with like we touched on earlier. Um, you know I actually got to know Zach uh, McBee who's handling her uh, for the last couple of years. We've become great friends. I actually go up to uh, Northern Missouri where he's at, and uh, we actually compete in a hunt up there uh, a couple times a year. Stay at a big uh, cabin and got to know him and his family. You know he. Uh, you know, he, he's a dad of, uh, of two, uh, two children. He's got a, uh, you know, he's got a boy and a girl, uh, you know, and, and Zach's been hunting a long time. He's been hunting since he's been four years old with his dad. And uh, he's has a brother, Jake, that hunts a lot as well, did quite a bit of winning, uh, married to his wife, Jessica. Uh, they're actually uh, expecting their third child. So he's got a lot of things going on. Uh, just a real, just a real humble guy. And, you know, for a lot of, the, uh, for a lot of the viewers, he actually is, um, where he lives at is, is right around the corner from uh, uh, someone uh, that in the sport was an icon in the sport by the name of Elmer Herod. And the last time I was up there, he actually took me over to his old place, and we found trophies there 
uh, that, that we come across from literally the 60s, the, the mid-60s. So really kind of a, a cool thing. You know, he, uh, he, uh, he hunted with John Monroe a lot, you know, since he was eight years old. Um, you know, he's no stranger to, to this stage. He, he actually started competing in the hunts very young. And uh, he was 10 years old, and he won the state championship at, at, at 10 years old in 2000. And uh, so, yeah, just an awesome, and Eldon obviously is second to none, you know, class act guy to you as well. Good deal. So. Well, let, let's let our viewers get to take a look and get to meet Bonnie and Zach. My name's Zach McBee, Downing, Missouri. This is Eldon Cork, my partner on the dog, uh, Heartland Bonnie. He's from La Plata, Missouri. Uh, Bonnie has a a lot of drive and a lot of energy, no quit to her. She's been really good to us in the last two years. Um, she, she's just a, a good coon dog, good coon trier. We're pretty excited. We got, we got a good break in that first round or that second round, so maybe the breaks will keep going. Uh, we've been in some big situations with her in the last year and a half and didn't really pull through, so maybe we can get it to go all the way through on this one. Bonnie went out, had a first strike, first tree on a coon. She had a little hiccup and went back to the tree. Got her recut off that, and the other dogs was treed about a mile and a half the other direction. When I recut her, she went the opposite direction, six tenths of a mile and got treed. So I went and handled her, and it took them around an hour and a half to get to me. So she treed uh, around two hours in the cast, so hopefully her mouth's not horse for tomorrow night. Bonnie, you can't wear this dog down and if if you hunt her every single night, she's gonna come out and give you 100% every single night. Um, she's probably the most energetic and most consistent, reliable dog that I've had and I'm sure Eldon has too. So uh, sure. she's two years old and we've won 46,000 with her, a little over. Um, been in the UKC World Hunt and now this and uh, she's been real consistent and a real good winner for us. It'd be awesome for all the work we put into the dogs, you know, over the years. I've been hunting his whole life, and I've hunted since I was four, so it'd be, be really special. If you look at the dogs that are here, it's the, the biggest top competitors of the nation right now. I think if you win it, you know, you're definitely packing one of the best dogs in the country. So it'd be really, really special. It was great to get to take a look at Bonnie and Zach. Uh, they had a great run last night. Of course, you picked them to be in the 24 and to make it onto the six, and they did. And they're going up against a pretty formidable dog, though, also. Another dog that you picked, by the way. Not going to rub that in too much. But, uh, Rick, uh, the they're picks going up aren't against... near as important as. as <laughs> <laughs> so Bonnie's paired up with Piper in this first cast. Tell us a little bit about Piper. And... Um, Piper's owned by Ike Rainey and Malcolm Rains. Uh, they're out of Florida and uh, handled by Dual Murphy. And uh, I, I kind of have a soft spot in my heart for Piper because she's. She's had to play second fiddle between or behind uh, uh, the dog that Duel typically hunts, and that's Melvin. And uh, Duel and Melvin are just, a, like the word you use, formidable team. They just win everything that they enter. And Piper's just sitting back here on the sidelines, only going occasionally and never getting to see the spotlight all that well. And, uh, and here she is in the top six tonight, competing in a purse for $115,000. And uh, she deserves to be there. I hunted with Piper a time or two, and uh, she's, she's action-packed. She's got a good voice. She's just a sweetheart of a dog. And uh, she gets in there, gets, makes action happen. She strikes quick. She, uh, she, every track she hits seems to be a pretty good track. And she comes treed, and, and that's the end of the game for her. She just stays until Duel goes in there and gets his hands on her. Um, a little bit of a side story on her getting here. I mean, they've all got their stories. Um, Duel's family, uh, they went on vacation the week of the regionals, and he didn't have anybody to take Piper to the regional. Uh, I think she was entered in Ohio from day one, but uh, Duel asked numerous guys, and they either had their own dog or they were on vacation or work didn't permit them to go. And uh, he, he finally lucked in there and, and uh, got Adam Trusty to take her and hunt her. They made a deal like the day before the hunt. And uh, so Adam went to Ohio, scored a big score, I believe like 9.50 on Friday night, 
and uh, come back and won his cast again on four, with 450 on Saturday night. So it really doesn't matter who's at the wheel with, uh, with Piper. I'm sure she probably will perform a little better with Duel this evening. But uh, I think uh, they're going to be a, a team to beat out there. It sure is. I, I hated to see those two draw each other. I'd like to see them both hit the finals. Um, a little bit about Duel. He hasn't been hunting that long at all. Uh, he started hunting, I think, around 25, maybe 26, and he caught on to it quick. I, I don't know what his lifetime earnings is. I think Steve uh, interviewed him earlier today, but uh, he's won everything he's entered just about. And uh, he's got a great young hound there with that Melvin dog, and, and he's got a tremendous support, support team from uh, Ike and Malcolm. They get, they get to go just about everywhere. Um, he's won two pickup trucks, I believe, with two different dogs. Um, so, you know, they, they've been around the horn in a short matter of time. It's, it's uh, previous to this, Duel competed on uh, sport bikes, trail, uh, uh, motorbikes, some kind, of, some kind of sporting event. And I actually got to watch a little bit of it. He competed in an event in Mexico. Um, he, uh, there, there's a, he posted a memory on uh, one of the social media deals the other day, and it was actually him finishing second place in some kind of a national championship or something like that. So he, everything he competes in looks like to me he's going to come out on top of. So kind of exciting for him to be there. Um, I, I, like, I, like I said, Piper's, Piper's uh, I'm thinking she's going to be one to beat. Good deal. Well, you know, you were saying earlier that Piper is a dog that deserved the spotlight, really hadn't been in it a whole lot. But yeah. we got to get, get Piper and Duel both in the spotlight a little bit today, and let's take a look at what they had to say. All right, whatever. All right, my name's Duel Murphy. All right, we'll start over. Yeah. All right. My name's Duel Murphy, and uh, this is my dog, Piper, and uh, I'm from Huntington, Indiana. And we uh, finally made it in the top six, so we're gonna see uh, what we can do tomorrow. She's never been in this type of a big hunt yet, and uh, she's five years old now, and so she's kind of getting older. And I just finally got some pups off of her, so we're excited to be here. And uh, I guess we'll just see what happens tomorrow. You know, <laughs> I actually raised her from since she's been a puppy, and uh, actually bought her off the guy that was just here, Nick Emmel. I mean, it means a lot to me that uh, I've raised her from a pup, you know. I'm pretty excited about it, you know. Uh, 50000 is a lot of money, and uh, we're just happy to be here. I got in a wreck like uh, three months ago and broke my hip, so I don't even know how I'm supposed to be here right now. But uh, we've been chugging along, so. Early round, uh, start off slow. The first hour, she didn't even tree a coon yet. And then the second hour, she ended up treeing three coon. And uh, the other dog in the cast that was closest to me only treated one. So the, the first round was rough, you know. And then this late round, she, she treated one coon and that's all she had to do to, to win. No one else treated a coon. Well, I'm excited, you know, I mean, it is what it is. We're, we're here and we're excited. I probably don't look excited because I'm wore out, but. <laughs> She's whooped. <laughs> She's real whoops. So uh, yeah, she'll be sleeping in the room tonight. <laughs> this is probably like my third cast since my my accident, and uh, if I if I could win, it'd mean a lot for uh, me and my family and the guy I hunt for, I Graney. You know, he'd be pretty proud. And hopefully, we can get it done for him. She's tired of holding herself up. <laughs> Okay, folks, you've got to take a look at cast number one tonight, Bonnie Piper. They're about to go head to head. Both of you guys got to talk a little bit about them. Now it's time to make our pickums. And, and before we start with the pickums tonight, uh, I've got to point out because Steve said that Aren't he was going to beat me severely we're if I did. Right? <laughs> we're not running that low on time. So <laughs> last night, each of these guys in the 24 cast predicted a cast winner. Um, not going to say what the margin of victory was, but Steve was really quick to point out to all of us, particularly Rick here, that uh, he did pick 10 out of the 24. Rick, I don't think you fared so well. I didn't fare so well. And, and uh, you know, part of my job this weekend was to make Burkholder look good. <laughs> and uh, so I accomplished that last night. Um, you know, I got a few texts this morning, you know, asking me if I was not feeling well when I was making my picks. Um, you know, 
So I accomplished quite a bit there last night making Steve look look his best there. So it was, uh, hey, it was a little competitive there, and uh, I was kind of surprised to see him do so well. <laughs> but uh, anyway, tonight's a new night, and uh, some new picks will be made tonight, and I'll, I'll make a rebound tonight. I got you, buddy, and we do appreciate you working so hard to make Steve look good. I know you appreciated that an Absolutely. awful lot, too. But now, here's your opportunity, and Rick, because he did come out on top last night, I'm going to give you first pick here in cast dump. Number one, who's it going to be, two, Piper or Bonnie? Two great females there. I'm telling you what, there's just two dandies right there. But um, I, I'm going to give the edge to Piper just a little bit. Um, I, I believe that uh, I believe her and Duel will will edge it out, pull it out just by a slim margin this evening. Gotcha. So he's going with Piper. Are you going to agree or are you going to go with Bonnie? Well, you know what. Uh, I've hunted with both these females. Uh, like Rick said, two two females that are just top of the line females. But uh, you know, I, I'm gonna stick. I'm gonna stick with my pick from last night. I, I felt like Bonnie uh, coming in uh, had a really legitimate shot at being in the final three. And uh, you know, judging by what she did last night, and uh, you know, I know they're gonna be in great hunting this evening. Uh, I'm gonna stick with Bonnie. I, I think she's still gonna be in the, in the final three, and uh, you know, but it, it wouldn't shock me if Piper won as well. But I, I'm gonna stick with Bonnie uh, for two reasons. Number one, I think she's capable of winning this whole thing, and and number two, it's opposite from what Rick picked. I hear you. <laughs> also, got to point out, 24 casts last night. On 23 of the 24, these guys disagreed. There was only one cast where they both uh, predicted the same person to come out on top, and they were both wrong there. But I, I joined in with them on that one, and I was too. A uh, couple of my buddies were after me today wanting to know why I didn't pick on every cast last night. And I told them it's because these guys are the experts, not me. But tonight, I want to get in the fun too. So I'm going to agree with you, Rick. Well, I think Piper is going to come out of cast one on top. So my pick is going to be Piper. All right, guys, so that's the first cast. Of course, we have uh, two more to go. Let's take a look right quick at our dogs that are coming up here in cast uh, number two. I believe we've got a graphic there. So cast number two, we've got uh, McGregor and Gabby. Um which one of you guys wants to tell us a little bit about Conor McGregor? I think, Rick, you'd said you wanted yeah, to. Yeah, I'll go that route there. Um, I, I, uh, I met JR uh, at the UKC World Hunt in 2018 when, he, when the World Hunt was held at our club at Mount Gilead. And uh, they went on to win the World Hunt, him and his dog, Willie. And uh, I got to go out on the final cast, and uh, Willie really put on a good performance. Uh, JR, uh, his nerves got the best of him a time or two, and his dog was able to pull it out for him. And, and what a good team they are, you know. And uh, this dog that he's hunting this weekend is, is out of Willie. And actually, his name is Connor McGregor, and he goes by Connor. And uh, he's out of uh, another story here. He's out of Johnson Creek Abbey, owned by Nick Emmel. And actually, Abbey has got two dogs in this hunt, and I think Steve's going to touch on on uh, on Gabby here in a few minutes, but uh, back to Connor, um, he's 28 months old. He's he's one of the youngest ones out there, and uh, he uh, how Jr. come to get him? He took a stud fee pup whenever Nick went down and bred uh, uh, Abby to him, and uh, he uh, Jr. picked one that looked like Abby when they were babies, and uh, Nick picked one that looked like uh, Willie. And uh, so that's kind of a, a neat story on that. Um, he, uh, he's a night champion, and uh, I believe he's got six cast wins already this year for the TOC, which he only needs five. And uh, anyway, that's, that's a little bit of, of knowledge on what, what I found out from, uh, from JR about that. Eric Emery's out there doing the backup handling on the dog. There's always an honorage with those guys. Whenever they pull into a hunt, they've got to come in two vehicles. And uh, Jr. has just got, he's got a fan base that's out of this world up here this weekend. Good deal. Well, we've heard about them. Now let's take a look at what they had to say this afternoon. You just wait till you get up here, big boy, all right? So my name is Jr. Gray. I'm from London, Kentucky. I'm up here hunting a two-year-old named Connor. The night went pretty good. He operated like he's supposed to. And I mean, he, uh, he treated, well, he, we scored on four singles early, he treated. 
and then uh, late round he treed uh, four more. So he, he's looking all right. The early round, uh, we cut everything loose. There's a blue dog treat, he's got a coon. Connor's treat, he's got a coon. Well, a slim dog, he's on a den. We get them off of that, recut them. Connor goes, gets treed. The slim dog comes in and covers him. Well, Connor leaves, I take 125 minus. We get to him, slim's, you know, where Connor left, has a coon. Connor set and treat about 300 yards on past him. We go to Connor, he's got another coon. Uh, the stony dog gets treed. We're walking it, it shuts up and then Slim's treed in that direction. We go to Slim, Slim's got a coon. Connor's sitting across the road about 900. We go to him, he's in somebody's yard treed. He's got another coon, that's his third one. And then we get him off that, recut him, and he's .93 uh, sitting at the end of the hunt. I wasn't wanting to tree him, but it worked out where I had to. And we go to him and he's got a coon to win. Well, I felt like I had it about with 30 minutes left to go. <laughs> I might have treated three singles and you know we only we only scored on one other coon besides that at the time so but hopefully we just keep him operating for tomorrow night. Connor's I guess what makes him so special to me is just his ability how he can get treed so quick. I mean it don't matter if you got a minute left in a hunt you can cut him loose and he may be 500 yards treed in just a second. It's pretty awesome getting here you know final six uh, you know tomorrow win one cast we'll be hunting guaranteed 20,000 and up to 50 so that's, that's always exciting. Right now, we're, yeah, right now we're a little tired. I tell you what, you watch that video and you can tell that this young man is super excited to be here with Connor and to have made it to the semifinals. And that's he, how he is every time you see him. That's just how he is. Yeah, I enjoyed really meeting him the first time around yesterday when they were coming through the line. Upbeat, great attitude. You better have it because. He's up against another really, really good one tonight in Gabby. Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about Gabby and her handler? Well, absolutely. So uh, Johnson Creek Gabby uh, is owned by a young man by the name of Nick Immel. And uh, Immel actually started hunting when he was 13 years old. And uh, Nick actually grew up uh, uh, about an hour from where I, where I hunted, where I lived at for uh, a majority of my life. And uh, so I watched Nick come to these hunts before he even had a driver's license yeah. and uh, remembered some of the dogs that he brought to these hunts and uh, watched him grow up as a young man. And uh, he started hunting some really, really good dogs. And I remember he uh, acquired a dog by the name of uh, All Grand Track Rat, who happens to be Piper's Sire, the one that we just talked about before, uh, that's in this, and that was Nick's dog, and he had that dog from five years old on, uh, competed with him for a lot of years, did a lot of winning with him, and he bred Track Rat to his uh, little female he called Babe that he granted out, and that's where Johnson Creek Abbey come, and Abbey's a platinum champion. I mean, this little female was a tough female, hunted with her more times than I can count, and Abby is obviously the sire of Gabby and Conor McGregor. So uh, Nick has a lot of, uh, he's pretty excited about this, uh, this, this weekend. You know, having three dogs that he has close ties to that he had a big part of uh, being here. He's super excited to be here. You know, the little Gabby female, I asked him how does she, uh, uh, you know, how does she compare to Abby? And he said, well, there'll only be one Abby, and I know what that is like. You know, that was his first dog that he really won big with. But he has a lot of high hopes for this little uh, three-year-old female, and uh, she's uh, definitely a female that could go a long ways here. So Connor's out of Willie, and uh, Gabby is out of Schooner River Fred Bear, which Daniel Wilson had that dog. They, they, go, they call him Hank, I guess, is the call name yeah, or something yep, like that? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, both them dogs are in the state from the state of Indiana. So I mean, they're all them guys are all hunt together. They pleasure hunt back and forth with each other, and now they're here on the big stage hunting for you know, for uh, you know, one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. Incredible, crazy. Yeah, great story there. And let's take a look right quick and get to meet both Nick and Gabby. I'm Nick Immel. I'm from Bluffton, Indiana, and this is my dog Gabby. As you can tell, she's pretty mild dog I guess uh, good temperament dog um, good hunter though um, I raised uh, both of her uh, mom and dad and I can tell that that's a lot of the same temperament in this dog here in the coon hunting uh, pretty good about treeing coons and uh, just getting in there and getting the job done when we came down here today I was just thinking this is going to be a good night and um, the first round went really well and second round went almost even better. She treed three coons in the late round 
and did a really good job. And now we're sitting here, so hopefully we can win it. Tell you what, Nick really is a super nice young man, and Gabby is quite a dog. And of, of course, Nick, he's got a really good chance tonight. He's seen a lot of success in the past. As a matter of fact, if you notice the collar that was on Gabby tonight, uh, Steve, you were just telling me that that's kind of a, a special collar. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Nick shared with us earlier uh, when he left to come to this hunt, uh, I asked him, hey, why don't you share something with us that a lot of people may not know? And one of the stories that he shared with is uh, before he left, he actually had a, a full littermate, uh, Abby, he called Izzy, that he won the world hunt with a few years ago. And Izzy passed away, and he kept that collar. And right before he left, he took uh, Gabby's main collar off and took Izzy's collar that he had hanging up and put it on her to bring her to this hunt, uh, kind of for a good luck omen. And here he is in the top six. So uh, really pretty neat story. You know, I, I know being around these hunts a long time, we do, you know, we do some goofy stuff, but it just brings back a lot of good memories. So he shared with us, and that was pretty awesome. Yeah, man, as a dog guy, that really is cool to take that collar and bring it out of retirement there and he's got high hopes tonight i wish him a lot of luck but now the moment of truth guys cast number two we've met connor we've met gabby i'm gonna start with you this time uh steve who you gonna pick well i tell you what i i know both these dogs uh obviously know gabby a little bit better um you know i i don't i man you know this could go one way or the other uh both of them very capable but uh, I'm going to stick with my original pick. I'm going to go with Conor McGregor. I think he's going to pull this cast win off. I really do. I hate to pick against both of my friends, but uh, if I have to choose one, that's who I'm going to go with. Good deal. So I'm going to. All right. So, Rick, are you going to agree or disagree? Who are you going to pick? Um, you know, if we had to pick a breeder of the weekend, you know, we're probably looking at Nick. And uh, I don't think that's where it stops for him this weekend. I think he's going to. I think they're going to win this round and, and move right on into the finals. So I'm going to go with Gabby and Nick this time. You guys do realize that it is not a rule that you guys have to disagree on every pick. Y'all know that, right? Well, I tried to pick the winner. <laughs> <laughs> I know we noticed. <laughs> I did. No, All right. that's just true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this time uh, I'm going to have to go with Steve here, Rick. I, my money's on Connor for this one. This is a young dog. He's been really, really hot. You pointed out the fact that he's already got six cast wins, so I believe yeah. he's he already qualified every, for the 23 yeah. TOC, correct? He doubles up every weekend that they go somewhere. He wins Friday night, he wins Saturday night. So He does. You know, it's just a dry, uh, uh, just like pulling a feather out of a hat. You're, we don't know who's going to win, but uh, we got to make a pick. So that's well, that's exactly doing. why I'm going with Connor. He wins Friday night. He did it last night. He wins Saturday there night, tonight, Saturday night. So... Uh, I'm going to go with you on this one, Steve, and I'm going to go with Conor McGregor. So now we're down to cast number three, our last cast of the semifinals. Um, here in this cast, we have two uh, more great dogs, Dominator and Joe Manning and Echo and, and Logan Rose. Uh, let's start with Dominator. Which one of you guys wants to talk a little bit about Dominator for us? I met up with uh, Joe this afternoon and... Uh... <clears throat> What a good guy that guy seems to be. I mean, he, uh, I, I really enjoyed chatting with him. Uh, Joe's a little more closer to my age than the, than the other guys are, so I, I told Steve that I wanted to interview Joe. And uh, we got out there and we just chatted. We chatted about everything. And uh, we started off, I, I didn't think, I couldn't remember our paths ever crossing, uh, but, but they did cross into finals of the 2012 uh, World Championship, and uh, Joe was hunting an old called Texas Magic, and I was hunting Frisky, and we drove each other on the second round, I believe it was, and uh, we scored on three coons. We also had uh, Doug Compton with Bone Collector in the cast, and each dog scored on three uh, on a coon apiece, and uh, luckily Frisky and I were able to come out on top. But that was my first experience with Joe, and this afternoon we t we chatted about that a little bit, and we chatted about a lot of things, and. The one thing that Joe wanted to point out immediately was uh, Cole McVeigh, who is the owner of these dogs, and how great a job he does helping Joe get these dogs ready. These guys have got a stable full of winners. They won the PKC World Hunt uh, last fall. They've, they've won a truck hunt. They, they are on a roll like none other right now. And, uh, you know, it was kind of nice seeing Joe kind of say, hey, you know what, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Cole. 
and all of his efforts that he puts out there. And kind of kind of good to see somebody else get a little credit that's not able to come this weekend. A um, couple things. Uh, uh, they won the PKC World Hunt with another dog called Goose. Uh, Dominator, he uh, won a truck hunt recently. A um, couple things here that uh, as a handler, Joe got two dogs into Super Stakes. Uh, handled two different dogs, got them both into Super Stakes, one of them being Dominator and then another dog that they own. Um, let's see here, he, uh, the truck hunt, going back to the truck hunt there, they had that hunt at Claremore, Oklahoma. And I think uh, Joe had scored on over 19 coons, maybe 20 coons that wow. weekend with that dog. And uh, what a good time that was for him. I asked Joe what he'd done for a living and uh, he smiled real big and he's retired. And I, I believe his age is 52. And uh, he worked, uh, he had a more of a oil field production company. Mm -hmm. And uh, when COVID uh, kind of struck us there, he, uh, he found a way, uh, it was just time for him to get out and it, and it worked out great for him and his family. Good deal. Well, Dominator obviously has had some dominating performances to get here. Let's take a look at Dominator and Joe and what they had to say this afternoon. My name is Joe Manning. I'm from Buffalo, Texas. Um, this is my dog, Thunderbird's Dominator. He's three years old. He's not real personal with strangers. Uh, he's kind of a one-person dog, um, uh, but a very loving, affectionate kind of dog, but he doesn't like a lot of crowds, that's for sure. Probably from the first time I hunted with him, knew he was special. The thing I love most about him is his consistency. Um, when you turn him loose, he has one thing in mind, and that's treating a coon as fast as he can. And uh, he's just very good about having a coon. I won the 2021 PKC World Hunt this year, but I hunted a lot of major events, so um, I won a, a truck this year as well. Free cab Ford Ranger four wheel drive. Actually, Dom won it for us. Oh, I'm feeling ecstatic right now, for certain. I treat two coons that we scored on. Um, I had them treat in the first 30 minutes. I treated Kenya the truck first and first on it recut into the other dogs and treat another coon for a quarter and um, 125. And then I had one treat at the end, but didn't have to treat him. Um, but we looked at, um, I think, five coons during our cast. Had a great cast, really good group of guys, good group of dogs. One step at a time, it's just the two of us together out there. We're, we're a team and I'm gonna call him for what he does. It'll work out in the end. Winning the TOC. It's, one thing to scratch off the bucket list, you know. Um, uh, it's one of those things that we all dream about, especially those of us that run up and down the road. This is all that we do. Um, it, it'd be quite an honor, without a doubt. And the money would afford us to go to a few more. So, <laughs> probably ready for some breakfast. Tell you what, Joe is another guy that I got to meet and really, really like. You could see in the video there, he's happy to be here. Just a, a genuinely nice guy. Also really cool to see him giving credit, you know, to others uh, yeah. in, in getting here and wish him a lot of luck. And tonight they're going up against a really tough team, though. Uh, Dominator has drawn a, another great dog. I'm not sure. Did you pick Echo last night? Uh, or did you? No, I didn't pick Echo. I, don't, I believe he was the one that I had. Yeah, yeah. I think that was yeah, one yeah, of your winners yeah. last night. One of many, I think. Yeah, so you picked it, but I'm going to let you tell us about it. Talk a little bit about Echo, please, Steve. Absolutely. So uh, Echo is actually out of a dog called Old South Stylish Knockout, which was here this weekend and competed as well in the top 96. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a neat backdrop on him. But I tell you, I got to meet the owner and, and uh, trainer, handler uh, of Echo today. He's a young man by the name of Logan Rose. He's from Kentucky. And uh, you talk about a fine young gentleman. I, you know, I'd never met Logan before. We got to sit down and, and, and share some things. and. Uh, uh, you know, he, uh, man, this guy has got, he's got a lot of irons in the fire, but, he, you know, he, uh, he graduated school. He's actually graduated high school early, uh, wanted to go to college, and he's actually graduating this summer with his associates in criminal justice. Uh, he works a full-time job. He, uh, he also uh, uh, played basketball in high school. That was one of his highlights. He played on a pretty good team, uh, went quite a ways uh, in a couple years in that and doing that. Uh, and that was really, he said he had a lot of fun doing that. Um, Logan has been hunting since before he could walk. His dad, when he turned two years old, told his mom, he comes from a family of hunters, told his mom that he's going to buy Logan his first squirrel dog. And uh, so he grew up hunting squirrel dogs. His dad never really coon hunted. And about seven years ago, uh, 
somebody, a couple of his friends was coon hunting, so he got introduced, introduced to coon hunting, uh, really enjoyed it, started doing that. Now, he's the only one of the family that coon hunts. And, uh, but, you know, he, he really taught highly of his mom, his mom and dad uh, and his brother. Uh, his dad doesn't hunt, but he said, you know, uh, I asked him, you know, how soon did you call your dad? And he said, well, I called him this morning, got him out of bed at 5 o'clock. And, uh, and, he, and, and, and he said he was glad to take that phone call. So uh, just, a, just a young man. And one really neat thing about this, uh, again, uh, there's so many awesome stories, but J.R. Gray, who's hunting uh, uh, Conor McGregor, he wanted to get in these hunts and figure out how to get one ready. J.R. Gray took him underneath his wing, and, and he's been hunting with J.R. Gray to get him ready for these hunts. Wow. So now here they are in the top six. So really, really pretty cool story. I'll tell you what, and I guarantee you, Logan's dad, uh, if he's not watching all night long, he's not going to mind if he gets a call that wakes him up in the wee hours again tomorrow morning for sure. And so with that, let's take a look at Logan and Echo. I'm Logan Rose, and uh, I'm from Jackson County, Kentucky, and this is Echo. We're both wore out. We've been up a long time, a long way from home. Uh, looking forward to tomorrow kind of nervous about it all. Never really been this far in a big hunt, so we're excited. Echo's just really a, been enjoying the hunt for the last two and a half years since uh, I've had him. And uh, I just look forward to the future with him. Uh, the first round, it's pretty shaky to begin with. Everything was treating cones but us. Uh, and he got on a roll and treated three real quick. In the last hour, kind of sealed the deal. And uh, late round, he treated the only coon we've seen. I treated him with 25 minutes left or something, we went and scored a dog and got to him when time was out and uh, he had a cone. One, as a dog, this is about it. I mean, this is just how he is. He's pretty chilled out all the time. Everybody can't believe he does what he does because this is how he is 90% of the time. He's, uh, he's special. Probably the most special thing about him is I raised him since he was born. I've had him for all two and a half years he's been alive. and. Uh, just, uh, he means means a lot to me. He's just uh, real easy going. I mean, you'd never think he'd treat cones the way he can, but I mean, he, when he's got his head on, he can, he can really treat them. Uh, if we messed around one of the TOC, it'd be pretty life changing. I mean, uh, I'm in college right now, and it would it would be awesome. Just, uh, it really means something when you draw some of these guys you've read about and seen on Facebook and Pro Hound and in the Bloodlines book and. You draw out with them and compete with them or maybe even beat them. And uh, just trying to make a name for myself is really something I've tried to do with him. And uh, here we are. Okay, folks, there you have it. All six of our semifinalists. Of course, that was cast number three. Uh, moment of truth for you guys. Who are you going to take here? in this third and final cast? I'm gonna go with Joe Manning and Dominator. I, I just, uh, they win everywhere they go. I think they may pull something off this weekend as well. So, <laughs> are you gonna I, keep the streak alive or are you finally gonna I, agree about something? I, I you know, uh, Rick got me on this one. He set this up perfect. Uh, he's good at doing <laughs> them kind of things. Uh, but you know, I'm gonna have to agree with Rick. Uh, I believe that I believe that Dominator again. Uh, Joe's been on a roll. This dog has been on a roll. Uh, anything can happen. Uh, obviously, the Echo Dog is an amazing young talent. Uh, very easy could come in the winter. But uh, you know, we we've, we've all been in these hunts for us competitors. And when you get on a roll, you know, it's really hard. Momentum is a is a big thing in these hunts. They are obviously on a big roll right now. I'm going to pick Dominator in this cast. I'm going to have to agree with Rick. As much as it pains me, and I'm going to pick Dominator uh, to win this cast. Wow, well, miracles never cease. Both these guys finally agree on something. And <laughs> you know what, guys? I'm going to have to agree with you both. I like that Dominator dog, and he has been dominating. You get talking about a dog here who has been – on a consistent role. Of course, that's kind of a current theme with all six of these, but here in cast number three, I'm gonna put it down that I'm gonna agree with both you guys and I'm going with Dominator also. Okay, folks, so we've taken a look at our six dogs, our three cast. Uh, we're about to take it to break here in just a couple of minutes. I just got an update from our director of hunting operations, uh, Alan Gingrich, who told me that 
All three casts are en route to the field. I don't think that anyone has been turned loose yet, but hopefully by the time we come back after this break, uh, we'll be able to let you know that indeed the 90-minute clock has begun on at least one, if not all three of these casts. But before we do go to break, let me remind everybody out there that's watching us here on our live stream that we're also keeping updates going and information feeding through all of our social media links. As a matter of fact, if you take a look on the screen there, you can see exactly how to follow us on social media. Of course, on Facebook, uh, it's at UKC Hunting Ops. Same thing uh, for Instagram. And then be sure not only to watch us here, obviously you are on our YouTube channel, but like and subscribe to the UKC Dogs uh, YouTube channel here. And also, if you go to the United Kennel Club website, uh, we've been posting the results of each run there in the forums as well. Go to the UKC Coonhound forums, and you can get a lot more information there on the United Kennel Club website also about the Tournament of Champions and what's going on here. So be sure and check us out on social media. Stick around. We're going to take about a seven eight-minute break, a little bit longer than normal, probably one of our longest of the night. So you got time, uh, go get you a snack, something out of the refrigerator, hit the bathroom, that's what. We're fixing to go grab a snack here, I think, as well, and we'll be right back with all the action here from the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions here in Greencastle, Indiana, in about eight minutes.
My name is John Irvin. I'm from Athens, Ohio. His name is uh, Stover's Charlie Creek's Bad Butch. He's, he'll be three in July. He's laid back. He don't care what the other dogs think. He's usually by himself. Uh, dogs come into him. He just, you know, he just stays back. He's, uh, he's real accurate most of the time. He, uh, when he trees, he's got coons. He's relaxed here, but when you unstrap him, he's just like, he's gone. He moves around 12, 13 mile an hour. He's probably the hardest tree dog you ever hear in the woods. First round, he made two trees. Um, he had a den tree way through, and then cut him off of that one. And he treed on another den and uh, got lucky. I was hitting on the tree and got to see the coons, so that gave me plus points there. The other two um, dogs that still could have beat me was treed. And uh, one of them was on a den tree and one of them was on a slick tree, so that's how we made it to the, the final four. And then the final four was, it started out kind of tough and then all the dogs got treated in there together. And he hasn't been with the dog all week and they decided that <laughs> right out of the truck they're all going to treat together and, and then they got separated like they're supposed to do. And he got way behind the cast. He was treated in there for an hour and 45 minutes and I couldn't hear him. I know he's treed from the Garmin, and uh, two dogs got treed, and we walked in there, and they was on a slick tree. So now I'm winning the cast. The trip dog got treed way through, and he was on a slick tree. So now I'm still winning the cast, and then the rock dog got treed before the hunt was out, and uh, we had to walk about nine-tenths of a mile back to him, and that was a long walk, <laughs> let me tell you. I knew I had second locked up, but you know nobody comes to you know play for second. And we got in there, and then they started shining the tree, and it was a long eight minutes. It felt like an hour. First one up! Woo! Congratulations, buddy! <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Good Thank you. you. Yep. Good luck, buddy. Congratulations. It feels good. I've knocked on the door a bunch, but never could make it into the final cast of anything, and well, we finally done it. Did you know that your monthly subscription to Coonhound Bloodlines comes packed with upcoming UKC event information, official UKC event results, and articles of interest about coon hunting? It sure does. Read about the top competition hunters and hounds, as well as stories about pleasure hunting and bench show hounds. Subscribe today or renew online at shop.ukcdogs.com. Slide is uh, just turned nine years old in November. He's actually one of these dogs that you don't have to hunt a whole, whole lot. I know everybody says you gotta hunt them every night and you normally do to have a good dog, but with a seasoned older dog like this, you don't have to hunt them near, near as much. But only five UKC hunts that Slide was in was last year. He's never been put in a UKC hunt until last year. And he doubled up at the UKC Winter Classic for two wins. He won a third win in the RQE. He won his fourth win at All of Moats, and he won his fifth win in the Zones. He's a very special dog to my young man right here. It's his dog. Uh, the Triple Crown starts with the Winter Classic. Uh, if you win your cast down here, you get 50 points with plus points, of course. That's on Friday night. If you win on Saturday night with plus points, you get another additional 50 points. 
and then the second leg is actually the autumn oats. If you win your cast in the autumn oats, you get another 50 points. Uh, then you have to qualify for the world hunt. Uh, the RQA does not count as far as points total, but when you go to the zones, if you win your cast in the zones, you get 25 points for each night, Friday and Saturday, then you advance to the world. And for each cast you win at world, you get 10 additional points. And at the total of that, whoever's got the most points at the end of the year is the winner of the Triple Crown. The reason I even hunt as slide is the female that I was going to have come in heat and he was sitting in the pen next to her and I grabbed him and brought him down here and doubled up and I decided, hmm, let's try for the Triple Crown. And this is my little sidekick right here. He went everywhere with me. We went to the zones in Arkansas, went to Autumn Oats in Indiana and actually drawled out, went all the way to, to Ohio and hunted up there and he was with me every step of the way. One time that I didn't hunt him, he hunted him in April, so March was when we won the RQE. In April, he carried him to the St. Jude World's Largest Coon Hunt, and he actually won the youth division 13 and under with him over there. The last time he's been out was in December, which is at the youth four-wheeler hunt in Tennessee. They hunt for a brand new four-wheeler, and he won his cast and got in the top 16 with him at the youth four-wheeler hunt. It takes a consistent dog. It's a very prestigious thing. It's one of the top prestigious things in UKC besides the World Hunt and the Tournament of Champions. I used to play music, played in bands when I was younger. I remember the very first time I ever went on stage and first time I'm playing in front of a real crowd, I walk up to that stage, to that trailer, and all of a sudden I feel my knees knocking against the side and I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting butterflies here. I get that same feeling, especially in a hunt that is a big deal. It's one thing just to uh, participate at your local club, but when you come to an event like the World Championship was always one of those for me. This is an, an important event, something that you put a lot of work into with your dog, and now that time is here and you hope your dog is going to perform like he had been, you know. Get out of the truck, go back, get your dog out, pet him up a couple times, you know, talk to him a little bit. And here we go, and then it's like you just feel those same type of butterflies. And I always thought that it's good to have butterflies. If you don't get a little bit of that excitement, you probably don't have that passion. It's amazing how many people you get to know in a sport like this. And there's a lot of sports like that. but. Just a lot of good people that share their passion for dogs, you know? <laughs>
and here we go. And then it's like you just feel those same type of butterflies. And I always thought that it's good to have butterflies. If you don't get a little bit of that excitement, you probably don't have that passion. It's amazing how many people you get to know in a sport like this. And there's a lot of sports like that, but just a lot of good people that share their passion for dogs, you know? <laughs> They're partners, ready to do whatever it takes. Athletes that pound for pound can outrun, outwork, and outperform anybody you're watching on Sunday. No contract required. You don't waste that kind of potential. You train it, fuel it, unleash it. You activate the power that sits ready and waiting inside every fiber of muscle. You fill every last cell with the energy to push harder than whatever gets in the way. You turn drive into overdrive, natural ability into legendary status. And to do it, you need nutrition that holds nothing back. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. Built to run full throttle on protein and fat, then find another gear. Made with nutrients that are customized for what your dog does. GI technology that supports optimal nutrient delivery and an antioxidant cocktail that helps day three feel like day one. Where your dog peaks depends on how far their fuel can take them. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. Four formulas to hold nothing back. Check out the United Kennel Club online store for all of our magazine subscriptions and UKC merchandise. Go to shop.ukcdogs.com and you'll find all the best gear to support your UKC lifestyle. Snag a new hat, hoodie, or t-shirt and subscribe to our many publications, including our world-leading coonhound publication, Coonhound Bloodlines. We even have research pedigrees and rule books available to purchase. Why wait? Shop now. Welcome back to the 2022 United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. I'm J. Paul Jackson, your host this evening throughout the live stream. Of course, to my right here is one of our expert analysts, Steve Burkholder. And also on my left here, uh, we have Rich, Rick Stretch. Both of these guys truly are experts in the coonhound world. Now, we, before we went to break there, we talked about the six dogs and the three casts that are going out to the field in the semifinal round tonight. Uh, Took a little bit of a lengthy break there. Appreciate you guys sticking with us. For those of you who are just joining us now, we're fixing to follow the action pretty much nonstop for the next hour, hour and a half until it's over with. Because while we were at break, I was informed that all three of our cast have now uh, turned <clears throat> loose. And throughout the, this first run here, the first hunt of the evening, we're going to be updating you with scores all throughout it until the very end. And to do that and to tell us a little bit about the format tonight, uh, about the judges and what's going on out there in the field, we're fortunate to have with us the United Kennel Club Director of Hunting Operations, Mr. Alan Gingrich. So, Alan, tell us what's going on, when these teams kicked off, and what we're about to see or hear. All right, guys, we have some action. We've got all three casts turned loose. On cast number one, we have uh, uh, Chris Girth is judging cast number one. 
Uh, he is flanked by Andy Canada, who is his assistant judge this evening. This cast is being or being guided by Tyler Pettit, and cast number one obviously has Bonnie with Zach McBee, or McBee out of Missouri, uh, Piper with Dual Murphy out of uh, Indiana handling, and our reporter this evening is also going to be Tyler Pettit, and cast number one has a 9.40 start time. So cast number two is being judged by Jason Bryant out of Michigan. It is being guided by Mike Comer. His assistant judge is uh, Jeremy Cox. And that cast number two is Connor with J.R. Uh, J. Gray out of Kentucky uh, against uh, Gabby with Nick Imel from Indiana. And our reporter this evening is Clayton Stark. He's out of Ohio. Uh, and they have a 9.44 start time for cast number two. Cast number three, we have our judges, uh, Cody Seip. He's flanked by Chase Blevins as his assistant judge. The guide is Cody Carter. And that cast number three is Dominator with Joe Manning out of Texas. Echo with 19-year-old uh, Logan Rose handling. Uh, Echo, he's out of Kentucky. And reporting from the field tonight for us is Cody Carter. And cast number three has a 9.35 start time. So all three casts are under, well underway at this point. And our next update will be uh, the first 30 minutes of uh, scores. And I will just uh, tell you guys, last night, the first night of action on Friday, uh, the first round scored on a total of 144 raccoons here in Greencastle, and the late round scored on 20 more for a grand total of 164 raccoons. So uh, the temperatures, the conditions seem to be much the same tonight on this uh, early round for Saturday evening. So we're hoping for some uh, good action coming your way. Back to you guys. Thanks for the update there, Alan. And of course, we'll be going back to Alan throughout uh, this first hunt of the evening, we're going to be getting every 30 minutes from each cast, hopefully an update. And bear with us, guys, because you got to realize, too, that, you know, these guys are out there uh, coon hunting in the woods. And a lot of times, uh, even though we make our best efforts, sometimes it's difficult for us to get cell service for these guys to get the reports in. But you can bet that we're going to try to keep you updated on the scores as much as we possibly can throughout Hunt one here, and with cast three going off first at 9.33, of course, that is Eastern time. So uh, if you're sitting uh, somewhere in Central time, don't be scratching your head. We're on Eastern time here in Greencastle, Indiana. We should be getting some scores in from all three casts, probably starting with uh, cast number three here in just a few minutes. But while we're waiting on the scores, I want to talk a little bit with our experts now. Both of you guys have been in major hunts. As a matter of fact, you've both been finalists in the United Kennel Club World Hunt. Uh, I think you actually won it. Got to give a shout out here. To, what was that? 20, 2012. 2012. Yeah. yeah. Rick was the world champion. What's going through your head? You're here in the semifinals. Uh, you've turned out. You've got all this money on, on the line. You know, if you're the handler, what's going through your head right now? Well, you're nervous. I can tell you that those guys are nervous out there right now. And... Uh, um, no amount of preparation for that type of, of nervousness can keep that from happening. Um, that, for me, it was always, when I, when I reached that point uh, in these major events, for me it was always hearing the first dog to bark. Was it going to be my dog opening on strike first, or was it going to be somebody else's? And I was always keyed in to that first bark. And once I heard one bark out of, out of any <coughs> of the dogs, I kind of had a little bit of a relaxing moment, and then I was able to function throughout the rest of the evening. Yeah, that's when you really get in the game, when the action starts. And I, I misspoke just a little bit. You've won a UKC World, but you've actually also won a World in another registry. Is right. Yeah, won a, won a World Hunt in another registry, and then owned a dog that won a World Hunt in 2009, and uh, also was in the Final Four uh, of the UKC World with a dog that I raised uh, in 2000. So. Uh, uh, it was a pretty special moment, uh, as that as well. And you know, these guys are about a half hour in, and I can tell you for me, uh, when you get this far, especially in a heads up round, uh, for me it seemed like uh, what would calm my nerves a little bit uh, and get the heart to not feel like it was coming out of the chest is when we took off walking, maybe to score the first tree or, you know, dogs maybe moving through there. And you just got to walk and you got to move and kind of take your mind off of, you know, uh, the, uh, the pressure. And uh, it seemed like when you could get in there and you could score that first tree, you know, it didn't, you know, right, wrong or indifferent. It just kind of 
brought things back and it kind of brought it back to it wasn't just a regular hunt but it was now you're into you know now you can kind of uh get in the groove and, and set in for a 90 minute cast so you know the worst thing for me was sit there uh when nothing was opening and uh you know minutes would tick by and you know sometimes i remember a particular hunt you know i think it was 17 or 18 minutes before anything struck and uh, everything is dead silent and uh you know these hunts, I mean, uh, a simple thing as a 25 strike point can be the difference at the end of a cast like this. And uh, so as a handler, uh, you have to be on your game. And, you know, you know, you have to know every bark that your dog makes. And, uh, you know, because the last thing that you want to do is, is make a mistake as a handler, and, and then you have to rely on a dog to try to help you overcome that. So, you know, getting in that groove and, and having them dogs open and knowing what that other dog sounds like and where yours is at, it just seemed to kind of call my nerves and, and go forward with that from there. Yeah, and you know, you talked just then about the vocalization and knowing your dog's bark, uh, you know, when they give voice. How much easier is that? It, it, does it really matter whether you've got four dogs in your cast or two or three? Or how do you, what would you prefer, Rick? Well, I think it would be much easier whenever you've got a lower number of dogs in the cast for you to pick your dog out quicker. Um, you know, very, very rarely do we run into a, a situation where two dogs sound alike. Um, but it does happen. I've had it happen a time or two. Uh, I remember one year that I competed against a, a dog that sounded like mine, and we had uh, drew that boy several times that year, and we had trouble every round. And uh, judges hated the judges, and uh, we hated to hunt with each other, and we actually uh, uh, called each other's dog from time to time, uh, not on purpose at all, but sure. you know, just by mistake. But that's one time out of 40 plus years that that's happened to me, and um, or one particular dog. And uh, it, it doesn't happen too often, but it is easier to pick them out when there's only two or three of you out there. Sure, it's gotta be easier. So, you know, these guys, they're into the hunt. You guys both say that, you know, the thing that calms your nerves is when you hear that first dog yeah. vocalize. And I think that has happened because I believe we're about to throw it over to Alan Gingrich. Uh, I think we've got a score update here. That's right, we have our first report in. That comes in from uh, cast number three. That comes from Cody Carter. Uh, so all you uh, Joe Manning fans with Dominator, you're on the board first with 225 plus. Uh, but Echo's right behind him. He has a score of 200 plus. The only other report I have is that Dominator has also sitting at 225 pending. So that tells me he's got another first strike in the first tree and they're probably en route to scoring that dog again. 225 plus for Dominator, 200 plus for Echo. Cast number three. Okay, Steve, you just heard the scores. What are your thoughts and what do you think's transpired there to get us to this point? 225 plus and 200 plus for Dominator and Echo, respectively. Well, I can tell you, uh, you know, out there hunting in a heads up round like that, uh, you know, we don't know which dog treed first or whatever. Um, you know, uh, you know, when you walk in there and obviously scoring a tree, it's either going to be plus, minus, or circle. You know, and, uh, you know, obviously plus points is when you when you see the raccoon, obviously minus points is when you get into a tree and, uh, you know, th this can happen where dogs just, mi you know, miss the raccoon by a tree or whatever it may be. And there's nothing there, um, you know, and then also obviously you get circle points when there's a den tree, because there's a lot of times that dogs can run a raccoon to a den tree and it's just breaks, you know. So walking into that first tree. Uh, and getting, you know, in Joe Manning's situation, he has struck for 100, obviously, and treed for 125, so that got him got to two and a quarter. And so now you're going to score this other tree, and this can be a big difference in a heads-up cast because these scores, scores can change very quickly. You know, uh, right now it's a 25-point difference. Now, they're obviously going to go score, uh, appears that they're going to go score a dominator on, on two and a quarter, but I'm sure that Echo is at large, and, and things could change very quickly in that cast as they're walking to Dominator to score them where Echo could possibly get treed again and, and you know get struck for 75 and treed for 100 and a quarter so not a big margin there that 25 points I guarantee of both handlers uh, hearts are racing I can tell you that so for sure. I guarantee you and now would be a good time for us to talk a little bit about the scores and how the scoring system works here of course you, you can get points for two things a strike and a tree correct? Correct. So, Rick, tell us how many points, how do the strike points break down first? The strike points, uh, the, the first dog to open 
or vocalize as you would put it. Um, the first dog to open and, and be acknowledged by its handler to the judge would get 100 points. Uh, the second dog, 75. The third dog, 50. The fourth dog, 25. And uh, the same way with a tree, uh, except for the fact that first tree is 125 points, second tree 75, third tree is 50, and fourth tree is 25. So um, that, that's the scoring system of it. Um, with this, with this uh, information that we got from Alan right now, we realize that, hey, we've scored on two coons here in this short amount of time. Um, you know, they were split treed. Well, the only way for Echo to have 200 plus was for him to be on a separate tree from Dominator. Um, so which, whichever one they scored first, we don't know. Doesn't really matter at this point, but uh, we already know right now that they're in, a, they're in coon country and, um, and they're gonna have a raccoon hunt like no other probably. So basically, if I understand it correctly, what you're saying is that when they went out, both dogs struck, obviously, Dominator struck first for 100 points. Echo comes in and strikes second Probably for a 75. Totally separate track. But at 75, because the dog was the second one to strike, it doesn't mean it's second on the same track, correct? Yeah, correct. And then both dogs obviously treed. Both dogs got 125 for being the first dog on their respective trees. So that gets us to 225 positive for Dominator right. on first strike and a good tree. 200 for Echo on second strike, but also a good tree. Right, exactly. Now, in addition, so we know how the points come into play for the strike and for the tree, but also you can get points in, well, actually there are four scenarios that can happen. You can have positive points, you can have circle points, you can have negative points, or if you tree on anything other than a raccoon, you can have automatic disqualification, is that right? If you tree off game in this event here, yes, that's correct. Right. Yep. Um, probably the, the most uh, common off game is an opossum. And, uh, you know, they, they climb trees in front of these dogs, and sometimes they just can't pass them up. And uh, when that happens, then they're going to be eliminated from the cast. Great. So positive points on both dogs here. Tell us a little bit, what are circle points? Well, circle points can happen when uh, when you when dogs get treed, and and, and this happens uh, especially this time of the year because a, a lot of uh, you know a lot of um, mother coons are having babies, so you know they're in dens and they're not going to be visible. They may be in there in a den tree, and uh, you know they just uh, you know for whatever reason that's just where their track ends. That's where they're at, and if you don't see them. Uh, you get circled. Now that doesn't go uh, against you, uh, doesn't really go for you unless it becomes on a tiebreaker, uh, or they may go in the ground, a brush pile, a field tile, uh, and when the track ends there, because that's where the coon went at and you don't see the coon, but it could be in a place of refuge or a place of hiding, uh, then you get circled up on them particular tracks. And I would like to, uh, you know, with, uh, with Cash 3, with Dominator getting 225 plus, and uh, um, Echo getting 200 plus, and Dominator being struck back in for 100. Uh, a couple things there. Um, either they scored Dominator first and recut him, and, and Echo then went and scored Echo, but he got struck back in for 100. So that tells me that either do both dogs was either gathered up or, you know, the obviously 100 become available again, which in a heads up cast is kind of big because uh, you're not getting struck back in for 50, you're getting struck back in for a quarter. So obviously that's going to play a role in how things are going in that particular cast. Definitely. So, so to, to recap on the circle points, you know, basically it's about giving the dog the benefit of the doubt. They right. get to the tree and... and there's a possibility that there, you know, it's a den tree, there's a hole in the tree that's obvious. You can clearly see that there's a place that raccoon can be hiding. You're not gonna penalize the dog, but you're also not gonna reward the dog. We're gonna give him the benefit of the doubt something could be there and give him a circle. Absolutely. Yeah. So that brings us to our third scenario, negative points. Ooh. How do negative points occur? Minus points, there's, a, there's, a, there's several ways that a dog can accumulate minus points and we'll deal with the strike points first. Um, the dog has to, when a dog's called struck, that dog or any of the other dogs that are called struck has to open within eight minutes of every time from, from the previous bark. If they go eight minutes without making a bark, they're going to lose their strike points. And uh, so, there, so there's a scenario there where they might have negative points. Uh, if they tree a tree that has that's obvious to the judge, obvious to the rest of the cast members in a hunting judge situation, 
that no coon is there, that no coon can hide up there and not be seen, then they're going to be in the minus column. And uh, so they would have their strike and tree points in the minus column, just like they would have plus points if we'd actually seen a raccoon up in the tree. Um, those are a couple scenarios there that ha uh, ways that they can lose their, their points. Um, in hunts not as, as big as this magnitude, um, they, they can lose, they can accumulate minus points for treeing off game. When we get to this level, they don't need to be treeing off game anymore. Um, so they're going to get scratched here, but in some of the more novice uh, events that we have, they, they would receive minus points and be allowed to continue on. Gotcha. Now, you talked about that tree where you could obviously tell that there is not a raccoon Correct. up in the tree. Is that what we'd call a slick tree? Slick tree, yep. No, you know, they, they missed the coon. You know, uh, the coons tricked them. It's, it's went up a tree and come back down. Or, or maybe the dogs just got really excited and there was more scent right there in that area. And the dogs just piled up on that tree and, and the coon's sitting 20, 30 yards away. Good deal. Well, thank you for that explanation, Rick. And speaking uh, of slick tree, you've been there. I mean, what's that like when your dog's standing there on a tree and it's oh, obviously well, slick? I can tell you in a heads up round, it's a gut wrenching feeling. That's just, that's really pretty uh, bluntly to put it because uh, when you're hunting in a heads up round like they are tonight, uh, you can be within 100 points of a, you know, the lead or even 50 points. And you walk in in a scenario where a dog is treed on, you know, separate trees. One dog gets plus 200 and another dog gets minus two and a quarter. That's a 425 point swing. And so, you know, in these casts, it's never really over until it's over. It's never really over until that 90 minute clock expires. Because even if you're down, uh, you know, um, even if you're down, you still have a chance at the very end because obviously if dogs get treated, you know, we can put, you know, can put the stationary on them and, and we'll obviously discuss that later. But, you know, I've walked in there and just knowing, you know, a dog goes in there and gets treated and you just know you're going to walk in there and see a coon because you know, we hunt these dogs all the time. So you know what they sound like and, and you know if they're gambling or if they're not. And, you know, uh, to Rick's point, you can walk in there and, and have a tree that is a little bit legitimate tree and there's a leaning tree that comes across from a creek into the tree that you're in and that coon went up, went down the leaner on the other side and may have got out of there 30 yards from where you're at and it's just a bad break. You know, it can happen, you know, where, where legitimately uh, it, it would fool any dog. So, you know, it, it's scenarios like that that play a role and that's why these hunts are exciting, you know. Yeah. That's why they're exciting. I know you got to hate it when you come up on a tree and you've got another leaner like that or you've got grapevines that are wrapped all around it and stringing over right. uh, to the trees beside it. There, there's a whole lot of breaks that... You know, another scenario is, you know, you walk into a tree, you obviously got to see a hole for a den. Well, there's trees that you're pretty confident that's a den tree, you know, has a hole in it, but you can't see the hole because of maybe where it's positioned at and you can take a minus on that too. So uh, that's one of the breaks as well. Yeah. Well, it looks like uh, here in Cast 2, we've had a couple dogs, one that's had a really good break and one that's had a break not so good. Let's go back to Alan Gingrich. Alan, give us an update on the scores, please. Yeah, I've got a report back in from Clayton Stark in Cast number 2. You put Connor on the board with a 75-plus strike and 125-plus tree for a score of 200-plus. Uh, Gabby uh, is... Uh, has 100 that is still pending at the moment, and she did take a 125 minus on tree, so her first or uh, her score at the moment is 125 minus, and that's our first 30 minute update on cast number two. Good deal, thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. We should be getting an update here on cast number one in just a couple of minutes, but I tell you, it's something that seems really interesting to me looking at these scores from cast two and cast three. You know, we've got Dominator with 225 plus on the board, Echo with the 200 plus. Obviously, these dogs have split up. Dominator again has another 225 pending. Should probably be getting a score back there in a minute, eight minutes correct after the dog trees or, or when they get to him to find the, the raccoon. Is that correct? Depending on how far the dog is. We have to wait to five minutes before we score the tree. And, but uh, yeah, this, yeah, with the new rule, three minutes. Thank you. Um, we have to wait three minutes before we can score the tree. 
and then whatever the distance we have to travel to get to that dog. I mean, if, he, if he's 35, 40 yards away, then we have no distance. If he's a quarter of a mile <laughs> away, then, then we've got some time to burn up there. Yeah. But the bottom line is with 225 pending right now on Dominator, hopefully we'll have a, an update there. And obviously these two dogs, Dominator and Echo, have split. Uh, Steve, it looks to me like with Connor at plus 200 and Gabby at a negative 125, we've got the same scenario there. These dogs have gone in two different directions. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, in today's, you know, with these dogs getting this far and looking at their scores from last night and talking to them, there was a common theme with these six dogs that are here. Uh, when we talked to the gentleman, the, the guys, the handlers that was hunting them, uh, they treat multiple raccoons off to themselves. That's how they got here this far. So it doesn't surprise me a bit uh, that these dogs are split up. And uh, I, would, I would think that probably is going to stay like that for the, uh, the bulk of the night. And again, you know, we're talking in cast two, Connor being at 200 plus, uh, Gabby at 125 minus. You know, that's a 325 point deficit. But, you know, like we talked about before, uh, Connor goes in and makes one of them dreaded slick trees, uh, as we call a slick tree, a minus tree. And, and Gabby trees a coon, she can be right back in it. Yep. You know, that quick. So, absolutely. Yeah, 325 gap. Definitely not insurmountable at this point, only a third of the way in then. No, and I, I, I kind of like to, I, I kind of like what Rick said earlier. Uh, uh, for me, uh, I would much rather try to get a lead and hold on to it as try to come from behind because, uh, you know, coming from behind, you know at that point in time, you're going to have to have a break or two because if it becomes a raccoon train contest, what ends up happening at that point in time, it's really hard to overcome it, you know, you, you know. You have to treat multiple, you have to treat at least one or two coon, uh, raccoons more than, when, than what your competitor does at that And point. you're working against the time. Now, now suddenly the time clock is against you. And if you're in the lead, the time clock's with you. But when you're behind, the time clock is actually working against you because you need more time to get above. Yeah, yeah. I, I guarantee you that right now, uh, Connor's handler is sitting there thinking, Man, the seconds cannot roll off right. fast enough with a 320, exactly. 25 point. <laughs> and you're looking at that. Trust me, you're looking at yeah. how much time is left in the hunt. Exactly. Do I hold off treeing? You know, th this is where hand. This is where really handling comes into because at that point in time, you're looking at your clock and you're saying, okay, there's. We obviously know there's 45 minutes or so according to the time, or, or in in Connor's situation in that cast. Uh, you know, roughly about 45 minutes left to go on the hunt. And so you're starting to take that into consideration. You know, do you, do you become more patient? You know, do you, now, now you're using the clock to your advantage. And I can guarantee a, a Nick, uh, who's hunting Gabby, he's not wasting no time. I guarantee you when she gets hooked up on a tree, he's going to put her on the paper because he has to, you know. So that's part of where the handling comes in at on, on this. So, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. So you're out there and your dog has struck or your dog has gotten to tree. Uh, at some point, uh, how does that work in who declares, you know, hey, my dog is struck, my dog's on the tree. Do you have to declare it all? Tell us about that. Rick. Well, when we're at this level and we're wanting to advance, yeah, we're going to be declaring it. To, to say that we have to declare, no, you don't have to declare. But uh, at this level here, these guys are not going to be laying back this early in the cast at this point. Um, they're going to they're be getting on it, and they're going to be trying to build their lead as, as time goes by. Gotcha. Yep. So gamesmanship there a little bit in making the call? Well, you know, that, that's where the part, okay, uh, cast two with Gabby, the 125 minus talking about strike points. Sometimes your dog can give it to you, and sometimes as a handler, uh, we give it to the dog. You know, we don't know that case scenario. She could have very easily treated. This happens with dogs on, on taking a minus. Uh, they may go in there, uh, start treeing, uh, thinking that they have it, tree for a couple minutes. The handler trees them, so they're awarded the 125 points, and then all of a sudden the dog, you know, some of them check themselves. You know, they all of a sudden they tree for a minute or so, check the tree, and all of a sudden they realize that this coon has left, and they leave. So that's, that's sometimes you can get 125 minus, or uh, sometimes a handler, us as handlers, we've all been there. Uh, we can, Rick and me can both, you know, agree on this here, where you simply think that that dog is coming, you know, coming treed or whatever. And, you know, another dog may be treeing in the country and you want to get to your tree first, and you just simply rush the gun and, and, and tree them. 
a, a little quicker than what you should, and it costs you 125 minus. And when that happens as a handler uh, at this level, uh, that's not a good feeling. That you're, <laughs> it, it's that's hard. That's when they're hard to lose. You know what I mean? If you're the one that makes a mistake, your dog does everything right and you're the one that makes a mistake. It's easier for me if my dog makes a mistake. Right. It's, it's really hard for me if I'm the one that makes a mistake and the dog deserved to move on, you know? Yeah, so. and you know, that's something that in the interviews here, it's been really intriguing. Uh, and, you know, these guys are all for their dogs and a common theme that we often hear when we're talking to these guys about their dogs and about a prior performance, you know, is how bad they feel when they let the dog down in a scenario like that because these guys are heart and soul invested in it. I think most guys can forgive themselves, forgive their dog a heck of a lot easier than they can forgive themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so Rick, you're out there, you're running dogs with these guys, you're in the semifinals, you hear your dog strike. Typically, how long are you gonna hang in there and listen before you declare to the, that your dog um, is struck? Depending on where I'm at in the score, if I'm in the lead, I might let that dog make another bark or two, we're allowed three. Um, I might let that dog, if, 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 if the bark sounds a little bit um, questionable, I might let it bark another time or two if I'm in the lead. If I'm behind, I'm striking that dog before it gets its bark all the way out. And I'm letting the judge know it, and I'm going to be loud and proud when I say it. I want to make sure that he hears it. So you're, if you're behind, you're going to roll the dice to try to make up that ground, and you're going to call it the second that that's dog right. gets you got to Now you've got to get ahead of the other dog, and you've got to beat the clock at that time. All right, so that's the strike. How about on the tree? Same scenario. Same scenario. If the track sounds good and you're, you're running, if you're behind in the cast like Nick is, if, he, if, if Gabby's got a good track in there and she blows in there and locates a tree like she really has one or two or three or maybe a dozen coons up that tree, I promise you Nick is going to have her treed instantly. And just like any of the rest of us would because we're behind and we want to get to the lead. Yeah, you just said something that struck me just then, one or two or 20 uh, yeah, raccoons we're, we're, up that tree. You don't get any more points though. Don't get any more points. The more you have, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the more you have, but we're approaching a time of year where you're going to be treeing uh, two, three, four coons up a tree. You'll have what we call the sow raccoon and then uh, several kits might be up the same tree. And uh, it's, not, it's not uncommon from, from May through September that you'll have that. Yep. So what's the most you've ever seen in a tree, Steve? Oh, wow. oh, I'm going to say, um, you know, talking about that time of the year, I'm going to say seven. Wow. You know, uh, where you have a, uh, you know, and what's, what's really awesome about nature is, is uh, certain years, uh, sow coons in different areas of the country may only uh, raise uh, two or three young, uh, young ones, and, and other uh, situations may raise six or seven. And, uh, you know, especially uh, uh, in the, I'm from northern Indiana, so we'd have a lot of mulberry trees in the, in the summertime, and, you know, they would, them, they would go up there and eat them mulberries or whatever. So it wasn't uncommon to have several, you know, probably six or seven in one tree. And I've been in years where one time I know walking into a tree, we had five adult raccoons in one tree. So not uncommon, you know, that, but that would probably be the most for me. How about you, Rick? Yeah, probably so. I mean, I, I, I can't remember having an outlandish number of, Raccoons I mean, seven sounds like a pretty big number. Seven is a big number. Um, I do recall one time uh, in a cast that uh, I guided out of uh, Darbydale one night, and we hunted around a strawberry field. And we it's probably a two-acre, maybe two-and-a-half-acre strawberry field, mm -hmm. and we counted 37 coons around that strawberry field. And our dogs uh, our dogs acted like there wasn't a coon around that place. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Oh, it was, it was, That's it embarrassing was, when that it happens. Was, it, was a, it was a one-hour event, and uh, I'm telling you, it, it, was, it was horrible uh, for us. I, I don't know if we got there too early. Uh, I can't imagine that we got there too late because we probably turned loose around 9.30 or 10 o'clock. But uh, if I remember right, I swear, I think we only scored on one coon in that field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and that brings up a good point. That can happen. You know, um, these dogs, when they're out running, you know, tracking and trailing a uh, tree and a raccoon, you know, sometimes uh, you'll see them sit up, but, you know, that track may be old enough where they don't run it, and you'll see 
four or five raccoons set up and your dogs just don't treat them, you know, because they're, you know, they may have been laid up. What we call laid up terminology has been laid up for a while where they may have been up there uh, sleeping or resting for several hours, you know, three, four hours or whatever. And they're just not, you know, uh, that's where, uh, when, you know, that's where a layup dog can really come in at where they can, where they tree by uh, scent with their head up in the air instead of uh, running a track in there. So. Absolutely. The breeze hits them in the face just right, just and they're able to smell a coon up there that hasn't been on the ground in hours. And uh, so it, 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 can be, it can be done. Wow. Yeah, and you know, a lot of times these guys will go out there and the, their dog will strike uh, and maybe get to the tree, and the coon's already been in the tree. They're really not chasing him on the ground, but they are running the trail to the tree. Doesn't matter, get scored exactly the same, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And speaking of scores, it looks like uh, we've got an update. Cast One has finally come in and got up on the tote board. So let's toss it over to Alan Gingrich, UKC Director of Hunting Operations, to get an update here. Alan? Yeah, I've got another update coming in from Cast Number One here. Tyler Pettit is our infield reporter, and they've had quite quite the action out there in cast number one. So they've got uh, Bonnie with a first and first on the first turn, turn loose. Uh, that tree was plussed and then turned back loose for a 75 strike and another first tree for 125 plus. So she's got a total score of 425 plus at the moment. And she's uh, struck back in with 25 pending there. Uh, Piper, she took a second strike and a first tree and they put the whack on that one. That was a slick tree, so she took a minus on that guy. She uh, turned back loose, she took first strike and got treed again, and this time she's got the raccoon, first and first on a raccoon, so that uh, puts her up uh, 25 points to the good at this point. Beyond that, she strikes back in for 50 plus and has another first tree, uh, and that's also plus. So her total score right now is 200 plus. So we've got Bonnie sitting at 425 plus uh, total score, Piper 200 plus, and that's our first 30 minute report for cast number one. Wow, guys, a heck of a lot of action there in cast number one. And once again, uh, we see this trend where it appears that these dogs are all running independently. We've got six dogs and three cast. It looks like they're all out there doing their own thing. Is that your take on it, guys? No surprise. Yeah, no surprise at all. And and, and looking at that uh, cast one score there, if I if I heard Alan correctly, sounds like they've scored on four four separate raccoons. Yeah, a lot of coons raccoons out there as well. A lot of action and, tonight. And they're not even according to when they uh, turn loose at. They're not even an hour into this hunt. And you know we got this update, so you know they, they probably did this in roughly 35, 40 minutes of yeah. the uh, of the hunt. So. Uh, I look for that to be a really, really competitive cast. Uh, you know, the, the little Piper female in that cast, uh, she, can, she can hook them and book them. I can tell you, she, uh, she is lightning fast. Uh, you put her in a situation where they're, where they're out there and available or whatever, and Bonnie's no slouch. And you know, uh, one thing that, you know, in this scenario, uh, again, with the minus points, you know, in, 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 you can, when you take 400 minus, you can minus out. So I guarantee you, uh, that's something that's on the, in the back of uh, Duel's mind right now. You know, he took a 200 uh, minus right out of the truck. And one more bad tree, depending if they're struck in at 100 or 75, uh, could put him out of the hunt. So I guarantee in the back of his mind, that's just extra pressure, you know. Uh, and when you get in a situation like this where there's a lot of coons, you know, raccoons to be treed, uh, dogs tend to have an, it can happen to even the good ones where you can miss one uh, a by a tree in this scenario because, uh, you know, obviously if they've scored four in one area in a relatively short time, uh, these raccoons are sitting up all around them. You know what I mean? So, you know, they may only be going 300 yards. And you know what's amazing, uh, always been amazing to me, is the dog's ability to, to pull them off that tree, walk them 30 seconds or whatever, turn them back loose, and then go take a totally different raccoon and tree that coon. Because in the hunts that we hunt in, you can't score the same one twice. And what I mean by that, or score the same tree twice. So th that track can't end back at the tree it just come from. And, uh, you know, these dogs pick that up and they do that. So really pretty awesome, especially when you get in an area, a pocket of what it appears that they're in. Obviously, I think Tyler Pettit is uh, guiding, uh, guiding that cast. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Tyler's from this area, has awesome hunting. So not, not surprising at all. Yep. I'll tell you, the thing that really surprises me right now looking up at the leaderboard is the fact that we've had 
dominator pending with 225 points for quite some time. Now, uh, with these, we're going head to head, and we also, correct me if I'm wrong, have two judges with each cast. We've got one judge and we've got a, an assistant. All right, so uh, can they the split up or are they sticking with, uh, are, are they staying together out there in the field? Or if you've got two dogs that go in two different directions, do the judges split up? The only time they're going to split up is when we have split trees. And uh, whenever both dogs are treed in separate areas, then, then the lead judge will most likely go to the dog treed first and the assistant will go to the next dog treed second and then the lead judge will come to them and score that tree and everything's back loose again. Gotcha. So the lead judge, even if they're split, he is going to go to each tree. Yes, he, he is the one that has to make the call on every tree. The assistant judge or the, 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 the assistant judge cannot score a tree. The, the lead judge is the one that's going to make the call on that tree when he gets there. He can go there, walk with that particular handler, write the score down and that kind of thing. So, absolutely. Good deal. Thanks for the explanation, guys. And, and speaking of explanations, I want to take a minute here and talk a little bit about our format tonight because I've had several folks asking me, hey, are you going to go to the hunt? You know, what's going on out in the field? Are we going to get any reports from the field? So the answer uh, is yes, but not now. And what I mean by that is here in the semifinals, we've got these three casts uh, that all went in, in different directions. And because of just basically technical issues and the difficulty of giving live coverage in the field with three different casts. We're not able to do that here in the semifinals. We're going to continue to update you on the scores. We're going to get those from Alan Gingrich just as quick as they come in, and we're going to provide them to you as timely as we possibly can. With that said, when we move to the finals later tonight, we are going in the final series with the three dogs, or the final hunt, I beg your pardon, Final hunt with the three dogs. We're going to go to a play-by-play. -play. Uh, we've got the site for this hunt in an area where we feel like we're going to have really good coverage, where we're going to be able technically to get the updates as they come in and to virtually give you a play-by-play, minute-by-minute, blow-by-blow breakdown for the full two-hour-plus duration of that hunt. So if you're wanting to see the play-by-play, -play, you're going to have to stick with us. I apologize. We're not able to do that here in the semifinals. We're trying to get you the scores as quick as we can. But when we go to the finals, we definitely are going to be covering it live as much as we possibly can. And hopefully we're going to keep Alan Gingrich really, really busy during the finals tonight. Uh, you know, he's over there waiting for scores to come in now, and we'll get back to you with them as soon as we can. Uh, tell me something, Rick. Are you surprised that, we haven't heard from Cast Three for such a long period of time. Uh, a little, it's it's went on just a little bit longer than you would expect it to. But I know Dominator has no issue with seeking new ground to hunt in, and uh, he could be, you know, out of the section that they're in and into another section. We could have simply just have bad cell service right there, and when we get back to good cell service, we may get a, a boatload of scores on that cast, you know, but. Um, it's, it's been a tad bit long, and uh, I look forward to seeing what's going on there because Echo's loose too, and it's hard to imagine that he's not struck and he's not treed somewhere as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you talk about the scores coming in in a flurry. You can see that as evidenced by Cast 1. You know, we didn't have a score for the longest time from Cast 1, and then all of a sudden, boom, we've got 625-plus points going up on the board. So it can happen you know, really, really fast. Hopefully we'll be having some more updates coming in pretty quick. Uh, right now, we're going to take a quick two-minute break. It's going to be really, really short. We'll be back in 120 seconds to bring you more coverage here from the semifinals of the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. Stick with us. They're partners, ready to do whatever it takes. Athletes that pound for pound can outrun, outwork, and outperform anybody you're watching on Sunday. No contract required. You don't waste that kind of potential. You train it, fuel it, unleash it. You feed nutrition that holds nothing back. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. This is no ordinary puppy. And this is no ordinary story. This is the tale of a hero in the making. 
He is born, raised, and fed to rise to any challenge. Because he is no ordinary dog. He's a Yukonuba dog. Yukonuba provides animal proteins and high levels of DHA for a strong body and mind. Feed the extraordinary in your puppy and make your dog a Yukonuba dog. Welcome back to the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions here in Greencastle, Indiana. I'm J. Paul Jackson, your host this evening. Alongside me are our expert analysts and commentators, uh, Steve Burkholder and Rick Stretch. And I don't care what you say. I do think Rick is an expert commentator and analyst. What was he Steve. saying? <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. What did you say during break? <laughs> <laughs> now, these guys, I'll tell you what, you guys have been doing a great job, and I'm really having a good time working with you guys tonight. This is a very, very exciting uh, event. And uh, while we're at break, I got some new information just to share with you guys that are watching. A lot of people you know, have been texting and wondering why, and, and we were ourselves, why it's been so long that we've had 225 just hanging there on the board for Dominator. Well, here's the reason. Um, the guides were instructed to give updates every 30 minutes throughout the hunt. So we're going to be from each cast during their hunt in 30 minute intervals getting our updates. Uh, 9.33 was the start time for Dominator and Echo. So they just passed the hour mark. And of course, there are instances where the clock does occasionally stop running in the field. They may or may not be quite there, but they're probably just beyond the hour mark. So our next update, if their cell service should come from Cast 3, and we should get a little bit of insight on what's going on there with that 225 that's been dangling on the board for the longest time. Of course, Cast 2 had a 9.44 start time, so it's probably going to be at least, you know, 8, 10, 15 minutes before we get an update there. And Cast 1 with a 9.40 start time. Probably we'll see uh, some more updates from all three casts uh, coming in from our United Kennel Club Director of Hunting Ops, Mr. Alan Gingrich, here in just a few moments. Now, while we're at the break, uh, Alan was nice enough to bring us some scorecards and take a look at, at the scorecards. I believe you've got uh, all three flights right there ahead of you. Uh, start out there with Bonnie and Piper, if you will, Steve, and tell us what you think is going on out there. Okay, so um, I know right before we went to break, uh, we talked about a total of 650 uh, plus points being scored. Um, they actually, uh, we, we want to just kind of make a little correction on that and talk about it a little bit. There's actually 850, uh, if I got my calculation right, um, uh, uh, points that have been scored on that because uh, Piper, uh, as Alan had shared, uh, she had pulled a 75 and 125 minus. So um, uh, in all actuality, they've scored on four raccoons, uh, two obviously going to Bonnie, two going to Piper. Uh, but with her, so Piper has actually scored, uh, according to what we have on the scorecard here, uh, she's actually scored 225 on one raccoon and 175 on another raccoon. So she's got a total of 400 uh, plus, but she has that 200 minus, which puts her back at, or she has that 225 minus, which puts her back at 200 plus. And in the event of this, one of the, one of the first tie, in the event of a tie, uh, one of the first tiebreakers that, uh, that we have in our scoring system is least amount of, min uh, uh, least amount of minus is the first tiebreaker. So you obviously want to try to stay away from the minus column when you're in these hunts because that is the first tiebreaker in case of a tie. So. Is there a situation where you can get so many minus points that you're automatically <laughs> out or do you always have a chance to overcome as long as that clock's running? Uh, no, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an area you don't want to get into. 
with her carrying 225 strike points, when you get a total of 400 minus, uh, you're eliminated from that particular cast at that event. In this situation, you'd be eliminated out of the hunt. You know, so. So are you uh, talking that, about 400 minus total? Total minus. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter when you get them. You don't have to go all the way to 400 minus. You've just got to accumulate 400 minus and you're done. Yeah, when, yeah. when you accumulate 400 minus in any, any case scenario, uh, you know, um, maybe treat the dog too quick or whatever it may be, when you get a total of 400 minus points at that point in time, uh, you are eliminated from the cast. Wow, so there's some danger there also. Uh, yes, absolutely. Especially in a heads up cast. In a in a four dog cast, it's it's a, you have a little bit more a leeway there because you can strike back in for a quarter in this case scenario and tree for 125. So now you have 150 pending there. So 150 on top of the 225 would only put you at 375 minus. So you still wouldn't be out of the hunt. Gotcha. So Rick, you've got all three scorecards there in front of you for the three different casts. Uh, any thoughts, anything that really stands out for you when you take a look at these scorecards? We're scoring on a lot of raccoons. That's <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned it to a couple of guys today that I was interviewing. I'm a little bit surprised that, that we've scored on that many down here this year. And uh, it, it tells you that we've got a healthy, healthy raccoon population here in the Greencastle area. No doubt about it. This is definitely a raccoon-rich environment. We're going to see a lot of points, I think, tonight, both in the semifinals and in the finals, as evidenced by, you know, we've had multiple strikes and trees in all three of our cast. And speaking of scores, we're past that hour mark on cast number three. And uh, I think that our director of hunting ops, Alan Gingrich, uh, Alan, what you got for us there on cast three? Yeah, I do in fact have a report back in from cast three. Uh, the problem we're having right now is being able to, for them to send a picture of the scorecard in. So I'm going to guess their, their service is just uh, too spotty to get the, the scorecard in. So we can't see all the details uh, on those on cast number three scorecard, but I do have the total scores after 60 minutes. So Dominator, he has scored uh, some more plus points. Put him at 675 plus wow. for a total score. Echo? Add some more plus for him, he's up to 325 plus. So uh, other than that, I don't have any specific details for that. 675 and 325 for Echo and cast number three. 675, 325, we're talking about a 350 point gap there with 30 minutes left to go in cast three's hunt. Uh, Rick, is that insurmountable? I mean, it is not, it is not insurmountable at all. Um, you know, if Echo can score on a couple coons and uh, he, he can pull to the lead with something like that. If Dominator goes out there and let's say he takes a strike and tree minus, Echo scores on a coon uh, at the same time, then we're right about even right then. So no, it's not, it's not insurmountable at all. Um, I wouldn't want to be in uh, Logan's shoes right now. He's, he's, he's down low and he needs to climb out of it. Uh, he's going to have to rely on his dog to really pour it on or rely on Dominator to make a mistake some point. Yeah, and, and once again, it appears that these dogs are still hunting split. When I take a look at the points, start, you know, breaking them down. Echo, after our first report, was uh, sitting at, at 200 plus. Now we've got Echo in there at 325. Uh, Dominator, you know, has, has packed on since our, our very first report uh, come in there with about 400 more, over 400 additional points. I think he came in at 225 to the plus in our first report. So we're talking about, you know, two more 225s, 450 more points. It appears that these dogs are continuing to hunt independently. Do you think that? Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell. The answer is yes, that uh, Dominator's probably had strike and tree on three coons here. But when we're looking at echo score, there is a possibility that maybe Echo could have been on a tree with Dominator. Um, he had 200 plus there and now he's at 325 plus. And like Alan said earlier, it's hard for us to tell for sure just what all has happened. But if he came in and, and what we call backed Dominator on a, on a tree, that might explain a little bit why he's sitting at 325. I'm not saying that he did or he didn't, but there's an opportunity there that, to reach 325 with that scenario. Adam. Go ahead, in, in, Steve. Yeah, and in that case, you know, in the scoring thing, something that we haven't talked about tonight. So 
Uh, once you tree a dog, you have three minutes uh, for that dog before what we call the tree closes. At that point in time, no other dog can be declared on that tree. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't be there. You don't want them there if that happens because then you're going to obviously pull a minus in that situation too if a raccoon is seen. Uh, but, but after two minutes of that tree time, after that particular handler calls his dog treed, uh, there's two minutes elapses of that three minutes. Now all you can get on that tree instead of getting 75 in the first two minutes, now you can, all you can get is 25. Right. So that would definitely could be a case scenario. Or hey, you don't know he may have, have treated him too quickly. You know we don't know in this case. Obviously, we heard from Alan. We couldn't get a picture of the scorecard, so we don't know. But that you know that could very easily happen in that case scenario. Right. And that's why you guys obviously are the experts, because I would have just assumed that these dogs were still hunting split. But, you know, after hearing that explanation, who knows? The only way we're going to really know for sure is when we take a look at the scorecards at the end of the night when this right. thing is over with. Uh, but a lot of game out there. I mean, I I'm trying to add it up as I go along here. We're looking at at least three coons treed by cast number three, yeah. cast two. Uh, we're looking at possibly... Uh -oh. Four, four or five, or five four, in cast three. Five, yeah, four, four or five. for sure. Yeah, four. Yeah. Or even maybe five, yeah. yeah. Good deal. Uh, cast number two, we should get some word back in. Cast number one here in a few minutes. On, on cast one, it appears that they... Uh, they've, al they've also scored on four. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, cat, cast two, uh, they had a 9.44 uh, start uh, start time. So, uh, you know, it's uh, 10.50 now. So we should be hearing a report back from them uh, directly on uh, what's going on in their cast. It's going to be interesting in that cast to see if Gabby could close that gap. You know, uh, that 30-minute uh, hunt period time, did she have, you know, did she, was she able to get a raccoon scored and get herself back in this thing? Or, or did Connor, you know, was he able to, you know, widen the gap? So it'll be interesting to see that. Yeah, you know. still lots of action to come. And if you're wondering, okay, cast one, you know, we're looking at 625 in the plus. How could they have scored on four raccoons? Well, you got to keep in mind that Piper actually started the evening out, it appears, in the hole uh, at a negative 225. Am I correct uh, on that? Looks like 200. Neg at looks a negative like 200. 200. So to get back, it would take two raccoons to get Piper back to the 200 positive. Yeah, above the board. Yeah, uh, uh, Above board there. Yep. So That's correct. Did you expect to see guys this much game out here tonight? Well, I tell you what, after seeing what happened last night, uh -huh. I've come to Green, and Rick has too, we've come to Greencastle a lot here. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of game here, but we've been here uh, a lot of times in, in, a, in, in the areas that we hunt in that uh, you, you think that there's not a raccoon anywhere in 10 miles, within 10 miles. And you hunt the next night and you just, you know, you may tree five or six and with a, and you, the worst thing you want to do is tree it with a different dog because then you think the one that you did have is no good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. I, we've all been down that road, you know. But, you know, sometimes they co cooperate and sometimes they don't. You know, that's what we love about what we do here because it truly is free casting uh, your hound. You know, and a, a lot of, you know, a lot of times they've never been in this territory. And, and as a handler, maybe you haven't been in this territory. And, uh, you know, there ha the, the game has to move or has to, you know, has to cooperate with you a little bit. Or, or you can have a, a, what we call a miserable hunt. And uh, it's not just miserable for dogs. It's miserable for handlers and judges and, and everything else. Because you're, we have them cast, as we've seen in the late round last night, uh, where one raccoon won the cast from dogs that are, have won a lot of money, you know. So, you know, with that being said, you know, maybe the raccoons are moving early tonight. It could be a totally different case scenario later, you know. Sure. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're talking about not just some of the best, the best of the best. I mean, when you look at the numbers and over 1,300 dogs started this journey to make it here right. at the Tournament of Champions. And last night, you know, you've got 24, the top 24 out of over 1,300 that, that came out, we truly are talking about the best of the best. And then to be down right now to six and about to even take it to three, that, that's some feat for us to get here. It, speaking of miserable hunt, you know, I heard a lot of the guys talking about how happy they are that we've had the great weather conditions. No one, we haven't really heard that term uh, over the weekend here in Greencastle, and we didn't hear it last year as well. But what do you think about the weather situation that we've got coming into tonight? Had a high today in the low 80s, plenty of sunshine, a little bit of wind? I don't know it for a fact, but I believe that yesterday 
was the warmest day they've had this year until today. And today now is the warmest day that they've had this year. So we're, our temperatures have increased significantly this week to Friday and Saturday. And, uh, you know, I, it, the coons are enjoying it. You know, they're, they're out there and, and uh, making it possible for us to have some good scores here in the last two nights. Yeah, and speaking of good scores, we've got some more good scores that have gone up on the board. We've got a, a report in. Our hour mark reports come in for cast number one. Alan Gingrich, tell us about what's going on out there. Yeah, another report coming in from cast number one. We now have 60 minutes on the boards. Uh, we're going to give Bonnie some more plus points. She was sitting at 25 pending uh, at the last time we uh, had the report in. Uh, made a tree, was good, so found a raccoon there, so she now has another 150 points added to her score for a total of 575 plus. Piper still stay, or sits at 200 plus for a score, so there's 575 plus for Bonnie, 200 plus for Piper. So looking at that in the way that it came in, Steve, uh, to me, and you're the expert, it appears that they're probably still split because Piper didn't get any of those points uh, just then. Did, their score didn't change. What do you make of that? Well, you know, it could be it could be a lot of things here. You know, the, these hunts are, and I've hunted with the Bonnie female before, and uh, she's she's a bigger hunting style of dog. I mean, they may have got, you know, as we've seen, that cast started off real action-packed, and sometimes you get into an area where you uh, score on three or four, and then there may just, you know, there may just not be another one right around there to tree, and she's the type of female that can drift through that country and get treated. So they may have had to walk a, a great deal to get over to where she's at. We don't know, we're not there, but I'm just you know guessing that could very easily happen. And so they've scored her, maybe they're getting back into the area where they last heard Piper at, uh, that kind of case scenario. But you know, uh, again, uh, you're looking at 575 plus uh, and 200 plus with roughly 30 minutes left to go. Uh, this hunt, I can tell you, is a far cry from over because uh, again, uh, I would love to be sitting in, in um, uh, Bonnie's shoes or Zach's shoes, you know, hunting Bonnie. Uh, but, you know, Piper with Dual Murphy's not out of it. He makes, a, he makes a good tree and Bonnie makes a slip up. Could be right there, you know. Sure. And it's not just a 375 point lead, you know, a two coon lead, if you, or two raccoon lead, if you will. It, it could be just one slip up by Bonnie and one good one for Piper because you let Bonnie throw up a bunch of negative points right quick and Piper come in with some positive points and boom, you've got a whole different scenario. You know, there's a scenario here where uh, if, if Bonnie does uh, mess up, let's say, and trees a slick tree and takes a minus striking tree and Piper uh, does, a, does her job that she's supposed to be doing out there and comes up with a plus strike and a plus tree, we're right back at it again. We're right back even, even Steven on that, we'd say. And, you know, something that he didn't mention on the uh, cast, and we don't know this, but, you know, uh, when we left that cast beginning, uh, Bonnie had 25 strike pending. Uh, if you look on the card and what the reports that we've got, Piper doesn't have any strike points pending. So if she's not struck in uh, in this case, now we have scored Bonnie, who's at, back at large. Now that could open strike points back up. And I got, you know, hey, that makes a big difference in a heads-up cast because now you're competing for 100 strike instead of 25 strike, and that could end. And, and 175, and that can change things in a hurry as I well. I guarantee you Zach's not wanting 100 strike. No, this he's not. He is and hoping that Piper struck for a quarter so he can, because understanding in a heads-up cast, if in this case scenario, if Piper struck for a quarter, now he all he can compete for is a quarter strike. So he doesn't, he doesn't have that big strike point pending. So when he can keep them strike points as you're leading the cast, if the strike points stay the same, it's a whole lot harder to come back in a cast, you know, with the strike points being the same. So at what point do the strike points reset, Rick Stretch? Uh, when, when both dogs take a, a minus on strike, maybe the eight minutes uh, catches them both and they would take a, a minus on their strike. Uh, when both dogs are scored on a tree with a striking tree, and they're released, uh, you know, in a certain amount of close proximity at the same time, um, that's when the strike points would reset. Um, so we don't know. It, it, maybe the Piper's not been struck, and like Steve says, the 100 strike is available now. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm betting that Zach's wishing he could strike for a quarter irregardless at this point. If I was in uh, Zach's shoes right now, 
um, I might be off the accelerator just a little bit here. I'd be making sure my calls were accurate and that my dog was giving me the, the sound that, hey, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and it's going to work out fine. You know, same thing, you know, and something that they have here is, uh, let's say that she gets struck back in and she trails a raccoon through there and gets treed. Uh, I would, I would probably at that point in time even have the judge run the stationer on me and buy that five minutes in the cast uh, before I treat. Then you got to wait an additional three minutes. So now that's eight minutes lapsed because at this point in time, I can guarantee you he's looking at his clock and that clock can't expire fast enough. And obviously with Duel, he's, he's sitting there going, hey, we need to slow this thing down, you know. So absolutely. Yeah, the time can't go by fast enough, I'm sure, for Duel right now. And finally, we've got a score coming in at the hour mark for cast number two. Let's throw it over to Director of Hunting Ops, Alan Gingrich. Alan, please give us a score update on cast two. All right, guys, this is going to be on cast number two here. Not a whole lot has changed, but I do have an update on Gabby and Connor. Uh, Gabby, the last uh, on the first report, we had her uh, taking a 125 hit on a tree. Uh, but they tell me she got super deep. She did make another tree. They got in and scored it, and it was uh, they found a raccoon in it. So she is now sitting at 125 minus with a with uh, uh, 125 plus, or 225 plus for a total score of 100 plus. Uh, Connor uh, McGregor, uh, he had 75 pending at that time, and they're headed back right now to where they last heard him. So these two dogs. Uh, have been separated a good little distance, but that's what's going on in cast number two. So that puts us at uh, Connor McGregor leading still with 200 plus and Gabby with 100 plus. Less than 30 minute remains. Cast number two. Boy, like you called it, might happen. Gabby really closed it very, very quick. I mean, looking at 125 in the negative, 125 down, boom, 100 strike points, 125 tree points apparently to make up that negative 125 plus 100 more. So now they're in there with just 100 points different separating Connor and Gabby. Got to be feeling a lot better about Gabby right now. Absolutely. And I can tell you, uh, you know, in, in uh, um, JR's situation, you know, he has 75 uh, strike points pending. Now, He's glad he has that 75 uh, strike points pending because they got to go walk back to where the last place they heard at him before they can apply the six minutes. Now, the pressure cooker comes when he gets back there to the last place they heard him, and now they put the, apply the six to him. And these dogs are big hunting dogs. They've been all weekend, and you know these dogs can move a great deal of territory depending on how the raccoons are moving the area that they're hunting. And so when they come back there and they apply that time rule on them. Now he has eight minutes to hear him, okay? And if he doesn't hear him in that time frame, he now gets minus, okay, for, you know, could dog could get out of pocket or far enough in there where he couldn't hear him. And I'm sure they'll walk that direction toward him. But if he happened to get minus, see, he could take a pull of 75 minus, and now that really puts Gabby back in things because now she gets turned back loose on a fresh set of strike points. So uh, he's glad that he's struck to get back to hopefully within hearing, but when he gets there, he can rest assured he's going to be hoping that he hears him. Yeah, that 100-point that lead with a minus 75 could turn into a 25-point lead in a hurry. And more importantly, it could open that 100-point possibility for first strike up again for Gabby. That'd be real, really a big difference maker here for those two. The worst thing that's happening to Nick and Gabby right now is I, the clock is spinning and, and, uh, and, and Gabby's on the leash according yeah. to what we have here at this moment. And uh, so we get back to where we last heard Connor, and he's not opening when we stop to listen and we apply the strike rule on him. Uh, and, we, and we listen, and, and he doesn't ever open. The clock keeps spinning against Gabby, and she, the hunt time is running out for her. Her, uh, you know, the, the best case scenario for Nick at this time would be that as they're walking back, they would hear Connor, uh, maybe he's closed the distance to him, or maybe he's up on a hill, or they're up on a hill, whatever else, and they're able to hear him before they get back to where they last heard him. Nick can get Gabby cut loose again. Um, he's probably striking back in for 50 at that point, and now if she can roam around in there and get a coon tree before the hunt expires, guess what? You know, 
Now, she can possibly be our winner at that point. So right now, uh, the score is not nearly as important to Nick as the hunt time that's expiring on him and Gabby at this point. Yeah, and looking at the scores, you know, we're over an hour in on all three uh, of our casts. As a matter of fact, we're coming up pretty shortly on the 90-minute mark for cast three, assuming that there's been no stoppage of the clock along the way. Um, and it still appears to be anybody's race in all three of these casts. Well, you know, if cast three didn't call timeout, according to what we have, uh, that hunt is over. And we're just waiting for an update. We we went past. The... We went past. It was nine thirty three, and it's eleven oh six right now. So oh, wow. uh, ninety minutes. And yeah. hey, I got news for you, that went by <laughs> fast. Uh, but we're we're at the we're at the ninety three minute mark. So you know, as long as they didn't, you know, we don't know if they didn't. You know, they may have had to call timeout. But if they didn't call timeout, uh, that cast is probably there's probably a determined winner uh, of that cast. Right. You know. So in that case, there's going to be someone that's going to be. Really, really happy, and obviously, even you know something that you know we was talking about earlier today. You know, even the losers, you know, even the dog that loses here still is going to go home with five thousand dollars. Yeah, how, how, how is, can you be a loser? I mean, how can you be a loser in that situation? You know? I mean, you're going to lose a cash. Hey, we're going to give five thousand dollars yeah. to losing. Congratulations! You know? Congratulations! So, really, pretty awesome, you know. Yeah. And you know, talking to these guys today. You know, that was, the th especially Logan, you know, he said, you know, I, I come in there last night, you know, knowing I won a thousand, you know, that was, you know, that's the worst I'm going to do. Hunt. When he got to the hunt, hey, hey uh, no. congratulations, you won a thousand, you know, right. but, you know, talking to him tonight, you know, uh, going home and, and he shared, you know, he shared a little bit about that, that even that $5,000, 19-year-old college student that's getting ready to graduate this summer, you know, what that $5,000 would mean to him. It, it was huge, you know. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of pretty neat. And, you know, years ago when we first started at 19 years old, uh, you know, if you would have won $5,000 uh, then, uh, obviously that's been many moons ago, uh, they would have talked about it for many years. You oh, know? No, no doubt about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you, when I was 19, five, we're the same age. I mean, yeah, like right. $5,000 at 19 for us. We were millionaires. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we'd have been absolutely we were millionaires. rich. I'll tell you what, pizza and beer, it would have been owned, you know. <laughs> very, for, very the whole, for the whole place. For the whole place. <laughs> I tell you, you looked really surprised when you heard the time. It really has. I guess time flies when you're having fun. We're definitely having a, a good time here. There's a lot of action. You're going to have, uh, these hunts are so much easier to put on when you're in a uh, high coon population and the coons are cooperating. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it, when you have these dead cast, I'll call them, and, and we've all been on them. Oh, yeah. and, and, and I've been on my share of final cast that were dead cast. Um, you just struggle and strain and trying to, trying to get above the board, trying to find a coon, and uh, the coons just aren't cooperating. Um, when you're in action like this, it's easier to handle, it's easier to judge, it's easier to report, and it's easier to describe what's going on. And for whatever reason, it, it, nobody likes losing, okay? Uh, I always share with people, uh, if you like losing or losing doesn't bother you, I want to draw you every time. You know, that's just the way it is, you know. Uh, I, you know, these guys are competitive guys. I can tell you, losing a cast isn't fun, but, I, you know, if you go out and you score on multiple coons and your dog looks good, I guess the, the, the loss doesn't hurt as bad, it seems like. If you're out there struggling just to try to uh, play what we call uh, defense, playing defense is no fun. You know, it just is it's just no fun. So, yeah, the absolutely. Way, the way this hunt is set up, um, and, and it hasn't happened this weekend, and, it, and it's probably not going to happen at all, we, would have, we could have dogs advance throughout the weekend without scoring on a coon. Yeah. You know, and, and kudos to UKC for for a breaking precedent, I guess I would call it, for allowing that to go on here at this hunt. They want everybody to get a fair shake. They want everybody to come away from this thing uh, feeling like they were some sort of a winner. And, and they're doing a great job of it. So if they drew a, a, a sour place, a poor place, where the coons aren't cooperating, where maybe there's no coons, we still can have a winner in that cast and advance it to the next round. And uh, you know, I, I, that's how it should be. Sure. That's how it should be. You need to have a winner in every cast. Yeah. And, and, you know, in, in Rick's point, a really awesome point 
is, you know, we, we talked earlier about a den tree. You know, a dog can do everything right. And in this particular case, run a good track in there. The track ends at a den tree. They've actually treed a coon, but because of the way it is, you don't see it. So you get circled. And, and you know, a dog shouldn't get penalized for that. And they don't. And, uh, you know, absolutely, talking to a lot of the hunters uh, this weekend, that the ones that made the top 96, asking them about them particular instance, they loved the format. I mean, this was, they absolutely loved the fact that there was going to be a cast winner that was going to advance. No you know? doubt. So, And speaking of cast winners, that's a perfect segue right here for us to take it back to our director of hunting ops, Alan Gingrich, because we do have our first cast winner of the night. Alan, tell us about it, please. That's right, guys. We do have cast number three is done, but we do have a couple of corrections on it. Uh, that's the one where we could not get the pictures of the scorecard. So we had a little bit of a confusion there, but I'm gonna go through the details of how this played out here for Dominator. On the first cut loose, he took a first and first plus, 225 plus. Uh, second turn loose, uh, let me go down to Echo, who took second strike with a 125 plus. So for a total score of 200 on that cut loose. Dominator struck first on the second cut and Echo struck second. Dominator, or both dogs split treat again. Uh, Dominator is plused again there for a total score of 450 plus now, not the 675 that we reported earlier. So that gave him a total score of 450 at the 60 minute mark. Echo, who was struck in for 75, was minus that 75. He restruck in for 100 and got treed and had another raccoon for a score of 225 plus, but he's got that 75 minus to go with it. So the end score is going to be three, or uh, Dominator also restruck in for three, or 75 at the end of the hunt, and he took a hit on that. So he went backwards a little bit, has a score of 375, and he's still the cast winner, uh, to the uh, Echo score of 350 plus. So Echo is a $5,000 winner tonight. Dominator will move on a chance of the 50,000. Wow, guys. Very, very exciting hunt. I'm sure a lot of action out there. The thing that really catches me on that one is we all three agreed on something, and we were all three right. Well, we all I think dominator I, for the win. I'll agree that we all agreed on it, but I was the one that pointed it out first. I, I, <laughs> um, once again, you know, the, the expertise. That's only because he beat us to the punch, yeah, Paul. Don't let him fool you. I cannot believe you guys are riding my shirt tail like that. <laughs> Well, Rick, thank you so much for the expert guide, Steve, and I really appreciate it. And nevertheless, all three of us are on the board with the correct prediction. We all picked Dominator to win, and congratulations to Dominator, of course. They continue their role. Yeah. It's phenomenal. It's, it's phenomenal. And you know what? When you get on that role, it's... It's something that until you've been there, you just you just don't know. It just it seems like, and you know something that stands out to me. I can tell you uh, from 100. You know this this cast again, a 25 point cast win. And you know I can tell you uh, Logan is going to sit there. I don't know how he pulled the 75 strike minus, but I can tell you that 75 strike minus is going to haunt him. Yeah. Because. If he doesn't pull that, now I, I know Dominator pulled the 75 strike too. We don't know what happened in that case scenario, but I can tell you that 75 strike points, they obviously pulled it at different times because, right. you know, so, you know, it, he pull, and Dominator pulled his at the very end of the hunt, but that 75 strike points is going to haunt his uh, life. Yeah. He'll, he'll remember it. He'll, he'll remember that remember it for a lifetime. For a lifetime. And, uh, you know, what could have happened if he didn't have that? Instead of 5,000? Would he have been a fifty thousand yeah. dollar winner? And uh, you, you, I still remember some of my early casts that I that I give away or that I blowed or that my dog blowed, and you just never forget the big ones. And uh, well, you know, at nineteen he's got five grand, and he, he's going to have. It and, all, uh, you don't want to. We don't. I mean, we're just talking a scenario ties, but it almost makes me wonder if if something tonight in this cast that something Rick t uh, touched on earlier. Uh, possibly maybe these dogs sound a little bit alike because, you know, he pulled a 75 strike point minus and Dominator pulled a 75 strike point minus. But we don't know. You know, we're, that's just something that we're, we're thinking about in that case scenario. I'm looking at the scorecard and I'm wondering if Echo didn't back after the time was up on the second coon of, 
of Dominator. Could that have been a possibility? Could it could have been a possibility. He could have been there after the three minutes. He could have got there after the three and, minutes. And, here, and here's the other scenario. Uh, and understand, and this is, this is game. I mean, this is where you think uh, Dominator could have very easily went in there and got treed and Echo covered him. Mm -hmm. And even Echo Tree him, but Joe, knowing that the hunt's going to be out, walking in there, has no reason to even tree. You know what I'm saying? So there, you don't know. You don't know with not right. being there. Right. You yeah. know. But I can tell you that however you got that 75 strike uh, point minus is something that, you know, it's just, it's part of the, it's You look part at of the 75 do. on Dominator. I mean, what if he was handled? What if he was handled at the tree that Echo had uh, first and first on? Yeah. You know, I mean, they could have had the same scenario at different times. Um, who knows? We won't know until they get back in and, and we can chat with them. But, uh, you know, all kinds of scenarios can play out on that. But One the, thing that I've become certain of sitting here listening to the two experts is that you can never be sure. I mean, you guys have just went through multiple scenarios of how, you know, we could get there. Right when I think I'm starting to figure out the scoring system and I'm trying figuring out, you know, how they got there and I could play it out in my head and it makes sense, you guys come in, you know, with more information that leads me just to come to the conclusion that, like you said, the only way we're going to know for sure exactly what played out there is when they come in and update us. The, the one comment that I would like to make, though, in regard to that, uh, going back to what you were saying earlier about maybe sweetening the blow, getting some points, you know, making up. I mean, you know, you can look at the glass half empty kind of, Rick, where you're second guessing yourself on you know, that 75 minus that Echo took really, really early on, or you can look at the glass half full, hey, nobody likes to lose, but maybe it sweetens the blow just a little bit to come from negative 75 all the way to back to positive 350 and only lose uh, by 25 points. And that was kind of my takeaway from what you were saying earlier, you know, it's... You know, yeah, and one thing I, I'd like to touch on Logan um, and talking to him earlier today, um, you know, he, he got to live a dream. Um, you know, he watched these guys. You know, he in his late round last night, he drew out an incredibly tough cast. He, he drew out uh, uh, John Strickland, who's, uh, who's been a pioneer in this sport for a long time. He's won many big hunts. He drew out an, uh, another handler by the name of George Major, hunting a little female called Salt. Uh, John was obviously hunting Paige, and uh, a space cowboy was in that cast. And uh, he shared with me today that going out in that cast, he was so nervous because he said, you know, I grew up all my life coon hunting. For the last seven years, I follow these guys. I see them in the yeah. magazines. I see them winning trucks. And he said, you know, I, I called my dad before I went to that hunt, and I said, hey, you know, I'm just tickled I made it this far. And he said, I can tell you, uh, when I called my dad and I got off the phone, and he said, I went out and I hunted in this hunt. And he said, you know, thinking, you know, fearing the worst. And he said, it was by far one of the best casts he's ever been on. He said, they had an unbelievable great hunt. He said the sportsmanship that was displayed. He said, I know I was a cast winner, but he said them guys that I hunted against was winners in my eyes. And, uh, you know, his, he's 19 years old, and, you know, we just encourage them guys just do the same thing. And so, you know, it, it's neat. I guarantee you he's going to go away. Even though it's a little bittersweet right now, he's going to go away from this hunt yeah. feeling like he's a winner. Oh, no you know, doubt about it. And beat some incredibly good dogs along the way. Yeah. Well, right now, to bring everybody up to date, we, barring a timeout, we should have all three. Uh, obviously, cast number three is done. One and two, we're coming really, really close on time. We don't really know whether they've concluded or not. So let's go over to Alan Gingrich. Alan, can you please give us an update? What's going on? Oh, yeah, I have a good one here to update. That's for sure. Cast number one. It's an exciting one. It's really coming down to the wire, actually. Last report, we had 575 for Bonnie for a score. As she was out front leading, had a nice lead there on Piper. Piper was sitting at 200 plus. Uh, since then, Piper was sitting with 25 pending on strike. She made another tree, that was plussed. Cut her back loose, she struck back in for 75 and treed again, that tree is plussed. And then she uh, struck back in again for another 75 and is treated again for 125. The hunt is over right now. And the situation we're sitting in right now, that puts Piper at 550 plus, 25 down. Hunt time is over. The cast is walking to score Piper's tree. This is all hinged on how this tree is scored. 575 to 550. Wow. 
<laughs> Talk about <laughs> in we knew it, and we right knew now. it could happen with we her. Knew, we knew it. We knew she it. She is lightning fast. I'm yep. telling you, I've I've seen her in action, and she uh, she's quick. She's quick, and she loves the game. You can just tell when a dog enjoys being out there and and, and does well, and uh, and enjoys being out there. And uh, I, I'm not shocked. Um, I was a little let down there when we were down that far, but. Uh, my goodness, what a comeback that will be if they go in there and find a raccoon in that tree. Um, yeah, we're on pins and needles here for sure. No doubt about it. They are too. I mean, you, you're Bonnie's handler and time has expired. It would appear uh, that Bonnie is on leash right now, so her hunt is done. Is that what you guys gathered? Am I correct in that? Uh, well, she know. could be at large. She, yeah. she could be at large and, and hey, Maybe Zach, you know, maybe maybe she was treated in there and, and Zach, you know, decided not to treat her, you know, with the lead. I mean, you get caught in a tough situation like this because, you know, you're you're sitting there. For me, uh, if it comes down to the end of the hunt and, and I'm treated through there and another dog is treated and can beat me, uh, you know, uh, every handler looks at it different. You got to know your dog, but I'm going to probably tree mine. Uh, and uh, hey, you know what? If that one has, you know, has a raccoon and go to me, and I'm on a slick or whatever it may be, or whatever case scenario it may be, I'm probably going to take that chance. You know what I mean? Just but obviously, she wasn't declared treed, or according to the report that we're getting, yeah. she wasn't declared treed. So they're going to score pipe. But hey, that's the type of female Piper is. You put her in, in these raccoons. She's an older female. Understand this. Bonnie's a two-year-old female. Uh, Piper's a five-year-old female. That's the, they're coming into their groove, and I, I've been at, I've been on at these hunts uh, of this elimination style format. It's really hard to beat them consistent five, six, seven, and eight-year-old uh, yeah. dogs. It really is. Well, it's the prime of their life. Some some dogs reach their prime when it's two, three years old, but the majority of them we're looking at four, five, six probably. Um, so I'm, so we're talking about cash one there. I wonder if Bonnie didn't just blow out of the country. Very you know, I mean, according to Alan, I think we've scored on three coons without uh, hearing from Bonnie or, or at least no score update on her. So she could be in the next section. She could be over a hill where they've never heard her. Um, it's just hard to say what, what yeah. could have happened there. Well, now, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I, I, my recollection is at one point we had Bonnie at 675 and uh, he just said she was at Five. I think it was 575 that we had her at, I believe. I think we had her at 575 at one time. Um, uh, I believe she was at 575 at one time, and Piper was at uh, 200, 200, I believe. Right. So she's never moved off that. So the hunt has been called. Time has expired. Regardless of whether Bonnie is on leash or Bonnie is at large, Right. Bonnie's score is set now. Is that correct? That is correct. With yeah, no points what, on the board, from what we, from from what what we understand. understand. Right. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. So yep. exactly. It's all going to come down, folks, right now to when they get to Piper's tree. It, is it a slick? Your, is it a circle? Or do they find a coon there? Is it a plus? Advance to the final. And, and I give you an final. idea how you have to look at that. <clears throat> the way we look at it as a hunter, it's a $15,000 tree minimum. Yeah. Let that sink yeah. in. That is, it's a fifteen thousand sure. dollar tree when you third walk place in there. winner tonight. Third Getting place 20, winner is twenty thousand. You're walking into that tree. It's a fifteen thousand dollar raccoon. Yeah. yeah, that's just the way we look at it, you know. And uh, hey, I've been on the good end of that, and I've been on the not so good end of that. And hey, in Zach, you know, Zach, that's how he's looking. You know, I guarantee you, walking into this tree, uh, Zach's thinking to himself, "Hey, my dog has looked flawless tonight." and I still may get beat. And that's what happens in a lot of these cats, especially when you give dogs opportunity to shine. You can have one that looks superb, and Rick's been there many times, so have I, and you get beat. Yep. You get beat. Well, you it know. appears that another one of our dogs, Dog in Cast 2, has found that $15,000 tree because the hunt has been called for Cast 2, and a Cast winner has been declared. Alan, tell us all about it. Yes, sir. We do have a cast winner in cast number two. Last time, last report we had at the one hour mark, uh, the cast was uh, Gabby had got deep, just scored a coon. They were walking back to where they last heard Connor. He had, uh, he was struck in for 75 there. Uh, he did get, he was treed. They went to him. He did have another raccoon giving him a grand total of 400 plus. 
uh, and that is actually uh, how or, uh, Gabby restruck back in for a hundred, but that is how the hunt ends in cast number two. Connor is your cast winner. That's Connor McGregor with 400 plus uh, to Gabby's uh, 100 plus that she'll take home the $5,000 and put Connor McGregor in the final three. Wow. Alan, thank you for the update. Congratulations to Connor. I'm sure Gabby, very disappointed uh, for that team to be going home, but uh, Connor pulls it out. And Rick, this is one you and I picked. Again, I guess no. I was just following uh, no, on your. No. I, I, no. I think you're right on that. I think that. <laughs> no, I was. No, I'm so anyway. sorry. Look, you're right. I have it right here. I was wrong. That's, uh, you're, <laughs> you're correct, Paul. That's uh, you're you're right. You are the judge up here, and, and that's correct. You you and I did. We nailed that one. We, we Rick, uh, Rick was always good at that. No, uh, we I, all regret <laughs> our mistakes. I regret that one as much as anyone that I've made here this weekend so far. So Steve, you and I were right. Yeah, not me and Rick. I well, that's kind of been a common buddy. thread all weekend. I mean, we really didn't expect anything else, did we? <laughs> no, no, oh, no. no. And we even give we even give Rick a chance to reset tonight and refocus. And he, and, and he even got coaching from a lot of his friends today. So I did. Quite and, a bit and, and I uh, let him. I got a lot the, of bad information today. <laughs> a lot of bad I, information. And I, I, I left him choose the guys he wanted to interview to see how their dogs was looking, so he could have a little bit better shot at making picks tonight. But looks like we have a little more work to do in that area. I uh, I predict things will look better for me on. On cast one, though I do predict that. I, well, I, I hope you were right. I think that uh, I think that Piper's going to have that last. Time. I'm rooting for her. I can tell you that. I, I don't want to come out of here a loser again. I can promise you that. I bet you are, and I'm rooting for her too. Because here's one thing that's for certain: I'm the novice here, but if Piper does pull it out, and you and I, right, following on your coattails, Absolutely. I'll be the only guy at this table that went three for three for the night. No way. Is that correct? You went three for three tonight? If Piper pulls back, it out, I went with you on Piper. I went with Steve on oh, Connor, and we all Rick, took down. We will never live this down. we got a bird hunter here that's going <laughs> to take and beat us at our own game. Now Rick. we've got a new expert. <laughs> no, no, I am no. <laughs> Heck no, I am definitely not the expert. I'm glad to be flanked for you guys. And uh, Cast three is declared. Cast two has been declared. And I think we're fixing to find out who the winner of cast one is. What you got for us, Alan? Oh, I'm sorry. We are not ready for that. I apologize. I think we are. Are we? Oh, yes, we are. All right. All right. Good enough. Good enough. So, yeah, we do have a winner declared in cast number one. Uh, a few minutes ago, I came on here and told you they were walking to Piper. Uh, she was treed again. Hunt was over. And that tree was going to determine the cast winner. And those Piper fans will be happy to know that, that they found a raccoon, and she's your winner with 750 plus. So that puts... Uh, she has the 750 to Bonnie's 575, and Bonnie will be the $5,000 winner and put Piper in the final three for a chance of the 50,000. Cast number one. Alan, how many uh, trees did Piper make there in the last, uh, what are we thinking, maybe 30 minutes, maybe or so? I am thinking, according to the scorecard I'm looking here, it looks like she made one, two, uh, three, four trees in the last 30 minutes. Just bang, wow. bang, bang. I may be wrong, maybe three or four here. Yeah. I may be off. I think maybe three. I'm sorry, three trees. Wow. That is amazing because looking at the scorecard here, at one point, uh, Piper had started off the night at, in the negative column and right. comes back. So when you look at the total score, break it down for us, Steve. How many positive points did Piper actually have tonight? I'm going to tell you something that I just looked at here, and, and, and this again, this is not official, mm -hmm. but we've been a part of these heads-up casts in many different scenarios or whatever, and by earliest collection of looking at this, this is one thing I take away from this here. From the reports we've got, now we have to make sure that it's right there. These three heads-up casts, I don't know if I've ever seen this in all my years of following these hunts. These heads-up casts have scored according to our records, on 14 raccoons. <laughs> that is incredible. Yeah. 14 raccoons in three heads-up rounds. And that's 14 first trees. Yeah. That's incredible. I, I can tell you uh, there's nobody going to walk away a loser tonight because there was opportunity there. Uh, and that's just, a, you know, it just, hey, it goes with the weekend, you know, you would think that warmer temperatures coming in. A lot of times you would think it would slow it down. It's been relatively cool here, but I tell you what, we are definitely seeing. And hey, 
It's kudos to the dogs that was here this weekend. These dogs that come here this weekend, that got through them regionals, got to this point. They got here for a reason. It, this, this is not surprising. These, these dogs are here because of their abilities, you know, because of their abilities. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's incredible, really, you know, in looking at that. Sure. And once again, we're talking about the best of the best. And you can see that, you know, when you put these dogs in the right environment here in this part of Indiana where there is so much game, these guys have really taken advantage of that, looking at the points up there. But, uh, again, we're going to take it to break here in just a few minutes. Are, are we going to talk about the pick on uh, cast one? <laughs> <laughs> but before we do, of course we're going to talk on about the pick what, on cast what, one. Uh, that, that, uh, Let's check our notes here and see. Yes, yes. Me and you had that one. We we did right we there, folks. One. You can see it. Uh, I had Piper with Rick, hey, and with me picking Dominator ahead of both of you guys, leading the way for us. Leading the way. Uh, I believe hey, that put me right over the edge. Hey, all I'm going to tell you, Rick, is uh, I did pick two of the final three. Uh, when the top 96 started, so I was. We're talking about this round right here, right now. <laughs> yeah, just say, yeah. Hey, <laughs> one one real quick point. Nick Emmel uh, lost with Gabby tonight, but think about this. He's got two dogs in the final cast that he had a huge part. You know, sure. with 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 Piper being out of Tracker and obviously McGregor being out of Abby. Two out of the final three. They don't dogs. have an award for TOC Breeder of the Weekend, but it would definitely go to Nick Hamill. <laughs> it would if, definitely if go to Nick Hamill. He, he obviously have. lost, and I'm sure he's disappointed in that, but I guarantee you he's going to be glued in to them final three. We'll probably be here when it's over with. Yeah. So, so here's absolutely. my question. Is there an award for the guy that got three for three tonight? I'm sure there is. I'm <laughs> not seeing anybody scrambling around trying to find something, but, but I'm sure there will be. Hey, I think that my reward for that is getting to go but come back here in just a little bit to the finals and, and, and talk about that with you guys. It's, it's going to be an exciting final three. Wow, it's going to be an exciting final three. It, it definitely is. Yeah, we'll come back here in just a little bit. We're going to take a break right now, though, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other programs in the United Kennel Club. You know, in addition to the field events, there are also – uh, a lot of different bench events as well. We're going to take a look here during the break at uh, some of the show dogs in the UKC. And then when we come back, we're going to break down the uh, finals tonight. Three dogs in this final hunt, one cast uh, of the night. And uh, give you a play-by-play -play of that action. So, Jay uh, Paul, there's $100,000 up for grabs this next round. Think about that. Is this crazy or what? $100,000. And 50000 To the winner. To the winner. To, to the winner. To the winner. Can you imagine placing third in anything you've done in life, and, hey, we're going to give you $20,000. Yeah. Yeah. You place third, you got a bronze medal, but we're going to give you $20,000 for your efforts. Yeah, all wow. three of these guys got to be happy knowing they're guaranteed no matter what happens, win, lose, or draw at the end of the night, they're walking away with at least – at least a $20,000 check here. It's incredible. $50,000 to the winner. Guys, please stick with us. Uh, we're going to have about 13, 15 minute break here. We've got to take time to gather in the scores, uh, let them get back to headquarters. Now it's a great time to give a shout out to Three Fat Labs, our, our venue, the event uh, center that we've had awesome been working place. out of awesome. this weekend. Unbelievable place. Super, super nice place. If you're in the Greencastle area and you've got any type of event going on, you really should consider Three Fat Labs. People have been great. The venue is absolutely beautiful. It's just been a fitting place to have this tournament of champions. So 13, 15, 20-minute break. Max, we're going to come back and we're going to set the stage for the finals here tonight in the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. While we're away, take a look at the show dogs of the UKC. The United Kennel Club's Tournament of Champions is brought to you by our official performance dog nutrition partner, Yukonuba. Fuel up, train hard, get after it. And by our official GPS collar partner, Dogtra. Make every dog exceptional. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
It's amazing, especially with the top dogs that were here today. I mean, and they all, what I could see looked like they were handling well. And, and I know personally most of the dogs that were on the bench, so it, it's, it's a great honor to win anything once, much less twice. Laying around in these shows like this all day waiting for this late at night, it's you know 9.30 at night or 8.30 here, all these dogs, when they come in here and they perform like they did today after driving 10 hours to get here and stuff, and it says a lot to the, the breed and the dog's physical condition in, in itself. I'm a little emotional. I mean, I have been in, a little bit in the past, but it, Sue's not been able to come out the last year and a half, so she got here, so it was, it was a little bit more for me. It's very overwhelming for her to consistently continue to do what she does. It really is. I'm so glad I could be here with Christine. I've been trying, and I've just had so much happen. I just haven't been able to be here share this time with her. It's just been great. And it's just been a great night. Yeah, it's just been great. I've known Christina for quite a few years <laughs> yeah, and been good friends. I uh, seen Legs as a puppy, tried to buy her from Christina and of course she was not going to part with her. <laughs> so she offered me partnership in her and it's all worked out great. Christina's kept her. I had her at my place for a little while. She's a little wild child. She. <laughs> She loves her, like she said, her activities. I mean, she's really an active dog, and she's a good dog. And uh, But Christine takes her and, and shows her all the time. I haven't been able to get to many of the shows. She's a great dog. And the only thing she has to prove is see what happens in the, the, the breeding pen, you know, because she's proved everything I've asked her to prove her in, in, in every venue of showing, all breed, been showing. You know, um, she has developed a little bit of a diva attitude <laughs> toward other dogs in the last year and a half and because she's traveled so much and stuff, but it is, it's truly amazing to see an animal perform. She's an athlete. I mean, she really is. We're going to try to show tomorrow in the Winter Classic and try our hand at that because we've not won it or placed in it. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of luck. We'll, if not, at least we can maybe look good being, you know, making somebody else look good too. Um, and uh, after that, her UKC bench showing is pretty much wound up. Uh, I may show her some ground shows just to keep her active and stuff, some all breed shows. and. Uh, you know, she's a grand champion in that, so she really doesn't have anything to, you know, but she likes doing it, and I like doing it. And my next big thing for her to do is, is I'm going to raise some puppies out of her. You know, me and Sue have, have talked about it, and, and we're going we're gonna to see what happens there. Can't wait to see what we get for pups, either. That's what I'm waiting for. She's just showing us everything that she possibly can. She just gives Christina her whole heart. You do good, huh? You good. Bridget Clary, I'm from Broadnax, Virginia. Her name is Lily. Skyline and Leave You Dare the Devil. It was very exciting. Um, I did not expect it, so when she won, I was very, I was very excited about it. Um, like I said, we, I know she's a very nice female, but she she just turned a year old, um, and she's still a registered dog. So to win overall at Winter Classic as a registered dog, that's pretty special. Her sire actually was the national grand show champion in 2021 at Autumn Oaks. Um, and she actually won best female of show there too. And that was actually her first bench show. That was really exciting. 
Her mom actually won Best Female of Show at Winter Classic in 2018. So it's really cool that her mom won Best Female of Show in 2018 and now she won Best Female of Show here in 2022. And then she won overall, that's, that's pretty amazing. She's a very nice dog. She's probably, you know, one of the nicest dogs that I've ever owned. And, um, you know, my, my dog partner, Beth Jenkins, um, she actually bred her. So it's really, it's pretty special to her to be her bred by too. It's really important to have the dog conditioned and in shape. Um, you know, she she gets to run around at home with her daddy and um, some other dogs that I have on the farm, and she's fed a good diet, and she gets worked every day on the bench leading up to a big show like this. That's really important. She gets her toenails done like twice a week. Um, she gets a bath like every other week. Um, so maintenance is really important too to keep their coat in good condition as well. She's not afraid to get dirty. Um, she will get dirty, but she is very prissy. Um, she's, obviously, she lives in the house with her dad and her brother. And um, so, you know, she sleeps in the bed. She sleeps upside down on the dog bed, on the couch. Um, she's, she's very funny. She's a very funny dog. And she loves to, um, she loves to make you happy. Um, she, all she cares about is pleasing you and, and doing the best job she can for you. She'll go back to Autumn Oaks this year. Um, she'll probably show an Autumn Oaks as a, a champion female. Um, we'll take her there, and other than that, I'm, I'm not sure what we might do with her. Maybe do some confirmation shows. Um, she's a beautiful moving dog, so um, I think she'll do very well in confirmation. She's, she's put together very well. She has a very nice shoulder. She has a very level top line. She has a nice rear. Um, she's got beautiful reach and drive. Um, and because she's built correctly, that allows her to move correctly. Um, she, uh, she's a very beautiful mover on the ground. Like I said, she's got great reach, great drive. Um, and she's just got that look at me factor about her when she goes around the ring. It's like, it's, it's hard to take your eyes off of her. She's very flashy when she shows. And she's very prissy, and she knows it. Check out the United Kennel Club online store for all of our magazine subscriptions and UKC merchandise. Go to shop.ukcdogs.com and you'll find all the best gear to support your UKC lifestyle. Snag a new hat, hoodie, or t-shirt and subscribe to our many publications, including our world-leading coonhound publication, Coonhound Bloodlines. We even have research pedigrees and rule books available to purchase. Why wait? Shop now. This is no ordinary puppy, and this is no ordinary story. This is the tale of a hero in the making. He is born, raised, and fed to rise to any challenge. Because he is no ordinary dog. He's a Yukonuba dog. Provides animal proteins and high levels of DHA. 
for a strong body and mind. Feed the extraordinary in your puppy and make your dog a Yukonuba dog. They're partners, ready to do whatever it takes. Athletes that pound for pound can outrun, outwork, and outperform anybody you're watching on Sunday. No contract required. You don't waste that kind of potential. You train it, fuel it, unleash it. You activate the power that sits ready and waiting inside every fiber of muscle. You fill every last cell with the energy to push harder than whatever gets in the way. You turn drive into overdrive, natural ability into legendary status. And to do it, you need nutrition that holds nothing back. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. Built to run full throttle on protein and fat, then find another gear. Made with nutrients that are customized for what your dog does. GI technology that supports optimal nutrient delivery and an antioxidant cocktail that helps day three feel like day one. Where your dog peaks depends on how far their fuel can take them. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. Four formulas to hold nothing back. Welcome back to the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. J. Paul Jackson, your host this evening. If you just join us and got our expert analyst alongside, Mr. Rick Stretch and Mr. Steve Burkholder. And guys, we're almost halfway through the night since the first hunt was only a 90-minute hunt and the finals are two hours here. But we're getting pretty close to the halfway point. Um, if you just started to tune in to the live stream, of course, we started the night to recap with six dogs and handler teams that came in. These teams were divided into three casts to go head to head. In cast number one, we had Bonnie and Piper. In number two, Connor and Gabby. And in cast number three, Dominator and Echo. Uh, we now have three cast winners. The finals have been set. Piper came in uh, to the finals here with the, as the high point dog in the plus column with 750 points at the end of the hunt to advance. Connor 400 plus and Dominator 375. So the field's set going into the finals. Three dogs now all going against each other. Next two hours. Tell Steve, starting with you, what do you expect coming into this finals? Well, I can, I can, I feel really confident that it's going to take a dog that's going to, I think they're going to have to score on multiple coons to win this late round. Uh, I really do. Judging by, uh, you know, just going through the scores from last night um, uh, in the late round, uh, you know, uh, Connor McGregor in the late round last night scored 475 plus. We've all been around these hunts for a long time. These guys prepare to win these late rounds. The early round, a lot of times you go out in the early round, uh, and, and it's just nature. You know, when we, when we get these dogs ready and we're competing with them, uh, most of the time you come home from work, you know, you uh, get your stuff done, you go out, you hunt at dark, usually by midnight you're back home because you got to go to work the next day. But, but these guys, I guarantee you, they prepared for this next round. This next round is the toughest round in hunting most of the time because dogs already have 90 minutes or two hours underneath their belt. Uh, you're wore down a little bit. They're wore down a little bit. They're getting their second win. And, you know, we've all had a lot of dogs that could look really good that early round, and you put them in a late round type of atmosphere, and they just couldn't win because it was just hard for them to get started back going. But I can guarantee you these three handlers and three, these three hounds are ready for this next round. They prepared uh, for several weeks to get ready for this. And looking by what they did, 
in the late round last night, Conor McGregor had 475 plus. So that tells you he scored on at least three uh, late. And uh, then we had Dominator. He scored 375 plus late last night. So he scored on at least two. And then Piper, um, she's, uh, she looks like she probably scored on one. She had 175. So uh, that tells me that these dogs are ready for this late round. And knowing these three handlers and these three guys, you know, they've all, they, they know. <coughs> You know, um, they're ready they, to go. It sounds to me like these they guys, are great. All three They've are... all won world championships before, so they know what it takes to win. Gotcha. Well, we're done with it. They've gathered back at Three Fat Labs, and I think that we've got some live footage right now coming up. A little bit of, of post footage. Let's take it live over to our venue at Three Fat Labs right now. Can you do a big love countdown? Trevor? Yeah. You wait. Jeff is doing so good. Ready? Three, two, one, you're live. Thanks, guys. I'm here with uh, Cast 3 winner, Joe Manning, who is handling Dominator Dog Tonight. Uh, Joe, can you tell me a little bit about your cast tonight? Absolutely. We had a lot of action going on uh, first uh, 30 minutes of our cast. Uh, we each treat two coons apiece, and uh, then the rest of the cast, it kind of filtered out and got a little bit slow, but had enough to get it done early. Yeah, it seems like coons are moving good tonight. Uh, it's starting to cool off a little bit. We've got a slight breeze. How do you think this late round is going to go? It's going to be a coon tree and contest going on late, I believe, with what we have going late with us. Yeah, we got the luxury of knowing the three dogs in the cast. We know they're all three tough dogs, three tough handlers. Uh, at this point, you're at least guaranteed 20000 How's that sound right now? That sounds pretty good, Trevor. <laughs> 50000 sounds a little better, right? Sounds a lot better. <laughs> yes, sir. Cut awesome. back to you guys. Thank you. All right, perfect. All right. Sounds good. There we go. Oh, yeah, Jeff, when we started, there was like a 10 second delay because I said, when, as soon as you said go, we started. Awesome, guys. Thank you, Trevor. I'll tell you what, I heard both of you guys, a lot of big smiles right here at the broadcast table and, and some laughs. Uh, really interested. Obviously, he was very excited about as. You guys predicted twenty thousand dollars is the worst thing that can happen to him tonight, and you know that's sunk in right now. What What are your it's comments? It's not a there? life changer, but you can see right there, it's a game changer. And and uh, I'm happy for Joe. I mean, he's going to be the senior out there in that final round tonight, and uh, you know he knows what it's about. And and twenty thousand dollars, he'll be smiling. He'll he'll have a big smile on his face when they present that to him if that's what he gets. Uh, I'm sure he's shooting for the big for the big win, but uh, if that's what he winds up with, he'll be happy. Yeah, and one thing that struck me is an outsider to the coon hound world. You know, it's a real privilege to get to be here with you guys, by the way. But really love the way that these guys are such great sportsmen, and that was very evident in the reaction from both of you guys just then to Joe's comments. You couldn't see him, of course, we were off camera, but. You know, it was very, very evident from your, your reaction that both you guys, you're just super happy for all, all three of these fellows that have made it to the finals and their dogs. Well, you know, to Rick's point, Joe, I think he shared earlier, is 52. Yeah. And, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, me being 49, and I know we're not going to discuss Rick's age because uh, we just won't go there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you, when you compete in these hunts for as many years as we do, uh, you know our window of opportunity to keep up with these, I guess, young guys, you could say. You know, um, there's a reason that, you know, Michael Jordan didn't play basketball until he was 50. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a reason that, you know, you know it, it just age catches up with you. And I can guarantee you, uh, Joe is enjoying this ride of his life because we've all got on them, you know, them heaters. And he's on one of them heaters right now. And uh, you don't know how long it's going to last. And uh, so, you know, it, really happy for him. Sure. Absolutely. So, and I think we're going to actually try to get to speak with all three of our finalists. Uh, let's take it back over right now to Three Fat Labs and Trevor, because I believe he has another one of our cast winners. Trevor, it's yours, buddy. All right. Three, two, one, one. Thanks, guys. Now I'm here with J.R. Gray, who is handling Connor McGregor tonight in cast two. Uh, J.R., can you tell us a little, about, a little bit about your cast tonight? Yeah, we uh, cut loose. Dallas kind of went the wrong way back toward the road. Uh, we go uh, Nick, Trees at, or Nick Trees Gabby. She makes a couple barks, and she rolls out, so he takes 100 quarter minus. Well, we've got down to the road, stay for, I don't know, seven or eight minutes. Dallas keep breaking the eight. 
Uh, Connor gets a tree. We go to him. He's got a coon. Well, we get Connor off. I recut him. Gabby's probably treated a mile and a half the other direction. Well, we go to Gabby. She's got a coon. We get back. There's only about 15, 20 minutes left. Uh, I had to treat Connor in. We go back to Connor. Connor's got another coon in a den tree, and that's pretty much the end of the hunt. Yeah, was, there was a, a little bit of suspense there at the end uh, during the the score updates. Uh, so uh, the the dogs are in the final cast, Piper and uh, and Dominator. You've probably hunted with these dogs before. What are you expecting on the cast tonight? Oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a good one. I mean, it, there's, both of them's done a lot of winning. And we're just happy to be here. I think they said so far there's been 14 coons treed on the early round. So I think that trend's going to continue late. What do you think? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, how much of that? Uh, Hundred thousand. That's available in this final cash. Are you wanting to win? Well, we'd like to go for fifty, but hey, we're we're just blessed to be here. Anything now is just icing on the cake. Hey, good luck to you, bud. Right, we'll you, go man. back to the guys in the studio. Thanks a lot, Trevor. While we were away just then, uh, Rick reached over and poked me, and you know we got to give you a little bit of credit right there because earlier when the scores came in. You took a look at all the scores, being the expert analyst that you are. And, and how many tre- coons did you say you figured they'd treat based on the scorecards? They, they, uh, according to what we've got, and I'm pretty, we're, I know we're pretty close to this, is they scored on 14 coons in three cats. Heads up cast to boot. You know, uh, that's a little bit more doable in four dog cast, but in three heads up cast. And again, guys, this is in 90 minutes, not two hours. You know, most of these head up, heads up casts, are 102 hour intervals and this is a 90 minute interval and to score 14 raccoons yeah uh, he, he didn't even incredible. catch it either i don't think he caught that trevor actually pointed out that they yeah, scored right. 14 raccoons so you were dead on the yeah. money yeah. you know we, we rick really hates for me to say that you were actually well, right uh, about uh, something inaccurate there but well, got to give you credit a Steve. blind shall will find an acorn <laughs> 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 Yeah. Talk to him, he's right all the time. So I'm watching. I learned for, from one of the best. I'm watching for the mistakes. You guys are watching for the, for the uh, right ones. Yeah, but he didn't even catch that Trevor said no, I know, it was yeah. 14. Yeah, he, he wasn't paying he didn't attention. Miss that. Yeah, huh. but nice me, if he starts paying attention a little more, he'll catch that stuff. <laughs> I, I'm really impressed, though. Personally, I got to give the man credit. I mean, he is an expert. For you to well, analyze the scorecards and figure out 14, well, and then for Trevor to confirm it. It uh, you know being a part of uh, being a part of putting these hunts on uh, one of the things and and we've both been I've, I've been the president of our own uh, hunting club and and putting on a lot of these big hunts that's one thing and and Rick has and I know Alan and Trevor you know they this is things that you look at you know you you want to give hunters a reason to come back and compete and uh, I can you know I want to touch on the on the a little bit on the uh, Greencastle Indiana Club. They've done a phenomenal job this weekend. They have. The, whoever put this guide situation together, and kudos to the guides. And, you know, and understand there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes that we a lot of times don't talk about. You know, you, you know the landowners that give us the opportunity sure. to hunt. You know, it's just, you know, and it Without obviously. The landowners, this flat out does not happen. It does happen. not happen. And, yeah. and so there, there's a lot of people uh, that play a role in it. And I can tell you by hearing from the guys this weekend, from the hunters and all of us, uh, we're just super thankful that we have that opportunity, that they have that opportunity, that we have landowners that still let us hunt and, uh, you know, let us free cast our hounds. And then, the, and then the, these guys did an excellent job getting ready for this hunt. There's a lot of work that goes in on that. No doubt about it. And I'll tell you, we also have to give a shout out and big props to the guy over there on the other side of the room, Alan Gingrich, the director of hunting ops for the United Kennel Club. I mean, everything at the end of the day goes back to Alan. He, he's the guy that the buck stops with to even get us here in Greencastle and work with the locals and, and get everything organized. And I, I tell you, this is my third major UKC Coonhound event, and I've been very, very impressed. Uh, Alan Gingrich, really, really good at his job, as evidenced by your, your comments right there and, you know, having a great field uh, of judges here, a great field of guides here, coordinating all of that with the landowner. I mean, that's what being the director of hunt, hunting ops is all about. And uh, Alan's doing a really, really good job. Very, very happy that we've got him here as part of the United Kennel Club. You know, and we're fixing to get to our, our last uh, cast winner, but before we do, while, 
you know, we heard him talking there about Connor and the conditions. Uh, both of you guys, you touched on it first, Rick, made a – tell us about, you know, your thoughts on how far they were. I think you said – Yeah, what what I uh, – listening to JR there, it kind of played out the way we discussed it. You know, um, uh, you know he probably didn't know exact distance, but he, he claimed about a mile and a half as where Gabby wound up. And, and then they got to walk that distance back or near that distance to where they can get back within hearing of Connor – and uh, not taking anything away from Connor. I mean, 400 plus, you know, he'd he done a phenomenal job all weekend. He's a phenomenal pup. Um, but the clock just kind of worked against Gabby and, and Nick right there. If she blowed way in there. They had to go in there. They're using time going to her, and they're using time coming back. And uh, the, clock, the clock was totally against her there towards the last 30 minutes of the hunt. Yeah, but I, I think it was you, Steve, that said you were shocked that they were even able to, to hear in those conditions and at the distances. Tell, tell me what your thoughts are. Yeah, there. well, you know, as you noticed uh, in the live video there, it's a little breeze. There's a little breeze blowing. Right. And, and I can tell you, uh, I guarantee you, her being in there a mile or a mile and a quarter, whatever she was in there, that breeze was in their direction because if it wasn't, I don't care how loud they are, it'd be hard to hear them. Right. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes that goes for you. And, you know, dogs are smart. You know, more than likely, uh, I've never hunted with Gabby, but, you know, she probably was hunting in that wind uh, because that's what they use their scent for or whatever. And, you know, unfortunately, she just had to travel that far to get one tree. Sure. And, you know, good, the good thing for Nick is he got to hear her because the wind was probably in his right direction. But I would say it's breezy enough tonight that had she bent the wrong direction, had she went the wrong direction, he would have never heard her. Yeah. So it worked out good for him. But like Rick said, you know, that downtime, uh, again, that comes down to breaks. And, and hey, I guarantee you, uh, you still won't sacrifice a dog that goes hunting for one because if they don't go hunting and find one, you have no shot at winning. Sure. So It's kind of like a double-edged sword. There's, it's a great break that they actually heard Gabby when she was giving voice, um, but it's also a bad break that they had to travel so well, that very far. So, you know, if, if, the, if the distance was a mile and a quarter, a mile and a half, a mile and a half, we're at three miles now. A mile, yeah, a mile and a half sure. in there and a mile and a half back. Round trip. And, uh, you know, for a mile and a quarter, it's two and a half miles. And uh, the clock's ticking. The clock's and, ticking down. And I can tell you this, uh, Jason Bryant was a judge on that cast. And if you've ever hunted with Jason, uh, he, can, he can get through that. He can walk. And uh, so I guarantee you they didn't spend no time going there and coming no, back they, through there. They moved. Uh, they, they moved, moved because, you know, uh, Nick is obviously younger. Uh, J.R. Gray is younger. And, uh, you know, so it wasn't like, that, you know, because, hey, let's face it, some of the cast, you know, is a little tougher to move. But them guys are, are, are in shape. And I guarantee they got in there, got her scored, and got back as quick as they did. But it was still time that they was on the ground. Yeah. So talking about time and the clock, what are some of the instances where maybe the clock would stop? Because obviously if they're just split up and the dogs are hunting, it continues to run. Right. Under what circumstances would we have, you know, the clock stop where that maybe wouldn't be as tough on a dog being so far apart? If we need to find new hunting ground. Uh, if we've run out of hunting ground, uh, possibly in a scenario where one of the dogs got in an area that, they, that we didn't have permission to be in. Uh, maybe we uh, had one or two of the dogs on a leash and one or two of them were at large. Uh, possibly take a strike minus or something like that. The, the eight minutes gets them. And, uh, you know, it's just time to, to find a new spot. Mm -hmm. That's when the clock would stop. Um, sometimes when there's a question on a scratch, um, the next opportune time where we can uh, get all the dogs rounded up or get our hands on them, we can call time out and come back in and uh, let the Master of Hounds or the panel this weekend uh, rule on it. You know, that would be another scenario. So there's a... There's a few times, uh, most likely it's needing new hunting ground. Sure. Well, obviously hunting ground has not been a big deal here. I mean, these dogs tonight, they've been very successful. Last night, all the dogs had a lot of success. They made a lot of game. And while we're waiting uh, for this last and final interview, let's take a little bit of a look at some of the footage from last night and what transpired yesterday here at the Tournament of Champions. So, you know, right here we see we're at Three Fat Labs. We've been talking about this venue, guys. And for you guys that are out there watching right now on the live stream, you can see that uh, the United Kennel Club has picked an awesome spot. Nicole Sedlecki and her major events crew, they did a wonderful, wonderful job. We see uh, Megan there passing out 
a, a goodie bag uh, there. I love this place. I love this venue. It is super, super cool. It's very, very dog friendly. You know, everybody's getting to take a really good look right now at what we keep talking about. You know, the Three Fat Labs venue has been a wonderful place. Catering was absolutely excellent. Of course, yesterday it all started out uh, between three and five. We had all of our 94 teams come and check in. Everybody received their bag, uh, received their number as well before the caster also. Everyone had a number. After these guys came in, they got all their goodies, but then they went around to the back, uh, the patio off of the venue there, and you could see that each one of the teams kind of gets their moment in the sun. Everybody gets to go out there with the professional talk photographer, get your dog all prettied up, set in position, uh, get your moment here to really enjoy being at the Tournament of Champions. You know, these guys had a great, great time out there, and then we got to talk to all of them as well. So yesterday we had a wonderful time out there. I want to thank all the guys and the folks at Three Fat Labs for having us up out there. So I, Steve and I went back out uh, and as the top, uh, as the 24 cast winners come in last night, we had an opportunity to, to interview maybe close to 20 of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a question or two uh, nearly for, the same question or two for nearly all of them. Um, one, have you, have you ever been to a Coonhound event with this type of venue? And the answer was no. No, we except never, for the ones that were here last year, obviously. Well, last yeah. year, yeah, and uh, and there was a hand, there was a two or three of those, but uh, correct, yeah. They, the answer was a resounding no. They've right. never been to a Coonhound event where the venue was as nice as this one here is. Uh, that video right there only showed twenty percent of what the rest of us have seen, and uh, and then the second thing that I asked them was, how far did you have to travel to hunt tonight? And the farthest time that anybody quoted back to me was 35 minutes. Wow. And most of them were within that 10 to 20 minute range. Mm. And uh, that's just phenomenal for, for the Greencastle Club uh, to, to put the hunters that close to Fat Labs. Mm. And um, it, it made for just a, a perfect hunt. No cast got scratched for missing a deadline this weekend. And uh, I always enjoy that. I hate, I hate to see a cast miss a deadline. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's a lot of scenarios where they just couldn't help it. You know, and and for the clock to take them out of it just doesn't always seem fair to me. But uh, you have to have these deadlines and things like that. Well, when you're only traveling 35 minutes from the club, you're you're ready to draw out by seven o'clock. You're all going to make it back. Sure. And now you were here, actually. Steve Burkholder made it to the Tournament of Champions as a handler last year. Made it this year. Unfortunately, his dog came into season. But what were your thoughts last year when you showed up here for the first time at this venue? You know, speak a little bit as a handler showing up. Uh, your thoughts. Well, when Alan was sharing with me about this place, um, Honestly, I thought he was stretching the truth a little bit. Us hunters, coon hunters tend to do that a little bit. No. Um, but, but you know, I remember pulling in, and honestly, I, I thought we was coming to a wedding reception or something like that because I said, <laughs> this is too nice to be a coon hunt. And uh, I just remember the, the red carpet was rolled out, but I tell you what I really remember the most about that is last year they, it was a little different format, so they hunted the top 16 hunted and then they come in and hunted the final four off and I remember uh, winning my cast uh, to get to that top of 15 mm -hmm. and coming back in there and last year we would we come walking down the sidewalk brought our dog in, and got a picture taken they did a little bit different and I remember coming walking down and just seeing the lights at nighttime this place that was a daytime shot mm -hmm. you don't know the really what you ha what it is until you come back as a cast winner at Three Fat Labs with all the lights on and the banners uh, and the Yukonuba flags and all that out there. It, it's just, it goes through, it still sends chills up my spine thinking of that moment. You know what I mean? Of being in that top 15. And uh, it just, you knew you was a part of something special. And, uh, you know, we seen that resounding last night. So it was absolutely awesome. No doubt. And we're fixing to go back to that great venue now because I believe that we have our third team to qualify for these finals uh, set up there with Trevor. Let's, let's hear from these guys live right now. 
No, I went back to the same station. Thanks, guys. I'm here with Cast uh, One Winner, Dole Murphy, who's hunting the Piper Dog tonight. Dole, you had the comeback of the century. Here, can you tell us a little bit about your cast? Yeah, it uh, started off pretty rough. We, uh, Bonnie was split with a coon, and I was on the bad end of it. Just a den that you could see all the way through and everything, and with no coon there, so I got minus pretty quick. And then uh, I ended up treeing another coon about 100 yards away, and then uh, she ended up, Bonnie ended up getting through the world, had another coon. And uh, after that, I mean, I think I treed four coon in, in like 38 minutes to, to secure it at the end. I mean, I ended up treeing in the last 30 seconds of the hunt for the win, so we're just happy to be here. Yeah, I think it's safe to say you had the, the whole venue here on the edge of their seats. Uh, social media was a buzz. The YouTube was a buzz. Uh, you guys have some uh, some left in the tank for later on tonight? We hope so. If not, I mean, we're happy to be here, so it is what it is at this point. Yeah, you're guaranteed twenty thousand dollars at this point. Uh, uh, you've been around a lot of the hunts. Uh, probably seen Dominator and McGregor before. Or Connor McGregor before. Uh, what are you expecting on the cast tonight? I uh, they're gonna have coon when they tree. I just hope uh, I do too. You know, I mean, it could be anybody's. They're all them two dogs are really nice dogs and win a lot. And uh, we'll have to see here shortly. All right, good luck to you tonight, Duel. Now back to the guys in the studio. Welcome back, guys. Uh, you were just talking about it there, Steve, and you could see it in that shot. You know, the banners blowing in the wind there, the sidewalk, the, the front of it. So, guys, you got a really good direct look at exactly what Steve Burkholder was describing. And I'm sure these guys were every bit as excited, probably a lot more because they're going into the final three, you know, coming back to that site tonight. Uh, they're going to be back there for just a few minutes, but they don't have a whole lot of time to regroup because – this thing ain't over yet. I mean, yeah, they're going to be heading out here in the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm sure, headed to the spot that they're going to hunt the finals in. And uh, they, they, uh, we talked about their nerves the first round, and uh, they're nervous this <laughs> round as well. Uh, but, but this round here, uh, they can afford to be a little bit nervous, you know, with the money that they're hunting for. Yeah. Although it seemed pretty doggone composed standing there. The one that really seemed the most relaxed to me was Joe. I mean, Joe just was... Joe is Dog a calm, happy to be there. He's a calm, cool guy. I had the, uh, the best time uh, talking to him and Eldon Corrick today. Um, I, I really appreciated the opportunity to talk with him, guys. And uh, calm. Calm is how I would describe their demeanor today. And uh, Joe, Joe and I, I, I put the notebook, the notepad down, and Joe and I just talked about a lot of things that that uh, we wouldn't share out in, in a public venue like this, but um, it, it, uh, it was really great talking to him. And, and Eldon and I go back many, many years. Eldon, Eldon is a well-respected hunter up there in, in north central Missouri, and uh, he, he's been a pioneer. Uh, what's that place that they hold the big hunt at? La Plata, Missouri. Uh, La Plata, Missouri. He's been the pioneer up there of, of some major events, and he's the glue. He's the glue along with a handful of the other guys up there. And, and uh, wow, was, uh, Steve was with me today whenever we interviewed Eldon. And uh, just calm, calm describes Eldon. I mean, he, we would get sidetracked. We would be talking about this dog, and this dog would lead into that dog. And, and it would lead into this buddy of his that uh, got him started hunting. And it was just a barrel of fun today to interview these guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's great camaraderie and a great community but also the longevity and of it to hear you talking about you know Eldon and all the years that so many of you guys go back and then though we see the young guys coming in I mean how old is Duel? Uh, Duel's 32. He's yeah. been hunting uh, this and we probably talked about it earlier tonight uh, he's only been hunting close to six years. Total. Indeed. He's only been competition hunting like four. Yeah uh, it, it uh I don't know when I've ever seen anybody grab the reins and, and cross the finish line uh, faster than Duel has. He's picked up on this uh, sport so fast and has done so well in it. It's, 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 it's amazing it's, to watch. Yeah. What, what's really awesome, so Duel got started hunting by a, a, a gentleman, older gentleman by the name of Roger Searles, who did, he just, oh, yeah. he just didn't care to co competition. He's just a pleasure hunter. And, and Roger's brother, uh, Joe Searles, Joe. Joe and Peggy, used yep. to own a store down mm -hmm. there that we used to go to, a hunting store. And this is an interesting story about Duel Murphy. He told me this story today. I never knew this about Duel. 
So he decided that he was going to have to get away from Roger because uh, he would go hunt with Roger or whatever. So he started looking for his first dog that he wanted to buy. He got on Craigslist. And he bought a dog off a of Craigslist. I've never heard this. <laughs> yes, no a dog kidding. called Sherm. Okay, it was his first dog that he ever owned. And he starts hunting this dog up, and this dog ends up being a little bit better than what he thought. And so he goes out and he starts hunting. And he hunted a few hunts and kind of got his feet wet or whatever. So he decided to take Sherm. And, uh, and uh, uh, Rick will uh, remember these guys' names, but he decides to go hunt a few money hunts. And he draws out Mike Nelson, uh, Jeremy Jones, and you have to understand, these guys are in their prime. And he Studs. goes out, yeah, so uh, let me back up a little bit. He goes and wins the first round. They get to the late round. Well, they realize they got dual in the cast, so they're thinking, hey, we got first, second wrapped up. We got this kid that nobody knows about. We'll take him back out in the late round and, you know, throttle you know, him. Throttle him <laughs> you know what I mean? And dual goes out, and he said they did everything that they could. I mean, he laughs about it now, but he takes this dog called Sherm that he bought off of Craigslist, and he goes out there and he wears them out on the late round to the point where Mike Nelson tells him, he said, I'm going to buy your dog from you. you know? <laughs> uh, so that's Did really, he? Uh, no, he didn't, end up, he didn't end up selling. He actually ended up keeping Sherm. Uh, you know, I think he kept him until, I think he told me uh, uh, until he died. You know, but that was, that was his first dog that he started cutting uh, his teeth out in these hunts, you know. And then obviously he got Piper and it went on up from there. So He, uh, he and Jason Smith partner up on, uh, is it in your notes there on River? They, uh... Yeah, so uh, yeah, he, he, partnered, he, he partnered up with uh, Jason Smith on, on River at Johnny Watkins. Uh, he was partners with him. Uh, you know, for a while. So he's and he's had in a relatively short period of time. He was he was with River. He had Melvin, uh, who they won a ton with, and I mean, done this all in relatively like four, three years, four years, three four years. Man, let's see, you yeah. guys. I'm ready to go out and buy a dog right now. I want to partner yeah. up on a dog. I hope my wife isn't watching right now, honey. <laughs> I'm sort of joking. Just sort of the. He, he, you want to get off your phone? Are you searching Craigslist right now? No, no I was. I, I, want to, I was just. I was. Need looking, to stay focused on I was, this. I, know. I was look. I was looking at the notes. Oh, okay. uh, he he got he got uh, he got Piper as a puppy right when Sherm when he was done when Sherm was. Uh, 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 actually, I think he, if I recall right, uh, he had an accident with Sherman. I think he ended up getting, uh, I think he ended, something ended up happening to him. And he got Piper, but along, along right then, he acquired River with Jason Smith. And uh, get this, he acquires River with Jason Smith. She's a year old. A year later, they win Autumn Oaks. They win uh, UKC Autumn Oaks, and he's literally a one year of the big and a half. Three. Yeah, one of the big three right. uh, with River. So he has her with them, and then he got, and then he acquired Melvin with Johnny Watkins. And the resume they have, I think he told me that. Uh, oh, I know this. He's well, uh, won well over a hundred thousand with Melvin. Wow. You know, so so he uh, yeah, it's just it's incredible. You'd like to think he's a greenhorn, only hunting four or five years, but uh, one two no truck greenhorn I mean, there. Yeah, when when you're talking about a dog, a guy that's an owner that's here at the TOC has won, only been around four years, has won Autumn Oaks. And folks, if you're not really familiar with the game here in the United Kennel Club, uh, there are three major coonhound events every year, uh, three of the biggest coonhound events in the world uh, that are hosted by the United Kennel Club. Obviously, the Tournament of Champions, which has the largest purse of anyone out there, quarter million dollars this year. But we also have Autumn Oaks and the World Championship. And, you know, those are kind of like the majors in golf. Uh, for a golfer, for a coonhound guy, you know, that's the big three in the United Kennel Club world. So Duel in four years has done really, really well. And to have a dog with over $100,000 in earnings is unbelievable. Just a really interesting individual. And then, of course, you know, we've talked about Joe and we've talked about Duel. Our third handler of the night, we've got Logan, uh, who's also – Coming into this thing, how old is Logan, Steve? Do you know? Uh, Logan was 19, and you know he hunted the Echo Dog that ended up uh, dominating and edging him by 25. But yeah. you know, I one, he's still yeah, in college. Uh, we he's still in college, him. and uh, you know he, uh, you know I, I know he got beaten earlier on, but you know he wanted to, he wanted to thank a lot of guys. Logan is a very, very uh, respectful young man, as humble as they come. I, you know, I was so impressed with him today, how he handled himself. You know, I mean, one of the first things he wanted to do is he wanted to thank uh, his, his mom and dad. That was really important to him. You know, he, you know, his mom and dad gave him opportunity. They introduced him to the sport. You know, his dad introduced him to the sport. Uh, he absolutely loves it. Um, you know, he wanted to thank, you know, he said, I want to thank my brother, uh, you know, his, obviously close to his brother. He wanted to thank Chris Bowling and, and Eric Bowling. Uh, these guys have been huge for him. Uh, Randy Sizemore. Uh, he wanted to thank his partner, Chris Hatfield, you know, that, that he's partners with on the dog. 
and he said he wanted to thank the local clubs for taking the time out when he first started hunting because his dad didn't hunt or whatever. A lot of them guys took him underneath his wing and, and give him an opportunity to get him to this point. And he, you know, he was really wanted to thank J.R. Gray for giving him the opportunity to help him introduce him to the hunts and, and get these dogs hunt ready. And you know, guys, this is why this Three Fat Labs uh, is so, he come last year on a last minute, he was asked to come to this venue last year as a backup handler. And he jumped in the truck and he come up as a backup handler. And when he got home, he told his dad, he said, I will make it to that hunt at one time to hunt at that hunt as a handler, as a hunter. And he said he went home and for the next year, that was in the back of his mind, that he would try to get through the regionals so he could come just because of how impressed he was with what he's seen last year. So that's just, it's just a plug. I know we've talked about it a couple of times, but that's just what this event does to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you guys talk about Duel, who of course, uh, you know, 32, but hadn't been around very long, young guy. And, and you know, Joe, who beat Logan with Dominator, I believe. Right. Uh, the oldest guy, Handler, probably in, in the field. I thought, you know, it was worth taking a look there, even though Logan didn't make it to the final three here. Just another young guy, and but he's actually been hunting for about the same amount of time that Duel has, from what I understand. Uh, yeah, in, right. the hunts, yeah, in the yeah, hunts, in the hunts. Yeah, he's yeah. been he's been coon only for about seven years, but he really yeah, but just. I mean, Duel's been hunting yeah. for four. So yeah, but he's just go. really yeah. been hunting in the hunts for probably the last two three years. You know, so yeah. he actually had a female, uh, his first good female he bought. He bred to the um, oh the the dog that father and son the father and son dog that was here, um, Echo's sire. I can't think of it. Um, let me look here. Knockout. Yeah, Knockout. Yeah. And uh, Chris Bowling owns Knockout. And uh, he said, man, I hunted with him. And that dog was so impressive. So he took his own female, bred it to Knockout. And this is where Echo come from. So he raised Echo as a puppy, got him ready, got him qualified for this hunt. And now he gets to the top six here. I mean, think about at 19 years old. You know, uh, at 19 years old, I was just trying to figure out coon hunting, let alone right. take one and raise it from a puppy and get it to be able to compete in that. Uh, so. no, no doubt about it. So, you know, we've talked uh, about... A duel. We've talked about Joe. Let's talk a little bit about our third handler, you know, to make it here. J.R. Gray. J.R., yeah. And um, like I said earlier in the evening, uh, J.R. won the world hunt there at Mount Gilead, Ohio. And, and I was lucky enough to be out on the final cast with that. And uh, that's probably where I first met J.R. He was relatively unknown, I think, right right up to that point. And uh, so, yeah, he, he's, he's really made a... a a splash here in this in this hunting organization and uh, um, he's, he's hunting pups out of Willie and uh, it's proven fact now that we, we're seeing that Willie is going to be a dominant reproducer and uh, there's a lot of good young dogs out of him there was four in this last started there was last four in the top 96 yeah. yeah four four dogs out so we had uh, five out of Shaq and four out of Willie that's almost 10% of the dogs that were here were out of those two stud dogs last night. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, JR, that, that, that's where we all learned JR's name was at the World Hunt when he won it in 2018. And JR couldn't have been that old in 2018 um, when he won the World Hunt. I mean, he, if I recall, uh, if I recall uh, on that, he was, uh, uh, I don't even. I don't think I asked him his age because I didn't want him asking mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I yeah, you, I, I didn't ask him how old he was. I'm gonna, he's in his he's, he's mid twenties. Yeah, yeah, JR's got to be yeah. probably yeah, the youngest handler yeah, of the three so, uh, as well. He was four in his early twenties. Yeah, he was in his early twenties when he won the world yeah, hunt with, maybe, with Willie. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so two young guys here uh, with JR and Duel. To me, thirty-two or thirty-four it, it, seems it very, very young. Yeah, I mean, young. When we look at the top. Age, look at the top yeah, six. Like we talked about earlier, Joe Manning was what fifty one or fifty two. I believe the rest of them are all early thirties or younger. Yeah, you know that's just uh, you know I guess we're gonna have to step up our game, Rick. <laughs> I mean, or get out of the way, one <laughs> or two. Or the right, yeah, um. and, and not only younger. I mean, we're also talking about with Jr. a younger dog. How old is, is Dominator now? Or uh, Connor, Gregor, or, 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 Jr.'s hunting Connor. Connor, Connor, Connor I'm sorry, Connor. I apologize. Connor. Twenty eight months. Yeah. Twenty eight months. Yeah, yeah. Connor is. Today. How old is Dominator? He's three. Three. They're both yeah. young dogs. Yeah. That. And hey, yeah. Dominator's got a resume behind him out of this world. I mean, the mm -hmm. dogs won over a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. You know, three I mean, years old. Yeah. Over. I yeah. mean, how impressive is that, Rick? Yeah, right. And it's yeah. it's super impressive. I wouldn't want to try to figure out their taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. So well, when we're talking about the uh, the younger guys, 
I want to make mention one more time, and I know Steve did too this evening, uh, Maddox Arnett. Oh. 13 years wow. old, coming to this hunt. And uh, I, I mentioned yesterday that I met Maddox up there at a little uh, friendly gathering that Duel took me to last fall. And uh, man, he, he, he is a young man in a, in a boy's body. And uh, it was so good to see him here. He actually uh, had to high, uh, had one of the higher scores in Ohio, and I got over to talk a thousand to, points. He over a thousand, I think eleven fifty. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I actually got to talk to him and his dad, Mike, at Ohio when they come in with that score. And uh, wow, Mike's feet uh, couldn't even <laughs> bend on the ground at that point. You know, he was so happy for Maddox, and uh, I was uh, I, I was really hoping that they would make another round or two, or even get to where these guys are at. And and it didn't work out for him. I know they had a great hunt and. Uh, Maddox just said uh, Libby didn't didn't perform like she could, and they simply got beat there early Friday night. Yeah, and that's probably what impressed me the most. You know, uh, you know, it, it. We all go through that stage where sometimes I'm not saying that you think you become invincible, but you know, uh, even in defeat, you know, uh, you know, and hey, that's kudos to his dad. You know. Oh yeah. Uh, you know they. You know they. They, they have. You know. Uh, these kids have role models, you know, and, and, you, and you, obviously you choose a role model that you want to be a part of. But, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sport of, uh, of what we do, uh, I can tell you for us, you know, some of, some of my best friends and, and people that we enjoy, the hunts is great. It, it's great coming to these venues, okay? It's great to compete. But I can tell you it's the friendships and the camaraderie. Uh, with coming to these hunts that brings you back year after year. Okay. You know, the winning is obviously a bonus. It really is. And, you know, uh, putting, putting Matt, you take someone like Maddox and Mike, his dad, putting them in the right situation, you know. And I can tell you, um, uh, being around this sport for a lot of years, when Maddox turns 18, 19, 20 years old, He's yeah. going to be tough to, you know, yeah. you know, he's you going to be a thirty-year-old man. It would seem almost. Well, you take, yeah, right. you take, yeah, because he's yeah. so mature. You, you, you take, you, know, it. you take you Zach, you know, Zach, you know, McBee won a state championship at ten years old. Yeah. You know, yeah. there, it's no, it's no wonder that he's competing in the yeah, top right. nine. It's no wonder that he won a, you know, a twenty thousand dollar hunt last fall. And I can guarantee you, this is a duo. I guarantee you, they're going away tonight. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, there's two sides to it. Uh, you have. Uh, Duel, who's super excited, made a huge comeback. But you know what? I guarantee you on Zach, uh, it's a little bit, when you have that big of a lead, you know, you just know that you've got this thing cinched. And, uh, hey, this, this duo that he's hunting a two-year-old female, obviously, like he touched about, they don't come any better than Eldon Corrick. Uh, they don't come any better than Zach McBee. This is a team that you're going to hear from for a lot of they years. They're already stays. planning on next year. Exactly. They are already saying as they're riding down the road or headed to the motel right now that we'll get them next year. Yeah. And that's Always the mindset. Always looking ahead. That's the oh, mindset. That's the mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And you Where's know, the next one? I've got to say something here about Mike and Maddox as well because we got to interview the Arnett's uh, yesterday when they came through. And you nailed it when you said that Mike's feet were just like barely on the ground. Right. It, while we were interviewing uh, Maddox, he was sitting there in the chair, and Steve, you were asking him all the questions and stuff, and I was kind of, you know, back in the shadows, letting the expert do the expert thing. And, and But I was getting to watch Mike and even talk with him a little bit, and basically he just let Maddox, you know, rightfully take his place there in the spotlight, and it was obvious that... Uh, as a dad with three daughters, which, by the way, my girls, uh, to my amazement, I think are all sitting in their respective houses right now uh, watching the three of us tonight. And I appreciate that, girls. You know, as a daddy, so proud of my children. You could see that in Mike. But I also, a kid doesn't get to have that kind of personality and that kind of confidence without getting it right. somewhere. Well, you know, getting it at home. And the, one of my big takeaways coming here in the coonhound world as a guy from the retriever world is how family oriented all of this is and how you look at all these young guys. Most of the young guys here, if you ask them about it, there is an older guy that whether it was a father or a father figure, that was that mentor, and it's just really, really cool to see that and to see these young guys thriving. And you two, I mean, we got 
you know, 19 year old, a 20 something, a 32 year old here uh, that made to the semifinals. And now two of those are in the finals. I can't remember the ages. I apologize to you other guys if I left somebody out. It's got to be good for you guys to see the sport continuing to move on. You know, the biggest thing I took away from Mike, and, and you're 100% right, you know, when they come up and I interviewed him, his dad stepped back. Mm-hmm. That's leadership. You know what I mean? He, uh-huh. he, he, he's, and he, trust. He, he, and trust. He, he, he's mm-hmm. not micromanaging him. He's letting him, you know, and, you know, when you, there, there's a lot of people, uh, when you put them in a, in a position uh, to, to get out from underneath the shadows, will shine. And, and it's kudos to, to Mike. I mean, he, you can see he's a leader. He's a father. He's a leader. And he, he's, he's putting him, he's putting Maddox in a situation to, to learn. I mean, hey, you know, he talked about his Friday night cast at the Zones. Mm-hmm. I didn't hear him say, he just said, hey, we got beat. The judge's dog won the cast. His dog looked really good. He deserved to win. really good. Dog looked yeah. really good. He deserved to win. And he goes, we knew Saturday night we had to, it was, you know, win or go home. And, you know, that, you know, and then when they come here and we set him down and interviewed him, and, uh, you know, Mike, Mike didn't say two words. He just sat back and he introduced himself, and he let Matt, you know, and you know what? How many 13-year-olds or, or 15-year-olds, Logan's 19 years old, going to college, full-time job, uh, you know, and all he talks about, you know. So if you want it bad enough in this sport, uh, these guys are living proof that you can do it and you can be very successful with it. Sure. And now with the amount of uh, purses that we have the opportunity to hunt for, uh, it's incredible. It really is. Yeah. Quarter million dollars. I mean, that is one heck of a purse. And guys... Keep on sticking with us. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit more and break down these teams, but I have been informed that they are on the way to the field. Now, let me remind you a little bit about our format here for the finals. Obviously, in the semifinals, uh, we were just bringing the scores, and even then we were only bringing them at 30-minute intervals. Our goal for tonight, and this is, by the way, based on the feedback from all you guys that have been watching the live stream as we've been doing them over the last several uh, major events. Please know that uh, all the guys at UKC, Nicole, Alan, Matt, the gang there, Annie, they've been listening to what you guys have been saying. So our goal is here in a few minutes when we do cut loose with this final hunt of the night, the cast of three, that we're going to try to bring you a play-by-play as much as humanly possible from the field. Of course, a lot of that will be dictated by, you know, uh, what we're available to do Technically, hopefully we're going to have really, really good signal. I'm told that the conditions are absolutely all, all optimal for tonight. So bear with us. We're just waiting for these guys to make it to the field. And when they do, we're going to try to bring you a play-by-play all along the way. But at the very least, uh, we're going to have our director of hunting ops, Alan Gingrich, who's going to be updating us on very, very regular intervals here. So really exciting times. Started out with over 1,300 dogs qualifying for, to get the chance for the Tournament of Champions. Uh, wound up bringing the top 96 here. Uh, pared that down to 24, down again to six. And now we're fixing to come at you with the final cast of three dogs out there. And also uh, doing everything that we could possibly do to make this where it's very, very fair. I was also informed earlier by our director of hunting operations, Allen, that hunting ops, Allen, that, that we're going to have one judge, but we're going to have two or three assistant I believe it's three assistant judges, isn't it, that we're going to have in the field? I think it's two. I would think we've got two. I haven't talked to Allen about it, but I would say we, we've got one lead judge and two and assistants. And there'll be a guide that we with them as And well. the guide, that's yeah, right. Yeah, got the guide. Yeah, so one mm. one judge, but two assistants, so three guys in yep. the judging role out there, as well as the <clears> guide <throat> to really stay on top of the action. These guys have done a wonderful job trying to make the playing field as level as possible. I know earlier um, you alluded to the fact that you could advance with the zero, and then you, you mentioned the, that all came about because you mentioned that last year in the semifinals we only had 15 teams advance and the reason we only had 15 teams in the semifinals last year is because we did have 16 casts but to win a cast last year you had to get positive points oh. so we had a team that zeroed last year and didn't make it uh on to get to compete in the in the 16 team semifinals 
took a good look at that, the folks at UKC did, and decided, you know what, in something of this magnitude, we cannot let potentially a bad set of conditions where there just wasn't any game where that dog could have a positive score. Right. The dog didn't make any missteps. It wasn't in the negatives. It was just, you know, a zero. Give the dog the benefit of the doubt, and so that rule. Send them on. Yeah, send them on to the next round. And that's him. the way it ought to be. And actually, the guy that was handling that dog last year uh, made the top 24 this year. That guy got so, a chance at yeah, redemption uh, again. Jeff uh, Stallard was here last year. Oh, okay. Uh, handling, handling a dog and uh, didn't have plus points, so didn't advance or whatever. And obviously, he got in the top 24 with uh, uh, PBR last night. And so. he hunts in plenty of registries where he can advance exactly. with that score. And, and, yep. and, and to get to here and have that type of score and not advance, I, I would say that uh, – it was a little bit tough on him. Well, oh, yeah. I'm sure yeah, it was absolutely. tough on him, but the bottom line is they got it right. They've got it right. They've got I mean, it right. They, and they, they got it right. They got it right. I, I tell you, this, uh, the way this scoring for, format is here now, it's an incredible score, uh, scoring format. Hunters love it. We love it. You know, uh, we are competitors in this. You know, we this is you know this is something that uh, what we do tonight is something that's uh, uh, new for us or whatever. But uh, we're still we still have a few hunts left in our tank, or we hope we do. And uh, we love the scoring format. It 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 it, it benefits the dog. It benefits the uh, a dog, especially an offensive dog. Uh, offen you know, a dog on offense. I guess when you get into what happened tonight, sure. you know. Uh, when you get into that type of it, the the set of rules that we have are it's incredible and and uh, it's set up to where if it, it's not them conditions you can still have somebody that advances. Yep, yep no doubt about it. And we do have some very aggressive dogs here tonight. Yeah, uh, so they're about to cast them out. Now we all made our pick for the semifinals. Uh, one of us went three for three. By the way, I'm not gonna. Gloat on that or anything. Congratulations. But it did happen. I'll, I will congratulate you. Steve, <laughs> Steve was sent over there, and he won't congratulate you, but I will. <laughs> well, thank you, Rick. I really and truly appreciate you, uh, that. You're tough on me, Rick. You're tough on <laughs> I'm me. I'm not enjoying congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee it's not. not. So, it, is a pretty, it, it is pretty impressive. You know, we're going to catch a lot of flack over it, Rick, so we're going to have to step up our game, but I think we can get him in this late round. Yeah, well, like Rick said, a blind sow finds an acre every once in a while, and I think this blind sow certainly found one to be right over <laughs> you two guys tonight. But here we are. We're coming down to the final three. Uh, who wants to lay out? I, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Man, it's uh, – I don't even know where to begin. I mean, you you, you watched uh, Piper put on a stellar performance there the last, uh, I think, Duel said 38 minutes. Uh, Dominator's been dominating for the last six months. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you got Connor McGregor, who has probably – this probably makes – if I remember correctly in the interview, this probably makes eight or nine casts in a row that he has won. And um, so how do you pick a winner? All three of them are winners. How do you pick a winner? Um, but uh, it would do me proud to see Joe win another event, I think. Uh, um, I, 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 not that I'm rooting against the younger guys. I always root for the for the older guys, just because I'm there. That's where I'm at. And uh, I, I, I think the edge the edge might be with Dominator tonight. So is that your pick? That's, he sure did go a roundabout way to get there, didn't he, Steve? Well, you wouldn't let me finish here. Yes, that's my pick. <laughs> yes, that's my pick. All right, so we got Rick going with Joe and Dominator to win tonight. How about you, Steve? Well, I, you know, as much as it pains me, I know the viewers probably want something different, but uh, I said yesterday, uh, I said last night on set that I felt like Dominator was going to dominate this hunt. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that you know, Conor McGregor, uh, he's obviously you can't like Rick said you can't deny him. The dogs won silver cast in a row. I always look at it this way: them late round casts, having hunted in many of them. Uh, there's something about, you know, there, there's something about a dog, uh, you know, my, my, my pick would be between Dominator uh, and Piper. There's no doubt that, that McGregor can do it. I just think that Dominator is going to end up 
coming out to winner tonight. I think he's going to dominate this hunt. I, that, that's going to be my pick. That was my pick. My pick was between him and Bonnie all weekend. Right. And uh, I just, I'm not going to deviate from that. I just, uh, I really believe that Dominator is going to come out as the winner of this event. I, I, I thought that, I felt that all, all weekend. Now he's in the final three. And, uh, you know, I picked McGregor to get this far too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, um, so I think Dominator is going to win this. I think he's going to win this hunt. Wow. You agree I, twice in one night? I see. No, he, Rick, he see, Rick followed wouldn't, my lean twice. <laughs> see, twice. see, Rick wouldn't. See, Rick yesterday just couldn't stand the fact of agreeing with me. He's figured out, though, <laughs> uh, when you go to pick winners. You know, <laughs> but you know, we all, hey, we all picked Dominator in that last round, and you guys are both going with him again. Um, I love the dog. Absolutely love the dog. I also, being an old guy myself, I, you know, I got to root just a little bit. Uh, for Joe there as well, being the old man of the field. Uh, but I'm going to differ with you guys this time. I'm not hanging in there. I was really kind of hoping that you were going to pick Piper because I'm taking Connor, and then we could have all three been different. <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't expect that to happen. I didn't see it coming. Actually, if you'd have picked Connor, I'd have probably picked Piper just so we could all be different. But <laughs> right. no, I really think that Connor has the hot hand. As you said, he's won – eight, nine, maybe ten now cast in a row. Yeah. The dog is tearing it up. Uh, young dog should still have plenty of gas left in the tank. Also love the fact that he's got a young handler there. And, you know, I, the other guys, you know, some people, I'm sure, take, look at that youth and see him kind of as an underdog. And sometimes I like going with the underdog. I'm not saying Connor necessarily is here, but I like that. And I'm going to go with Connor. So we'll... Uh, you guys care to put a wager on this? Coca-Cola or something? He won't pay. <laughs> he won't pay. It, I'm going to say I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to save Rick his pennies. I'm going to uh, save Rick his pennies. He, he's he, hey, you know what? The good thing is is he can still come out a winner this weekend and still be a loser. You know what I'm saying Explain overall? That. Okay? He can still he can win this late round and still, still be a loser overall. Is he still talking round? about yesterday? First round pick? <laughs> Was that last week? <laughs> so yesterday's wins, what were those? Oh, they were yesterday. Yeah, that's yesterday right. Kind of like the old say, yesterday's home runs don't win, the, don't win don't today's, win today's games. games. That's yeah, right, absolutely. buddy. Yesterday's home runs absolutely. aren't doing you any good. <laughs> yep. So now that we've got our, our, our picks in there, let's break it down from y'all's experience. You know, dog by dog, let's start with Piper. What do you think, start with you first, Rick. What are Piper's strengths coming in here? Well, we saw it, speed. She has a lot of speed and a lot of determination. Mm -hmm. um, she, she does a great job for duel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then uh, she, you know, Adam Trusty hunted her at the zones, at the regionals there at uh, uh, Mount Gilead. But uh, I, I would say if you line them up and, and uh, and, and turned them loose and, and drew a finish line down there 100 yards away, I think Piper's going to cross it first. Um, I think uh, they, they have to be a good team. They, they just, those two, and like I said earlier in the evening, she's kind of been a shadow dog. Mm -hmm. She's had a shadow behind Melvin for the last year, and, uh, and, and they took her when, when things weren't just quite right for Melvin or maybe took her as a backup. And she's no backup. She would be the leading horse in anybody's stable other than duels. And uh, so if she wins this thing, it, it won't be a surprise to none of us, for sure. You know, if, if, they, get in a, if they get in a woods with several coons, I, I may uh, change my pick about halfway through. I <laughs> know you can't do that. You're but, locked um, in now. Actually, you, you can give final answer when he calls that they're out, but that's it. Yeah, you're not I have that. no idea where they're going, but uh, but but it's a cinch that they're going to be in Coons, you know. And uh, I, I I told you earlier in the evening I really like Piper. I really like the way she operated the nights I've hunted with her. Um, I just uh, something just tells me that uh, Joe Manning is not done rolling yet. Amen. And, and uh, dogs looking really really good. So I'm gonna cut you off right there because. Uh, we just, I was just informed that we're about to take it to the field. Uh, they're in the field now. Uh, I don't know if they've been cut loose or they're about to, but let's go and take a look. Repeat it. I didn't hear you make sure I repeat it. Another thing, we, we know what's happened. Unless you hear me say, Looks cut like your dog, right please do got, not cut uh, your dog. Is that one of our judges you hear me there? say those words, not any other okay or anything like that. 
Uh, other than that, we'll just, you guys have all been to a couple coon hunts, you know how this goes. So we'll just call them for what they do and may the best I'll win. Um, yeah. I'm jealous. I wish I wasn't judging. I was in here, so. Good luck, Congrats good to all you guys. Good luck, guys. So we got a good look at them. In the field. It looks to I, me like really uh, good luck. one good of good your luck, our handlers were getting their final yeah. directions there. They haven't cut loose yet. I don't know which one. hasn't started oh, running. Yet. Yeah. Um, in this, you see there are a lot of people out there in the field, but actually when they're turned loose, it was one of, I don't know who's level is, all across the way. Because I've got uh, everything deleted, but you three, and when I try to add his, it's picking up one along. So once they turn loose, we're only going to have the judge, the judge's it's assistant, with pipes, the guide, so and the handlers actually go out, along with our um, following gonna, crew, gonna uh, go our support kind of crew, to, to bring us play-by-play right play updates as uh, much as they possibly can. Well, that is a great live feed right, right there for them. Right there. There's Piper right there. Look at her. She's, she's, yep. feeling, fine. <laughs> she's feeling fine. She's feeling fine. I tell you, uh, Dominator, he's a good looking dog, too. Yeah, he is. He's just right there behind him. Yeah. He, he's a really great looking dog. You've got a little bit of audio uh, coming in right now, but we're going to keep on. Uh, Bringing you the action as much as we can from here in the studio as well, guys. So let's just try to uh, be as quiet as we can, kind of stay stay out of their way. And, these and, guys uh, all look really, got, really better. You see Trevor over there on the right hand side. Other than that, I'm ready. Another one of our UKC guys, Alan's right hand man. That's 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 a wonderful job. What I've seen this weekend, I'm not too sure that Alan's not his right hand man from time to time. For sure. <laughs> I guarantee you. Trevor has, has uh, busted his behind this weekend and done a fabulous job. Of Boy, what done. a great addition he's been. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, well. yeah, they, uh, uh, you know, just an incredible job that he's doing. Yeah, yeah they, they got job. the right guy. This they time. got the right guy, that's for sure. Cool. Uh, just the way he uh, handled things this weekend and then a lot of other things. Boy, I tell you, that brings, that sends oh. chills down my spine. Just <clears throat> watching them. Walk out through there. I can tell you, as a hunter, the juices are flowing right now. Yeah, these guys, they're definitely ready. All right, guys, we're getting ready to turn loose. Uh, got some pretty good audio, it seems like, coming in from the field. So we're going to shut up right now and uh, watch the action as they get ready to cut these dogs loose. And we'll, we'll uh, keep you play by play, hopefully, all the way through this next two hours. So three dogs right now in the finals. Final cast, three dog cast. Hunt time because we do have uh, three dogs that's been extended from the 90 minutes of the head to head competition in the semifinals to a full two hours here. It looks like there are seven guys getting ready to let them go. See Duel there. I'm sure, they're very, very anxious. I'm not sure if that's the normal procedure there for. Uh for Dominator, but he sure looks like he's focused on something there off to the right. And, uh, and now Piper, Piper's pitching on that. Um, I'll, let's watch and see which way they take off. Is it coming from the first one? Well, it just depends. They didn't, they didn't go to the right, so. You just don't know sometimes it's excitement, you know? I, I thought sure that they smelled something in the breeze there just uh, off the right end. Yeah, I kind of got that feeling too. They all three took off together. Kind of expected a split there at the beginning, but uh, right now they're letting that minute. You know, that minute right now is ticking by because you know you have that minute grace period. Yeah, and who's going to get struck underneath a minute? You know, and, and you know. Because, so what happens if you strike within the first minute? Go ahead, Rick. I was focused on this. What do you? What do you? <laughs> No, what uh, what happens in the first minute? Um, if they strike a track in the first minute and carry that track out of there, there's no problems. Um, the the minute rule is for dogs similar to what Joe's dog just did there. That what 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 we saw there is for dogs that leave happy barking, and we give them a minute and we give them that distance within that minute to get all them happy barks out of their system and then focus on finding the coon. And when they find the raccoon uh, track, then they they'll open and uh, uh, that's when they should be struck at that point if they strike under the minute um, you get the note over here I'm not able to see it but that one's flagging me down here on something um, if they strike under the minute and they don't have a track evident uh, that's when they're going to get penalized well, we saw the judge there looking at his watch yeah, 
it's a it's a so they have a so they have a grace period. They have a they have a one minute grace period. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that grace period. Just gives them Looks like they got struck. I, I heard I heard Dom. I struck Connor for a hundred. And I, then he said Dom. I, I heard I heard Dom first, but looks like they have a, you don't think so? I had Dom looks first. like they have a potential uh, and he still never struck uh, disagreement struck on I had, I had I JR for seventy five and dual for fifty. We got it on camera, I mean we can go back and I think they, I think they had a, I think it was at, a, a possibly a, been a discussion on what dog was what, and that can happen first term. Yeah, you know, these guys uh, obviously they're not allowed. Dog seventy five. Wearing trackers. Hey, uh, Jr. I question that. Can we roll back the cameras and see? Is that gonna be all right? Have, okay, so they have a question. Can't use the cameras. No, I don't know in this uh, uh, scenario. I, I know that we have the. Uh, I know we have the. Uh, he said he struck Connor. You didn't take his call then. Here, and then I, and I would assume when the final said, cast yeah, of the panel, it still would go to him on a question type. It was uh, in that scenario. And what? And what? For you guys that are watching, normally there is a master of hounds in an event like this. Yeah, but this event, because there is so much involved, and there's so much at stake, there's not one master of hounds, but it's actually a panel of three that forms uh, that, that is the master of hounds. So we've got three guys on a panel that's the master of hounds versus a single individual. Yep, 115 guys. Yeah, Hear some barking in the background, guys. Yeah. yeah. But it has to be resolved right here. We can't wait for later to resolve it. Yeah, all three of these dogs to be wearing traction collars. We can't wait yeah. two hours and then do the numbers. We don't have it. Yeah. All right, guys, well, looks like there's a little bit of discussion there in the field. A little bit hard for us to hear here in the studio, but obviously we've had dogs give voice. Right, right. And, yeah, uh, we can hear that there towards the end. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely at least one dog is struck, so hopefully we'll be getting some news about where that stands. I'm sure there's got to be some points pending at the moment, but um, looked like there was a little confusion going on there too. What do you think that was about? Well, I mean, it could be, I don't know if the minute was up when they struck, um, uh, possibly uh, also just by watching a little bit of the footage. I mean, you guys seen the same footage that we did, uh, possibly one dog open and, and hey, in, in some scenarios, uh, two dogs may sound somewhat alike and, and, and two dogs could have got struck on one bark. And, uh, and a handler maybe questions on if the wrong dog was struck at the wrong position. And uh, so, you know, that's obviously something that the judges, are call that's a judgment call, you know, uh, especially the first drop, uh, the first minute or two of that hunt until you hear all three dogs open and know what the three dogs sounds alike. It can be a little, you know, it can be a little tough to sometimes make that call. That's a little bit of an observation I maybe took up of, I, you know, I couldn't really hear the audio and what was really being questioned. I don't know, Rick, maybe you could. Uh, I, I, I didn't decipher it, but I assume that we've got one dog barked and maybe two guys claimed it. That that would be my assumption at this point. Yeah. Um, One other possibility and, and is that we had two dogs bark almost simultaneously, and there's a little bit of discussion about who actually who actually had the struck first. first right. You yeah. Know. I mean, right. that's 25 exactly. points as we saw earlier tonight in in the semifinals. 25 points can be huge. Uh, Absolutely at this level. can. And you know, at this level at this stage, this may be the only 
first, second, and third set of strike points that they have all night. Because now you have three dogs there instead of two. So the possibility of getting struck back in for a quarter and staying struck back in for a quarter is a lot more higher in this scenario versus a heads-up cast where you can get struck back in for 100 or get struck back in for 75. So sometimes that first set of strike points is huge. I, yeah. I'm just amazed at the, at the video feed here. I am too. It's it is incredible. so clear. Uh, I'll tell you what, you guys... Feed. Our viewers have asked for it. We've really, really worked hard. Big congratulations to our technical team because this has been the goal all along to bring you the live action. Now, these guys are moving. They're either closing the ground on the track or real good possibility here that we've got a dog treat. They're going to check out the action and see. Uh, hopefully, we'll get an update here. Of course, we've got Alan Gingrich, uh, UKC Director of Field Operations. Uh, in the studio and we're going to take it to Alan. Alan, what can you tell us about what's going on? Can you give us a little bit of clarity, please? Yeah, I think I can help you out a little bit. I got the first report in from Trevor. Uh, first of all, uh, their start time was at 1248. Uh, it is warm out there tonight. It's uh, 72 degrees and it's hard to believe just a week ago we were had a, a snowstorm and tonight we're hunting in the TOC in 72 degrees. So there's a slight wind about 15 miles an hour there, but they've had some really quick action here. Uh, and they, uh, they had, I believe, uh, one of the guys uh, thought he should have had struck ahead of the others was what part of that discussion was. Nevertheless, uh, Dominator struck for 100 here. Uh, Connor McGregor took 75 and Piper was struck in third for 50. Uh, they made a quick tree. Uh, Connor McGregor was struck in or treed in for 125 and Dominator is 75 behind him. And that's what you see them headed towards them right now. The dogs were 308 yards in front of them uh, treed that quick. That's where we are right now. All right, looks like we're getting to the tree here too. And you know, this is no surprise, I'm sure, to anybody that's been following the TOC. These dogs got on track quick and got on tree very, very fast. It appears to me like uh, they may have possibly, oh, they're tying them back now, yeah. So there's a, a live feed of Connor there. So Steve, we see that dog wearing two tracking collars. We're, we're seeing that more and more. Um, and why are we, why are we doing that? Well, you know, I can't, I know the, I, I see the one, I, I, I see the one, but I believe there's the other two one. Antennas. You look, right, there's, there's, the there's antenna. two antennas. I, I know for a lot of guys, uh, with some of them, it's GPS signals. And, and some of our older tracking systems uh, was the... Well, they, they scored it when they were walking away from the tree. Yeah, so, uh, well, let's, let's see what's going on. You guys want to cut? I, I would say. Not in the final cast. I want this kind. Of, I want to be able to see this. Yeah, you know, you've got to think that probably that goes to all four of them. Everybody's moving on the left. 
But you know what? From what we heard from the guys last night, they was freeing the teams in the hills. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they yeah. was freeing them in the hills. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, hey, you know what? Sometimes if that's where they're at, that's where... Hey, I want to go where there's teams. If i got to walk a few hills, I will. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. So I would assume... Uh, we haven't got a score update, but I would assume with them moving along like that, one would think that they're probably walking the pipe. Yeah. You know? One would think that they're probably walking the pipe. Yeah. So, yeah. so the report that we're getting is 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 uh, she's probably treating for 125, and, and that's why they after they turn the dogs loose and they're doing a steady walk that they're probably walking to the third dog that wasn't there. So, yeah. She's hey, if that's the case, and they're going. We, we know we've probably got at least one dog on the board for 125 pots, and we got one for the pot. Yeah, we hear it right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And leading her off the tree. And I'm telling you, absolutely didn't spend no time. I can tell you, this is, this is, hey, we're, hey, we are, uh, 12 minutes into the hunt, have already walked to two trees and scored. This, if this, end, if this thing comes into what they've been doing all weekend, uh, it could get really, really. Uh, Piper could really. We know she's capable. Now I know she got scored second, and you know these other dogs are out competing uh, while she's, you know, again going to get turned back loose. But she can come back in a hurry. So if he gets her loose in time, um, and, they're, and they're not struck, their strike then the, then the hundred up. strike points are available to all the dogs. Yeah. And right now, I can guarantee you, <laughs> Jr. is saying something gets struck to, to, to stay at a quarter, and the rest of them are probably be sitting there going, "Let's open up strike points back up." Oh. And, and, yeah, I, yeah, I would say, yeah. Need a call over here. That's behind us. That's not me. Gone for a hundred. We're still here. Talk. I can tell you, judging these things isn't easy. We walk on up you this way. It isn't easy either. We hold them up once and time with him. Well, I believe it was Dom that struck. I think that's what I heard. Isn't that what you heard, Rick? I think it was. Hey, it's working on Dom. On it. no, yeah. I didn't hear him, bud. action really really quick uh <laughs> points up on the board for everybody it looks like right now and it looks like uh apparently dominators probably struck again piper back out on her own i wouldn't be surprised if we have another strike coming in pretty quick shortly too uh, rick are you shocked by i'm not shocked uh i'm not shocked at anything right now i mean uh, they they went to a They've, they've tried to pick a great spot for the final cast tonight, no doubt. And uh, two coons in just a few minutes here, and we're back at it again. Uh, you know, we're going to have some success on this where they're hunting at here. For sure. These guys, they all are very, very anxious, you know, and you could tell 
watching that, what was evident to me was how intense it's got to be out there right now. I mean, they were all smiles in the interviews, but you could see everybody was very, very focused there when they went into the field from the get-go. As soon as those dogs were loose, it was like the flip was the switch was flipped for everyone. The you know, it's kind of a whole cliche. Uh, you know, not that it's it's just the way it is. It, the, when you when that clock starts, the competition starts, and we can go to be friends after the hunt's over. It, in a nutshell, honestly, because you're 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 when you're a competitive person, and you're competing, you're you, that's just that's the mindset you get into. You're focused on that two hours with you and your dog. And, you know, uh, not saying that now, on, you know, obviously there's, you know, there's, there's, there's different scenarios that come up and stuff, but that, that's just the way these hunts are. And you can see uh, what happens. It's game time. You know, it's, it's like, uh, and, you know, a lot of these guys, especially the test ones, they just have that, they have that, what you call that killer instinct when it comes to finishing off these hunts and, the, you know, these finals. They have ice in their veins, you know, uh, just like they do in most sports. And I can guarantee you, all three of these guys have been on the big stage and they are poised and they know this is going to be a fight right. for two hours. And, and they're not going to, they, they, as, a, as a handler, you're not going to, you're going to fight for every point that you can get within the rules. And, and that's what your job is to do. Sure. It, it's the competitive side of it. So, you know, you're going to have a few, you know, obviously already tonight they had a little discussion on who, and who got it out of their mouth the quickest. I mean, both dogs could have opened up at the same time. And, and as you noticed in there walking up through there, uh, another thing is when them guys turned loose, you know, you had two guys on the right side of the judge and two guys on the left side of the judge. And me as a handler, I wanted to be at his left ear or his right ear. Why? Because I wanted to take and be able to him to hear me. You know what I mean? No, so, no doubt. Absolutely. Well, a lot of action has transpired already. We're less than 30 minutes into a two-hour hunt here, so we've got a lot of action to continue. We're going to bring you back live, but first we're going to take a short break here, about five to ten minutes. Uh, regrouping out there in the field, gonna take it to break and we'll be back in about five to 10 minutes to give you some more live action from the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions here in Greencastle, Indiana.
Welcome back to the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions here in Greencastle, Indiana. So we're well into the finals right now. Uh, we've cut our dogs loose coming into this final cast of three at 1248 start time. So that means we're about 30 minutes into it. We've seen a lot of action, got some really good footage coming in from the field. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to throw you back over to the live feed. Uh, also, during the live feed, we're going to let you guys watch and, and listen in, and we're going to try to keep our commentary uh, to a minimum. But we're also going to continue to bring you updates as well as we get them from the field through our director of field ops, Alan Gingrich, who's here in the studio with us. So, guys, first half hour down, what are your thoughts so far, Steve? Well, judging by how it started out in the first 11 minutes of this hunt, it looks like it's going to be another really, really exciting hunt. Uh, you know, um, being able to strike and tree like that that quick on, in, in, on two dogs, you know, on two separate trees is pretty incredible. Yeah, no doubt. You, Rick? So I got a little information on the hunting ground that they're going to be hunting tonight. And, and you know, pretty, pretty uh, early in the cast, we saw the guys going up a pretty good sized hill there. And uh, I've been told that when they reach the top of that hill, it's going to be a few rolling hills in between there, but then two and a half miles of, of flat open country, uh, lots of woods, lots of field, I guess. And uh, it, it's, it's a paradise where they're going, there's no doubt. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they've been planning on this for a year, and they've got it right, right where they need to be. Well, I've come to the conclusion that most of the area around Greencastle, Indiana is a coon hunter's paradise. You know, we've seen lots of game already, 14 different raccoons treed during the uh, semifinals with just six dogs in there in the three casts. So definitely a coon hunter's paradise out there. And we're very fortunate too that they're in an area where we're getting a really, really good uh, live feed as well. We're going to be taking you back out. I'm, to I'm calling shortly. it the best I've watched. I mean, that, that <laughs> it, is so good's clear. Good's an understatement. It is so clear. I, I don't think I've seen a coonhound uh, live feed as clear as this is at this point. Yeah. The, the, the good news is we've got really, really good signal coming in. The bad news is uh, this is the first time we've had that, and it's a little bit difficult for us here in the studio. So please bear with us as we kind of figure out the best way to bring you guys the most information. I know everybody that I've gotten feedback from is really, really hungry to get to watch the play-by-play -play action as it unfolds <coughs> live. And, you know, we don't like to commentate on things when we really don't know what's going on. And so we're going to sit back through most of this moving forward and let you guys just listen and then come back in with Alan whenever he's ready here in a few minutes to give us a uh, you know, some of the numbers on it as they come in from the field. But uh, we want to let you guys watch as much as you possibly can. Believe me, I, I know your desire is to watch it, and it's our goal to, to give that to you. But we also want to give you information as accurate a, as we possibly can there. So in just a couple minutes, we're going to get Alan back in here in the studio to, you know, give us the numbers. I do know this for sure. Right now, we've got a bunch of positive points already out there. As a matter of fact, I think Alan's about to give us a report that's going to be kind of shocking considering that we are less than a fourth of the way through this already, or just about a fourth of the way through. Alan, what you got for us, buddy? All right, yeah, things are happening fast and furious here, as you can see by the live feed there uh, right out of the gate. Uh, but anyways, the last report here that you guys had uh, uh, the panel had uh, uh, discussed was we had the the first tree we made uh, after that Piper was the the guys were walking to Piper there they found her coon right away too so all trees are plus both trees are plus uh, they turned had turned Dominator and McGregor back loose Dominator struck first followed by McGregor uh, McGregor uh, treed in a matter of two minutes he's treed again another 300 yards up the woods and they have already been to him, and they have scored him plus as well, and he has struck back in for 50. Meanwhile, Piper is at large. So she is not, at this point, is not struck in yet. So right now, McGregor's leading the cast with 400 plus, and Dominator and Piper sitting at 175, and that's where we're at right now. Almost 30 minutes used. Wow, and, and looking at the scoreboard also, uh, one of the things that Alan didn't say just then is it looks like Connor has also got some pending points up there as well. So uh, Connor sitting there with a 
225 point lead and there's potential that we're going to see that grow any minute now. Absolutely. And just to clarify, the way Dominator got struck back in for 100 for the viewers is uh, when they pulled Piper off the tree and released her, uh, Dominator and Connor, although they was at large, had not been struck back in. They released him. That opened the strike points back up. And then obviously Connor got struck for 75, got scored on that coon and got turned back loose and got restruck back in before they heard from Piper is the reason that he struck for 50 plus. So right now, if Piper would happen to open, she would obviously go in for a 25 strike. Right. So. Right. And we kind of knew that. We felt like that was coming. We saw Piper released and hadn't heard any vocalization. You know, we thought the 100 points were back up there for grabs. And sure enough, that was, that was accurate. Rick, what are your thoughts now looking at that scoreboard? Um, it's phenomenal. You know, we, we've, got, uh, we've got four coons scored here in, in, in no amount of time, really. And uh, it, it's going to get better. It, it, it'll get better. We'll, we're going we're gonna to wind up scoring on several coons in this cast if, if things keep going the way they are. Um, the wind's picked up out there. It's a warm evening, and uh, the, coons are enjoying, uh, the coons are enjoying the weather, apparently, because they're out there to be, to be chased, and, and uh, we're getting it done. So on a warmer night like tonight, how, you know, and, and again, everything is relative. I'm from the deep south. 70 seems like a really, really cool evening to me, but apparently that's not the case, you know, if you're in this area. How does that affect the conditions, 70 degree temperatures with the breeze, Steve? Well, you know, there's several factors that go in there. You know, dogs that are in shape, um, not going to affect them as bad. Some dogs hunt when, uh, hunt a little bit better when it's warmer out. Other dogs can't handle the heat as well. I know for me at my age, uh, you know, when it gets warm out, it's obviously tougher for me to get around. And uh, so, you know, I enjoyed the cool evenings. So it, it definitely can make a difference. But, you know, uh, I, I guarantee you, you definitely sacrifice that for having the game moving the way it is. Sure. You know. So I've got a question for, for the experts here, you guys. Looking at the scoreboard, we've got three dogs with 125 positive points for treeing, and then we've got one dog, uh, Dominator, with 75 to the plus. How does that occur? I don't see a dog up there with 100. Um, well, well, he would have treated in for 75. He would have treated in for second tree. So uh, uh, Connor was uh, treated for 125. So first and tree's 125, one, first tree's second 125 tree is, is 75. Not, so not 100. Is not 100. And bad. so what ended up happening, and, and it, by the judging by the live feed, you know, it was, a, it was a close call. It was bang, bang. You know, it was, uh, you, know, them, you know, them dogs were struck and treed in a hurry. So, yeah, it, uh, Connor would have got struck or treed for 125, and, and Dom would have got treed for 75 in that case scenario. Good deal. Well, I think that we may be just about ready to take it back to the field and see some of the great action uh, beautiful beautiful technically they're doing fantastic so as soon as you're uh, ready we're going to take it back to the field and let you guys continue to watch the action there
tighten up a little bit on mine. Yeah, on everybody just walk around and smile on here. Everybody's good, we can ease that well. Right. I don't think yours is too close to the deal.
Yeah, perfect. We're we'll just right around.
Those hills are kind of fun though. Yeah. I mean, that would work too bad. No. Nah. 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 That's that break there. 
Welcome back to the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. So guys, uh, we're about halfway through the hunt. I believe that we got kicked off at 1248 local time. Is that right, Steve? You got her yep, yep. down there. So now we're just beyond the halfway point. We've had a lot of action here tonight. Uh, got a great signal coming from the live feed. But while we've got the chance right now, an hour into this, let's take it over to Alan Gingrich, our Director of Hunting Operations for the United Kennel Club. Alan, bring us up to date on what's going on. All right, so a little bit has happened, not a whole lot in terms of scoring, a little bit, I guess, but they had a long walk to Dom. Dom had been treed uh, the last, uh, the last report. So they had to walk 840 yards to him. He was south of the cast and the wind has picked up quite a bit. So uh, it's making it tough to, uh, for them to hear Piper on their way to, uh, uh, to Dominator. Uh, but eventually they did get there and they handled him on a broken snag about 20 feet tall. Uh, he was treed on the edge of a river and uh, uh, Trevor reported that uh, there's obvious nothing was outside of this snag and that they were going to have to be looking, hopefully find something inside it possibly. Uh, but unfortunately it did not take long and it was a minus snag there, nothing in it. Uh, matter of fact, they did see a coon sitting uh, the next tree over out on a limb just uh, smiling at him, I guess. So, uh, wow. uh, but yeah, the wind there and everything probably winded that thing. But uh, anyways, they, they handled the dog and they, the cast walked back to where they last heard Connor. And at that point, they had an hour done in the hunt and one hour to go. So uh, they walked a little while and they did finally uh, hear Connor. And, but at that point, Piper uh, was way out of hearing uh, and they had their wind to their backs walking in her direction. So this is complicating things uh, on behalf of Piper anyways. Matter of fact, they even lost communication with Piper. So she might, she's out there stretched out quite a ways. But anyway, the cast have been trying to split the difference between the two. And I think the last thing uh, we saw the cast standing there. So they must've got to the point where they were gonna stop and try to listen and uh, splitting the difference. So that's where we are just under an hour. And I'd say probably approximately uh, 45 to 50 minutes remaining in this hunt. And at this point, the score is Dominator now with, uh, actually, Mc Connor McGregor sits at 400 plus, leading the cast. Piper is at 175 plus, and then Dominator, after that last snag, he uh, dropped down to 50 minus. So, reaction guys, start with you, Rick. What do, well, what do you think? It's unfortunate for us that the wind's blowing like it is out there at this point, you know, and, and uh, it looks like we're, we're we're in an area there where we're in the woods, we're out in the fields, we're back in the woods, we're back out in the fields, and uh, the, the wind's just uh, not cooperating with us at all. And it, I'd, I'd rather about hunting anything than I would the wind, and especially when the dogs are in the wrong direction. So uh, that, that's what they got to deal with out there, and, and I'm sure that they're trying to get to a point where they're able to judge, able to hear all the dogs, uh, but it, it's gonna be dang tough. You can hear the wind in the mic, Sure. Uh, from the field out there, and uh, it, it's going to be a tough, tough final hour here probably in this wind. Yep. Steve, let's take a look at the scores there. I mean, we've got uh, Conor McGregor out on top right now in the lead with 400 to the plus. Uh, it's second place, Piper, 175 plus, and then Dominator with a negative 50 right now. Obviously, looking at what happened in the semifinals, there's no way you could even think about ruling Piper out. That dog is good. That dog is smoking fast when she gets on a roll. But what about Dom? 450 points. I mean, that's a pretty big gap, well, isn't it? It's a tall task. And, and again, in the early round, there was, there was, it was a two-dog heads up, and now it's three dogs. And that definitely is a, is a, it's a different game. And, you know... Um, when you get into a lot of these late rounds, what we're seeing is it, this can happen in a late round. You can you can score on two or three fairly quickly, and then things can get things can get to where they really slow down. And uh, we've seen it many times. Obviously, the wind has picked up, and you know, with the wind picking up, that can that can cause game to quit steering as much too. And uh, you know, I think that uh, I think this last hour is going to be it's going to be tough. I you know, I if I was sitting where Jr. is sitting right now with Connor. Uh, I'd be feeling pretty good, but hey, you can't count e any of them out. Uh, but I do believe that uh, I do think things have slowed down. Uh, being, you know, uh, hunting these hunts enough, 
a uh, lot of times when it slows down, it normally doesn't pick back up really quickly. So, hey, but anything can happen. You know, uh, Piper's sitting there at 175. She's still got a legitimate shot. And, you know, for Dominator, understand this, guys. From third place to second place is $10,000. You know, he's not that far away from second place. You can believe he's going to compete till that buzzer goes off. Oh, uh, no, no way. I no, see, Joe, see so, Joe. Absolutely. Yeah, we're not going to see a WD, I, I think, from anybody right here. Uh, feed's still looking really good. Let's take you guys back out to the field. And while we do, we're going to ask Alan Gingrich to give us some more information there. Alan, going to turn it over to you to feed in the field. Yeah, so while we were uh, had went away from the live feed there, uh, Connor uh, McGregor uh, was hitting up, uh, Trevor says, and uh, but uh, J.R. Gray was having none of it in terms of calling him treat at this point. Obviously, he's got a nice lead, and he's not going to. The uh, judge finally put the stationary on the dog and counted it all the way down to the last 20 seconds before he called him treed. At this point, he's merely uh, 200 yards from the cast, and he's treed next to the river. They get to the river, they had to cross the river there, uh, but that's uh, where, they're, uh, where they're at right now, and so uh, that's what's happening. Okay, guys, so we froze up for a second there, but you can see them, they're headed to Connor, Connor McGregor. Uh, JR took his sweet time. I mean, the judge was about to yeah. count him down. Sure. What, what was he thinking? What's the rationale behind uh, that room? Burn some clock off, you know, and, and, uh, and, and what Trevor's information was back to us. You know, Trevor's heard him make a couple trees here already this evening, and this tree here didn't quite sound as good as those others. And uh, that, that looks like fun right there. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so, so now they're headed to uh, Connor here. He's been called treed, kind of maybe forced to call treed. And uh, they're headed in there. Apparently he's still, still indicating treed or they wouldn't be going towards him. But um, yeah, that, uh, it, the conditions have just kind of, kind of fell out here on us here just a little bit. And, uh, so when we get to this tree, we're looking at the score here. Um, you know, if this thing's plus or minus, it's really going to make a big difference. Yeah. yeah and I'll tell you, that was a tough situation there too. We've got uh, we've got three guys in 32 inch hip boots and 36 inches of water. It looks like so. <laughs> and I can tell you, being there, uh, being there, walking with wet boots the last 40 minutes of the hunt can be miserable. And uh, you know. JR taking his time, definitely, absolutely uh, the right call. Yeah. Yeah. So we got Connor on the tree. Let's go over to Al and let him clarify a little bit what, what's going on here. Yeah, I mentioned that the dog was, uh, they thought the dog was treed on the edge of the river. When they get to the river, they figured out he was on the other side. So you saw the guys crossing the river there. And it looks like the, the camera guy has to zoom in. I'm, I think everybody crossed except for the camera guy by the looks of it there. So. That's so, what they're doing right there. Alan, are they, are they about to start shining the tree? Uh, what's going on there in the field? Yeah, I'd say they're handling the Connor right there and they're fixing the score in which you can Question see they're shining answer. the tree right now. Looks like they're doing a lot of searching there, guys. What do you think's going through JR's head right now? With a coon, he's he. If 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 they can score a coon here, Jr. is going to be in a in a lead that's that's going to be just almost tough, impossible. Tough, to, tough. Yeah, almost impossible if, to lose. If uh, Piper wasn't out there, I'd say that uh, you know with a coon seen here, that uh, Connor would have it about wrapped up. But uh, we've always got Piper in the background there, and uh, we've seen how quick she can get the job done when when it comes time. Yeah. Well, I'm surprised it's the amount of green. That I'm seeing there. Uh, you yeah. know, the last night I hunted at home there, uh, Wednesday night, it, we didn't have that kind of green over the last, and it's appeared here over the last couple of days. Yeah, we don't want to speculate. Uh, we can speculate on what JR's thinking, but we don't want to speculate on what's going on in the field. So we're just going to keep on watching the action here as these guys search and, uh, you know. But, and I can tell you in, in this situation, the longer they shine, uh, you know, obviously, 
could be hidden somewhere. Or... Yeah, I'm sure JR, that I will speculate about this, I'm pretty sure JR is praying that they either see a hole or you know something to indicate it could be a den tree or something like that or find the coon itself. The last thing he wants right now, I'm sure, is to take a negative 175. I wonder if that's Connor. We hear barking. Take it back over to Alan, guys, and see if we can get a little more insight. Yeah, I've got another little update here from the field here. They, uh, we saw three guys crossing the river. That happened to be the judge, Jeremy Kidd, by the way, is judging this final cast. We've got uh, Jeremy Cox, is, uh, is one of his assistants there. And then it was Jay, those two and J.R. Gray, the handlers, were the only three that crossed this river. And uh, everybody else is staying on the near side of the river and including Joe Manning, they asked him if he's coming over and he said no, he can witness everything from right where he's at. <laughs> <laughs> now the other thing that they're telling me is uh, they've not found a coon yet. They have spotted several along the river on up here, but they need to find one here. So I haven't, haven't, haven't done that yet. So that's where we're at. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that uh, insight. Now the clock's running, guys, right? Yeah. yeah. Eight minutes. But, but but again, that's how quickly things can change here. And you your know, hunt time winding down. Yeah. But you know, if if, if Connor would happen to have a bad tree here, now it's now anybody and then it puts it puts anybody back in the ball game. But what it doesn't do is take Connor out because remember, he had fifty pending on the board, hundred and twenty five pending on the tree. That's hundred and seventy five. He's sitting on a 225-point lead now, so he'd still, he'd he can, still be, he'd still he'd, be in the he'd, lead. He'd still be in the lead. I know yeah. oh, absolutely. he doesn't want to give it up, I'm sure, but the good yeah. news is for J.R. and Conor McGregor, if he does have to give up the 175, he doesn't so relinquish still the lead still, right now. He's still right. leading the cast. Right. But it definitely opens the door for the rest of them. Yeah, even opens the door, you know, for, for Dominator. For Dom Dominator. to get back in here with negative 50, you know, 225 points separates uh, Dominator and, and Piper. So we're not showing Dominator struck back in and on the scorecard at least. Not on the scorecard at right. least. Right. Um, um, so where will we be now on strike points? We've got a, you know, we've obviously got 175. We got 75 pending for Piper, or 50 uh, for Connor. Uh, if Connor is, you know, does well, take a this, negative. This, and goes back and strikes again, is it going to be for 100 or for 25? It, it would, he would actually end up going back in for 50. But this may be the break that Piper needs because she struck for 75. So what they'll do at that point in time, go back where the last time they heard her at, and then they could continue to walk for eight minutes. Right. To, to, to you know, hopefully get back in here and of where she's at. So uh, this could be a big, this could be a break for uh, for Piper, you know, to get back into hearing of her, obviously. So... Uh, you know, when that wind comes up, it just, it makes it tough. It, it makes it really, really tough. I, you know, uh, like Rick said, I'm in the same opinion of him. It's, it's, it's tough on the judges, it's tough on handlers, and there is, in a lot of situations, it can determine the winner. Yeah. You know, help determine the winner on breaks. Sure, I mean, know. it's all about, you know, as I've many times said, I'd rather be lucky than good a lot of days. Right, you know, right There's right. a lot of luck to this as far as the weather and stuff goes. There's, and, there's breaks. 
you know, we're, we're only speculating here, but, you know, obviously if the eight would get Piper, now you take Dominator, and now he's back open for a 100 strike, and, and then that really puts him back in the game. Sure. So, sure, 100 of, strike and in first tree, you know, 225, boom, he's tied with Piper at 175 plus. Yeah. So you hear the comment earlier there um, from Allen, they've, they've shined several coons up and down that river going to Connor. So they're, they're back in the coon population there. You know, yeah. they've got coons everywhere all around them. Uh, the conditions have just kind of turned a little bit bad for them. And uh, they step away from, the, they score this tree, they step away from the river, maybe step up on the bank or something like that. Hopefully they can hear another dog, we can get, uh, Connor recast, and uh, you know maybe maybe score some coons around this river. That looks like where the action is going to be if if there's any more action. Sure, and, and you know the good news in that scenario for Connor is, is having seen multiple coons up and down the river, e even though he might take a negative here, he's in the proximity he's of He's right game. there with him. He them. finds another right. raccoon. He could be right back in the he, hunt. He's right there with him, and. Uh, yeah, if, if they step out there and they hear one of the other dogs, he's going to get released. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he don't have to go very far. It doesn't sound like to me that uh, he can be right on another coon. Yeah, it sounds like he's all over him right now as it is, which is a great scenario. That's what happens a lot whenever you, when, you, when you're hunting and you're, uh, you're in an area where the coons, you know, we had some coons right up front and we went through a spell there where we didn't have any coons there to where we're at now. Mm -hmm. A dog will drag you, a good dog will drag you into where the coons are. And, uh, you know, we walked 800 and some yards to the Dominator there and then we walked on in there farther to Connor. Um, now Connor's got us in here where there's some coons. Yep. yep. Yeah, I mean, when you think about that, you know, 800, 800 plus yards, you're talking about half a mile right there and then to go some distance again. These dogs are covering some ground. You know, they may have hit a lull where they were in an area where, you know, there wasn't game to find, there weren't raccoons to find, but obviously covering that much ground, given the amount of game that we have here in the area, it seems like it's only a matter of time before they get back on them. And, you know, looking at the time, we're about three quarters of the way through. Yeah, there's about 34 yeah. minutes left in the hunt. Yep. Um, uh, actually, yeah, about 30, yeah, about 33, 34 minutes. And you know, I got news for you. Uh, that's not a lot of time. You know, yeah. it's, you when know, the, the early, conditions are like this. When the conditions are like, yeah, 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 it's, it's not a lot of time left. You know, it's it, it's different. Again, it's it's a different case scenario when it's a three dog cast instead of a two dog cast. Two dog cast, 34 minutes is a lot of time. We've seen it in an early round. Piper scored on three in the last 24 minutes of the hunt. Uh, that's not going to happen in the late round here, unless it's three dogs on three separate trees, you know. Yes. Uh, I, I really believe that. Well, it looks like we've got uh, uh, JR and, and the judge coming back to rejoin the cast here, so I'm sure we probably haven't gotten an update with them on one side of the river and the rest of the cast on the other side of the river. Stick with us. I, I have a fan. <laughs> looks like somebody's got a boot full of water, man. That's got to be miserable. Thank goodness it's nice and warm right. tonight. I bet you that water's still cold going in their boots, but I feel like we probably haven't got an update because they've been on the other side of the river. Hopefully that's about to change here in just a second and we'll you know, be able to give everybody a little bit of information on what's going on there and we'll be able to, to bring it back to the scoreboard to see where we're at. Um, there's a couple I, scenarios there that I've seen as they were crossing back across the river, coming back across. Um, JR still had Connor on the leash as he was coming across the river, and you could see Connor swimming there. So we got a, we got a couple scenarios here. One, the guy is wanting to hunt on this side of the river back to where all the other guys are at. Or uh, two, they, they've got to go back to where they've last heard Piper, according to our scorecard, the only one left struck in. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're relatively confident that Piper's not being heard at this point. We got to get back to where we can hear her. Gotcha, gotcha. Now I'm going to disagree with something that you said just a little bit. You know, you, you said I'll chime right in with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll you'll join, jump on the bandwagon yeah, yeah, with me. That's, uh, let's, well, he he's tried to prove me wrong all all weekend. <laughs> so this and he, and he hasn't. And th this may be his only shot to glory. This might be the time. <laughs> and, and this is just a difference. My different take on it, I mean, you guys are the experts, but you know, you just made the comment that we've got about 34 minutes left and that's not a lot of time. I gotta go back and look at the first 15 minutes of tonight. I mean, we got points and we got them really, really fast. 
I think with this group of dogs, I mean, you're looking at still 25% of our time left. I think that they've got some time to do it here when you're, when you're looking at the scores. What's going to be interesting for me to see in particular is if Connor's taking a negative here. If Connor McGregor takes a negative here, that brings him back bunched up pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I, I think that the, the clock mm-hmm. at that point is probably back in Piper and Dominator's favor to some degree. Now, if Connor stretches that lead, then I would have to agree to you. Well, agree with you, that's not a lot of time left. Right. You know, the, the biggest thing in this scenario here is, is uh, we know that dogs are at large and they're obviously they're not on top of them. You know, uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of flurry, uh, you know, and that happened all within relatively three, four hundred yards of them. And, uh, you know, they walked quite a ways into Dominator, you know, uh, and then cut Dominator loose and then obviously heard Connor uh, McGregor. And so uh, it, it becomes a little tougher because you don't know where they're at, you know, not being there. You don't know where they're at. If they're not right underneath their feet, even if a dog gets treed, uh, chances are when they hear them are going to be in there quite a ways. So they're going to walk a lot of that time out. Uh, versus just walking a few minutes in there and uh, scoring them, you may walk 15 minutes to to yeah. score. And then only having 30 minutes left, obviously, it's going to be a huge deal. So I guess right. it really rides on two things: what was the outcome with Connor number one to close that gap, and right. then number two, how much time does it take to get to Piper? Yeah, and it takes how far a lot of they? time. Yeah, if Piper's really far out, and it takes a while. The clock is definitely against him. Uh, whoever is trailing at that time. If they get right on top of Piper, it's anybody's game still probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they got back across the river just a second ago, so we're still waiting for an update. I'm sure that they're gathering themselves, and uh, hopefully within the next couple of minutes we're going to be able to tell you guys exactly what the outcome was there on on the far side of the river. Um, Tonight, going into these these finals, typically, what are we going to see for a hunt area? I mean, are, when they turn loose, are they going to have a couple of miles, hopefully, in every direction to go, or what, what do you typically see here? It, it's hard. It's level? hard to get that anywhere in this day and age. No. Um, you, you just hope that uh, that dogs go kind of in the direction that you that you can hunt. You know, um, you know, and what we're seeing tonight in this particular instance. This is not uncommon for a late round. This is not uncommon. Uh, the, for the last hour, uh, in a late round type of cast, I mean, it can change. It can literally, people don't understand, it can literally change that quick. You can be scoring on three, four raccoons, bang, 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 and it can shut it off and be dead for the rest of the night. You know, it really can. Good deal. Well, it looks like that Alan's gone back over to his desk. So, Alan, give us an update, buddy, if you can. All right, we've got another one. Uh, so they got the dog back across the river. I'm talking about uh, Connor McGregor, got him back across the river. And as soon as they did that, uh, Joe Manning struck and tree Dominator. Struck him for 25. So uh, uh, Connor McGregor is still on the lead at this point, so that's why 25 was only open. So he struck and treed him. So they're headed on their way to him right now, and uh, uh, J.R. Gray elected to keep Connor on the lead. He had the option in this case, option to recast, uh, and, and he's opted to keep him on the lead strap going to uh, Dominator. So that's where we're sitting right now. So how was that tree scored, Alan? Uh, that we're tree coming. was uh, circled. Okay. Trevor said it had, it had a tangled mess of vines up there and they circled that tree. Wow. So we've got, I guess that would be uh, 50 and, one, and 125 going in the circle there for Connor McGregor. So, Is that right, Rick? Yeah, that's correct. And, and Alan pointed out that he took his option to keep his dog on the leash. Now, why would you do that? Confident that you've got this thing pretty close to wrapped up. That's what he's thinking. Um, if he'd have took a minus there, I, I guarantee you he'd have been cutting his dog loose. But uh, he, he's thinking that, uh, hey, they're going to have to tree a couple coons to beat me. And uh, it, it's an option when a dog's called treat in there, you pull off a tree, you either have the option to cut loose or you can hold your dog, lead it to that tree, score that tree, come off of that tree, and if Piper's not called treat somewhere else, then both those dogs will be recast if we can hear Piper barking at the time. So he's opted to lead his dog uh, to Dominator, and then uh, the interesting thing might be is it'd be nice to know how far. 
how far is he going to keep his dog on the leash and how much clock is he going to eat off of that and keep the lead all the way in. So, you know, if Dominator's got a raccoon in his tree, uh, he still can't he still can't beat Connor at this time. He won't go ahead of him. Sure. So when they come off of Dominator's tree, um, they're going to have to listen for Piper. Maybe she'll be barking. Maybe she won't be. Um, so that's at that point. That's when Jr. will have to probably cut loose, as long as uh, along with Joe, if they do here or the eight minutes gets her and there's still time to hunt. Gotcha. So. To recap, for those of you guys that, that really aren't super familiar with the scoring system, Connor took a circle for that 50 and that 125. Now, a circle in this case means basically it's just a neutral deal. He didn't gain points. He didn't lose points. So with that 175 circled, he maintains his position of 400 to the plus which gives him a 225-point lead over Piper. More importantly, Piper right now has 75 pending. So even if Piper exactly. does tree and is first to tree, the most ground that Piper can make up at this point is 200 points, uh, which is not going to get her tied with him. She would still be 25 points down to Connor. Dominator has... 25 and 125 pending, but because he's in the whole 50, the best that he can do is be 100 to the good, which would still have him trailing Conor McGregor by 300. So you can see the logic that JR is using, and you know, you could get a you could get strike points that wind up being negative and hurt you more than they could help you. He's I'm not going to second guess uh, uh, what Joe did there, um, but I, I am. I, I am a little curious as to why he didn't force JR to turn his dog loose. How could um, you have done that, Rick? Well, by not treeing. By not treeing, they, uh, apparently they can hear Dominator in there. So when they get to the bank and, uh, and, and they walk up this bank, whatever they're doing, and, and Joe calls tree, that gives JR the option to hold his dog. When you're holding your dog and you've got a lead, your dog can't make a mistake on the leash. And had uh, had Joe maybe paused a, a, a minute or so to where the judge could hear Dominator in there, he's been called struck, okay, and uh, and then he, the judge would have instructed Jr. to cut Connor loose, and then Joe could tree immediately. Uh, he, as soon as that he, dog's cut as loose, as soon as that dog's loose, he can be called treed immediately. Now you've got Connor at Laura, uh, you know, he's headed out of there now. And anything can happen when he's off the leash. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jr. Jr. made a good call there, uh, I'm sure, and he's held his dog right there. And and you know, uh, Connor's a two-year-old. I mean, he, this is a young dog, and uh, you know, you know, young dogs can you know are more prone to you know it's like anything they're more prone to make a mistake here and there uh, than maybe what an older seasoned hound would. And uh, absolutely, I agree with Rick. I think this is a good call on. Uh, on uh, J.R. Gray uh, keeping him on the lead. He obviously put the stationer on him, ran it down before he made this first tree. Uh, I know they didn't see a raccoon in this tree. It, you know, great big viney tree could have obviously been there uh, and it, it was awarded circle points. But you know, uh, keeping him on the lead, it's a, it's a smart move. And uh, Are you surprised that, I mean, Joe's got a, the oldest guy in the field, has got a oldest handler here, has a world of experience. Are you shocked that he didn't really force JR's hand with Conor McGregor? Well, again, I think it comes back to what Rick said. I mean, it, it, it probably depends on how far he's in there. You know what I mean? And, and, and understand this. Don't know how the strikes are going to work out, but if he keeps him on the lead, maybe Joe elected and said, hey, uh, you know, we're going to, if, if the dog is a couple hundred yards up there or 300 yards up there, we'll go ahead and, and tree there, get him scored, and we both have to cut back loose at large. Now, if he pulls a minus and I get another plus, that puts me right back in it too. So uh, without being there, you know, there's just some of the things, absolutely. Well, hopefully we're about to find out because it looks like Alan's back in the studio now. Alan, have you got any more scores for us? Yeah, I do have another report. Uh, they got to Dominator's tree. They scored him, found a coon right away, and he's plussed up. So he had 25 on strike, and that 125 gives him uh, one, uh, gives him a total score of 100 plus right now. So that puts McGregor in the lead still with his 400 plus uh, dominate or Dominator with 100 plus. Piper's still sitting at 175. We haven't heard from her in a while. 
uh, but they are headed back towards where they last could hear Piper, but unfortunately, at the moment, she is 1.17 miles from where the cast is, and Trevor says they will need to go, uh, they're barely gonna get within a mile of her from where they last heard her, and the wind is in the wrong direction, so it is not looking good to hear her. Uh, that's the last report I have there. Wow, that could be a very, very bad break right there uh, for Piper. I mean, this is a dog that can do a lot of damage fast, as we saw in the semifinals, but she can't do any damage if they can't get to her in time and this thing is called. So now, Dominator just picked up 150 to the positive, erased 50 to the negative to bring him to 100 plus, still 300 points behind Connor. Piper a long way uh, out of range, it sounds like, right now. Connor McGregor, uh, Steve, don't you think he's definitely sitting in the driver's seat right now? Well, he is, but what I'm looking at, there's 31 minutes left to go in the hunt. Uh, it's all going to come down to how far they have to walk back to where they last heard Piper at. Uh, the way it sounded to me, she was 1.17 tenths of a mile from him. So, you know, and... According to the reports that we're getting, they're going to still be a mile from her where, where the, when they get back to where they last heard her at. So if they get back there in the next five or six minutes and apply the eight and, and walk that eight or whatever they do, uh, they could still be turning their dogs back loose with 14 minutes left to go. And, you know, looking at the score, uh, if she pulls a 75 minus there, now they're tied for, you know, for the 100. So Yeah, we'll see what happens. Alan, can you get enlighten us a little bit, please? Yeah, the cast did get back to where they last heard Piper, and that is she's still .92. And Duel has her on his Garmin, and she is showing treed to him, uh, but there's just no way they can hear, hear her from that far away. Wind is just in the wrong direction, and uh, they're running the eight on her right now. They've got Dom and, uh, and McGregor uh, on the lead strap. That's what's happening right now. So Duel at this point, Alan, Duel can probably take uh, an option and walk some of his eight minutes towards her, but it doesn't seem like it would have any kind of a bearing of, of being able to hear it probably. I would say, I would say you're correct with that. Yeah, he can, he can walk a little bit, and I'm not sure if they're going to do that or not, but I don't, at this point, uh, everything's just uh, working against him. Yeah. So does there have to be irrefutable evidence that he can hear Piper to uh, declare her treed? Well, I'm not sure who you're saying he is, but the judge has to hear. Okay, the judge is the one that has to hear. So, so um, Duel even can't say, "Hey, I hear my dog declare no, a treat." No, I mean, you know, every everybody, um, everybody out there from Duel's information that he shared with them, everybody out there, everybody in here, everybody watching on on this live feed, has got a gut feeling that sure Piper's treat in there somewhere, but we've got to be able to hear to get her on. The judge has to hear to get her on the scorecard and, uh, and, and get her scored. So uh, it's, it's not looking good uh, for Duel to be able to hear. If, uh, you know, if they stand there and the eight minutes gets them, then they're gonna recast and we're watching them right here. If, if our time is current, um, looks like maybe they are moving towards Piper to where they're trying to, trying to get within hearing of her. And, they, and he's only got eight minutes to get there. Uh, we're looking at some uh, open area there, a uh, uh, little bit of, um, looks like possibly swamp area there. Yep. And they are going to, I promise you right now, that duel is out in front. <laughs> and he is <laughs> Got his track them. shoes on. He is dragging them. As, and Jeremy Kidd's in great shape. I mean, he he's going to keep right up there. There they are, right there. I mean, there, there's your handler, there's your judge in the front. Um, they're, they're headed toward her. And we're looking at a steep bank right there. Um, but For the first time tonight, we're struggling a little with the feed, too. If they can it's get really in hearing of her, um, and I know Alan said something about we're not going to speculate, we're not going to predict. If they get within hearing of her, I'll bet a ham sandwich that that duel does not call her treat immediately. He lets them guys get turned loose and then calls her treat because he's not going to win the cast with Connor on the leash. Connor has to get loose and make a mistake in order for, uh, you no, know, if it, it plays out that she would have a coon in there, if they're even able to hear her. Connor's, Connor's not going to make a mistake on the leash. So when they get up there, uh, two ham sandwich bet here, 
that Newell's going to let indicate that, hey, I'm here, the judge may hear, and you're going to look at them guys and say, you're going to have to cut loose. And when they do, bang, we're tree and piper, and uh, Newell's hoping for a coon, and he's also hoping Connor can take some kind of minus point. Yeah. At this point, he's no. going to need a little help. Ed. There's a lot going on here. Yeah. There's a lot going on through everybody's no. mind. we you got about 17 minutes left, too, guys. Go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry. You don't think there's any shot that he would uh, – that, that duel would uh, tree her. Well, it doesn't matter because even if he trees her. He can't uh, win. Uh, but even if he trees her, uh, the other guys can still cut loose as soon as they hear him because uh, there's a no leash lock. So, right. so, so. <clears throat> that would be, be up to them. It would be up to them. Yeah. Yep, up to yeah. them. And, and Connor's got to make well, a mistake no, even if Piper's 100% on right now. I don't, no, back to your point, though, Rick. Uh, if he doesn't treat her right away, they have to cut back. Right, that's what if that was trees, my point. Yeah. If, he if he treats, treats her right, right away. away. But, but here's the scenario. Here's the awesome part. At that point in time, when they hear her, and this is, this is they can do this, uh, Joe can elect to turn Dom loose, and, and JR can elect to keep uh, Connor on the leash. If dual trees. If dual trees. Yeah, if he doesn't tree, they are, and, and the judge can hear Yep. They're going to have to turn loose. And that's Newell's only shot uh, that I can see um, of, of getting a first out of this scenario. He, we, he, they've got to get Connor minus. And, uh, you know, I th I'm thinking it's going to finish, you know, pretty similar to what we're seeing right now. But if they get back within hearing in her, it's a new ball game. Well, uh as we know, there's 19, 18 minutes left to go. The I eight, know, eight, yeah, we're the down eight, to about 15 already, now. The rates have already been applied, so there's probably five. You know, we're we're, we're getting somewhere around the four minute we're mark. Still, you know, we're still we're so, still traveling that way. Yeah, okay. yeah. These guys still covering a lot of ground. Looks like they're back up out of the out of the low ground, the sandy, swampy area there, and uh, moving back. Uh, well, actually, a little bit of sand like there. We got, still got a dog on a leash, so the eight minutes probably hasn't caught her at this point. No. I'm not sure if our timing is is exact here with what we're watching, but uh... man, an unbelievable job on the filming crew. That this is probably the best uh, live feed I have seen. I've never seen anything that any clear. clear. Oh, that. Yeah, I mean, you we would had think like they'd be hunting in a park. Sure, yeah, honestly, we had yeah. like five minutes there, guys. The reason we took it down earlier. Um, is because we had just a few minutes there where they had really bad signal after they crossed that creek. But when they came back, we picked it up again. This really has been a great live feed. And when there's any action whatsoever, we're going to bring it back to you. Uh, you know, it's not the most exciting thing in the world watching a bunch of, you know, judges and, and handlers uh, and entourage walk across the field. So something good starts happening. We're going to share it with you as quick as we possibly can. Right now, they're just trying to get to Piper and you know, a lot of praying's probably going on. Uh, we don't have much time remaining well, at all. Well, you know, according to uh, when they cut loose, it was twelve forty-eight, and it's or uh, and yeah, and it's two uh, two thirty-five. Two thirty-five right now. So, so, so we're getting down to where there's you know close, roughly thirteen minutes left to go in this hunt. But Th I, at thirteen minutes to crown adult, I mean, I mean, imagine the emotion that's going through there. Yeah. Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to. Win 50,000. Sure. But I'll tell you, 13 minutes with Piper, I mean, there's still some ground to make up. It looks like even if Piper's successful here, be Connor's going to have to make a mistake. we gotta get, we got to be getting close to the eight-minute mark on her. You know, we're going to have to stop. We're going to have to strain and listen for her. Uh, the judge is going to have to hear her. Uh, and, and, if, and if they don't hear the eight minutes is over, and we're casting these two dogs for the and last. So what happens to Piper 75 if they she'll, don't hear and they hit so take She takes a minus. Yeah. Boy, that'd be just like and a dagger through the heart, then, wouldn't it? And then most likely we're casting the other dogs. Yeah. yeah. And, you know. Do they that, have to cast? Uh, the only way that. Um, Is there any scenario this. under which Conor McGregor would not have to be released again if Piper takes a negative 75 here? If the. No, he has to. They have to release. If they, if, if if for some reason they would have to call timeout, then he wouldn't have to recast there. But he's um, not gaining any if, time because the clock has stopped. If um, I'm not sure what the rule is on this, if both of them withdraw, I mean, uh, you know, Jay, Jay Paul's asking us: Is there any situation where he wouldn't have to turn loose if they both withdraw? He's the winner. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say they're listening here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we see we're bringing up well. Just went down again. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we're back at the desk again. You know, so 
taking a look at the scoreboard here, 225-point lead for Connor. We're going to find out any minute now because that eight minutes has got to be up. By, as a matter of fact, uh, looking at the clock, it just went out, and I think that's going to bring us back to our UKC director of field ops, Alan Gingrich. Alan, what happened there? Yeah, the eight minutes caught Piper there as we kind of expected it might uh, be an out of position like that. So she gets minus her 75 on strike there, and they did cut Domin or a Dominator and Connor loose. 11 minutes remaining. So 11 minutes to go in here, guys. In this, negative 75 drops Piper back to 100 plus. You've got Dom at 100 plus. You've got Connor with the 300 point lead over both of those dogs. Be all, I mean, he'd have to make a mistake probably, and then they'd have to have some luck too. I mean, yeah. he makes the biggest mistake he could. He gets 100 points for strike. He gets 125 for tree, and he loses them all. Um, he is still looking at a 75-point lead. He'd either have to turn around and make another mistake or Dominator or Piper's got to do something positive here. And, and if your math's correct, the clock just – the clock's not going to allow that. The clock yeah. just won't allow that. You know, uh, I can guarantee you uh, J.R. sitting there hoping that his just – Leaves and don't yeah, say a word. And doesn't, doesn't you know make what I mean? Sound. This is why they're starting. And Joe is hoping that that you know, or Endel is hoping that he just goes down and the first tree he comes to falls straight on it. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and you know, one thing to point out uh, that's kind of went against him too. So as they noted when they was walking along the river, they was seeing all these coons sitting up. You know what I mean? So right there is a pocket. And obviously, Dom come treat fairly close to where uh, Connor was, and they scored that. But now they've walked to the last place they've heard uh, Piper. Then they walk an additional eight minutes toward where they right. – so they've walked away from that. So, you know, that kind of plays against them too, as opposed to if they could have cut loose right there because they've seen uh, these coons sitting around them. So, you know, there's just it, – it's one of this – this is why we – this is why we do, you know, free cast these hounds, so – yeah, but looking at him as we go back to the field here, got to point out, 10 minutes left, uh, maybe a little bit, maybe nine, 10 minutes le left in here. Piper and Dom aren't out because if Connor makes a major mistake, I mean, we've seen how quick Piper can strike and tree. It would take a little, a, probably a mistake on Connor's part for Dom or Piper either one to get in, but if Connor makes that mistake, that opens the door back up. It is definitely not over. And Alan, we got another update coming from you, buddy. I think tell us what that is. Well, when they cut those two dogs loose, uh, they were that tied. Piper and Dominic were tied, but Dom or a uh, Dominator tied with a hundred plus each. But Dominator is still in third place because he has the most minus points. However, you talked about Piper uh, uh, treeing them quick tonight. Uh, they turned Dominator loose. He's 125 yards to the right, struck and treed. Wow. Oh, three whew. minutes remaining. <laughs> this could still, hey, yeah, that no. puts him at three. And they, How many and, minutes remaining, Alan? Three. With three <laughs> minutes, with three minutes left, actually, by my clock, it's got to be a little more than three. Uh, but with just a few minutes left, re regardless. Well, and again, um, that that's a... You know, looking at it this way, that could very easily be a ten thousand dollar coup. I mean, earlier, we Probably. talked about a fifteen thousand. You know, he walks in here and and he absolutely has nothing to lose. He's in third place. I mean, he can move from from third to second. In a, it's a ten thousand dollar tree. But but even first strike, first tree, two hundred twenty five points. Add still that to fifty, two seventy five. Connor has still got to make a mistake. Yep. I think they're there to get in to get into the driver's seat to win this thing. All right, looks like they're getting really, really close. Of course, they weren't that uh, far to begin with. Now, guys, I'm looking at it unofficially, but according to my phone here, it's 2.41. So I think we've still got six or seven minutes left, maybe. Alan, uh, Alan t t what is the official time? Do you know? Yeah, I was wrong. They had the three running on the tree, not three minutes remaining. So you're correct. They've got close to the six, seven minutes remaining. Good down. My mom was a math teacher. She'd have been awful disappointed if I was wrong with that one. So, still a few minutes left. Looks like they're starting to shine this tree. Man, there are a lot of these. Looks like a dead tree. Donut. 
You can see him going to the squall right off the bat. So I'm about to try to risk him too. Of course, we'll know. I mean, guys, we're just guessing right now. So don't really want to speculate. But. All right, Alan, what do we got? Uh, Hunter is struck back in for 75. So Connor's back up on the board in 75. Uh, worst case scenario, he could lose those. But not a lot of time left. Now, we know we've only got uh, five minutes left. He struck back in for 75. Even if he trees, do you declare him treed, or if you're JR, do you just let the time run out? We'll, we'll never hear that dog called treed. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he won't be called treed the rest of the night. The only, uh, the only thing that, uh, you know, the worst thing that can happen to him, he can walk into the cast or something like that, maybe take a strike line. But hey, we're, we're hunting with uh, professional dogs, you know, and, and uh, the likelihood of that happening is it, nearly zero. Yeah, and the likelihood of Dom making up any ground whatsoever here looks pretty remote. Looking at that hole where you called it, Steve, that is, I mean, look, we don't want to speculate. It doesn't take any speculation at this point. That is a den tree if there ever was a den tree. I think we're probably fixing to see him circled up on 225 points. And if that's the case, I think it's, you know, just about over. You know, the, the worst thing here is uh, being in a dual situation. Dog out of pocket. Wind is just not in your favor. And you got a dog here. You might know. as well be tied up. Yeah, yeah might as well be in there tree and, and, so, uh, and Toby has another tune that would, uh, you know, and it's just, it's, it's just one of them, you know, you know, going into these hunts, that's just, that's just the brace, you know. Uh, he's obviously treated on a den tree here, you know. Um, you know, when it's when it's your turn, it's your turn, and when it's not, it's not. That's just the way it rolls. I I just uh, I've said it two or three times tonight, and I'll quit saying it. But the live feed video tonight is, is awesome. That, that's as clear as I've ever watched um, a, a live feed video. I tell you what, I bet Joe would love to have a chainsaw in his pocket right now. <laughs> <laughs> We had a neutral friend that he didn't have a chainsaw, but he had something that could uh, do a number on them trees. I'm not even going to ask what that was. I'm gonna... <laughs> that's for another. That's for another turn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now looks like we are at the three-minute mark. So uh, things are not looking you know, good for sure here. Think, think, think about. Think about this. Uh, so there's three minutes left to go. So I would assume, just hypothetical thinking, if I'm there, Joe knows there's not enough time. At this point in time, there's probably not enough time to pull off this tree, get cut back loose, and get scored. So his only option here is to take the full eight minutes and absolutely do everything he can to get this thing to move because it's $10,000 riding on the line. You know what I mean? There's $10,000 riding on the line. And even when he does pull off this tree, um, we still got to hear Connor pull a bar. Pull a bar. Before to, he can recast. To recast. So, you know, there's a lot riding on the line here. Yeah, sure. And, and you know, and, and like we touched on earlier, you know, Duel is sitting there with, you know, basically, uh, you know, his hands are, you know, his hands are tied right now at this point. Well, and, and even if we do hear Connor pull a bar and he cuts him loose and he strikes, he can only strike for 50 at that point because Connor's still got the 75 pending uh, up on the board. So, you know, <coughs> I don't see any way that with just a couple of minutes left here, Piper or Dominator can catch Connor McGregor. There's nobody at this desk can see that. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. And you know, you know, uh, uh, Connor probably, you know, these hunts you gotta catch breaks. You gotta catch breaks. You know, uh, obviously uh, Dominator, uh, his break come when he when he you know the snag on the edge of the river. You know, uh, that's just. You know that really uh, talked about that earlier, where the yeah. coons one tree over the coons. Uh, and when the, when it gets windy out, when that wind picks up, right. you, you see it, it. You see it so many times that wind can pick up, and you know it's just you know. And obviously, there's a lot of coon in that area, and you just miss them. I mean, it's just the good ones. I mean, the, even the good ones, you know, sure. do. That's just the way it is. And 
and it started out hot, but typical for a late round, uh, that it, that's just, this is what can happen. And they're doing a lot of beating and banging, guys. Oh, that's, uh, you would do it. You yeah. would do it for $10,000. You're you're going to give it your all. And, uh, and I guarantee you, Joe's blowing on that squalor oh, yeah. as hard as he has a, a day in his life, you know. They're watching the time, and uh, will there be a... Well, it's not my unofficial two. watch. We got one minute left, under a minute, actually. Uh, it's, if, if it was 248, 1248 when they cut loose, and it's 248. So I'm going to say yeah, we're within a minute. Yeah. It looks like he's got Dominator still raising cane there. That dog's still full of energy. Can, can, oh, can, ready to rock and roll, man. Can, can you imagine uh, JR sitting there? Uh, here he is hunting a dog, uh, you know, that's off of his dog that he won the world hunt with. And and now he's just, he's won, you know, uh, one of the biggest hunts, yeah. you know, with, with, with two years old. I mean, look at the future this dog's got in front of him. I don't want to declare him the winner prematurely. We'll wait for Alan to give us the official word. But you just saw... Uh, Looked like uh, Joe J that he just, just threw in the towel. Yeah, he right just there. threw that limb down pretty much in disgust. <laughs> it's not too, I don't want to speculate a lot, but listen, reading his body language, it was pretty obvious that he was not a happy So he camper. called it when we interviewed him out there to, uh, at the uh, fat, Three Fat Labs, you know, he said he, uh, he'd be happy with 20. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, uh, and that's probably where he's going to wind up here. Yeah, well, um, we're going to get the official word here in just a second. Uh, Right now, time should be up. Get some confirmation in just a second from Alan on that, but uh, not looking good at all for Dom and, and Piper right now. It's, you know, I tell you, the thing that shocks me about this final compared to the other rounds is I, I really, I mean, we've got one, two, three, four, if I'm counting it right, four coons. Positive uh, tree. Five. We should five. have Connor Street two, Dominator Street two, and Piper Street scored on one. Yeah. But uh, Dominator actually uh, had a second tree, so he oh, actually tree right. run, so yeah. they would have scored on four. Four, four trees. But yeah. you know, if you look at the scores from last night and late round, that was kind of you know that was kind of typical in the late round yeah. last night, scoring on three or four. It's it's uh, you know they, they they didn't tend to move late as as good as what they did early. Yeah. So which which is which is understandable. Connor it's, had the high score last night with four seventy five. And, uh, Pretty close to that right now with 400 if this score holds. I, I, I'm a little surprised. I really expected with this field, as good as they are, and with the w number of raccoons in this area, I thought we might see six, seven, maybe even eight. I think we would have. If, if the wind hadn't have picked up, I think we would have. Uh, you you know, really think the wind was the difference oh, the wind was a The wind was a determining factor. We spent too much try time trying to locate dogs. Yeah. Um, you know, we keep talking about Piper here off and on, but look at the amount of time that we took trying to get to where we could hear her, and we probably could have heard her if the wind wasn't blowing or had the wind been in our favor. Sure. You right. Know? And uh, the last And then blowing at their backs, as Alan told us. Right. You right. know, it is, was. Is blowing in their faces. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, the wind, the wind definitely uh, played a part of it tonight. We may have still had the same winner, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we started this thing, none of us really wanted to pick a winner. Uh, and speaking of speaking of picks, I think uh, I didn't write it down, but I think I that uh, part of <laughs> I think he picked Piper, didn't he, to win this thing? No, no, I, think, uh, no, I did not pick Piper to win this thing. I'm thinking that uh, you and I had uh, Connor. Is that correct? I know I had Connor. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think your recollection is wrong too, Rick. Well, I like we're going to find out. Who, in there. We're going to find out who was the best prognosticator for sure right now. Because guys, the official word is in. Let's take it over to Alan Gingrich. Alan, fill us in, man. Tell us what happened. Yeah, the hunt's over. Uh, the tree got circled there and uh, hunt time ran out. So uh, uh, Connor McGregor is your $50,000 champion here. Uh, Piper is gonna finish second with 100 plus. Dominator will in fact place uh, third. 
with also with 100 plus. So there you go. So what's going on now, Alan? We're, we're going to round the dogs up. We got two out probably at this we, point. We do. The cast is 0.67 miles from the trucks where they're at right now. And uh, the other two handlers are going after Piper and Connor. And uh, they'll be eventually, they're going to get them rounded up and they're going to come back here to the studio. And we're going to bring all three dogs in here and you'll get to see them tonight and uh, see them uh, presented their awards. Oh, that's awesome, guys, too. $100,000 worth of awards here in about an hour or so yeah, being that, presented that a, to uh, yeah. three coon hound very, handlers. Very well deserving. Oh, my hounds. gosh. Yeah. Very well yeah. deserving. And, uh, and three really nice checks. Hey, I'll uh, take any of the three yeah. checks. Listen, I'll tell you. Twenty thousand dollars better than the sharp stick in the eye any day. Oh my God! Yeah. yeah. So oh, we're back to the pick where you and I had the. I think. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't I believe remember. there was no you and I. You have to ask him if there was a mouse in his pocket. Yeah, that's because, what I'm wondering about. Because yeah. I, I don't think there's a you and I in this, this yeah. whole deal. No, no there's no yeah. way. I don't have a mouse in my pocket. That's for sure. And I did pick Conor McGregor. I'm pretty sure. Let me see. Uh, yeah, both you guys picked dominator for we did. sure yeah we did and, uh, and uh but hey all three any of the three i think i think if you hunted this hunt uh three nights you could very easily have three different winners true, true. Oh, no doubt about absolutely it. i mean that's just the, that's just the style of dogs uh you know that's just the quality of dogs that these are and, you know uh started out with 1336 mm -hmm. down to 796 and now this is the final three and in and, uh, and what really, really, I guess probably for me, uh, what we've seen trend the last couple years, uh, that years ago you wouldn't see as much, is some of these dogs at the age, at two years old, you yeah. know, 28 months old, that are winning the, and having to win multiple casts in a row to do it. It's just really incredible. It, it's a huge testament to to the, the hunting that's being put in behind these dogs. I mean, this doesn't happen without a, a, a lot of miles logged and, and a lot of, you know, uh, things done on that side. So, you know, for this dog to be 28 months old to do that is incredible. It really is incredible. So we're about to take it to break, but before we do, Rick, you, your thoughts here. Uh, fantastic weekend and uh, a, great, a great final cast of dogs. Um, it, it couldn't be any better. I swear. I, I, I don't think that I've, I don't think I've witnessed, been a part of anything in the coonhound world any greater than this. Uh, what we've witnessed here this weekend here. Sure. I mean, it really has been a wonderful weekend. No controversy that I know of, which has been another great thing. A lot of good sportsmanship out there, and a definitive winner. So, guys. Last cast, they're done. Obviously, uh, Conor McGregor and JR have been declared the winners of the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions for 2022, but we're not done there. Right now, we're about to throw it to break for a little while. Please uh, stick with us. Go get you something to drink, get you something to eat, whatever. Not sure exactly how long we're going to be at break, but I can tell you this for sure. After they pick these dogs up and the cast regroups, uh, they're not going back to our venue at Three Flat Labs tonight. Instead, they're going to come directly here to the Inn at DePaul here in the studio. And we are going to pass out checks, get to talk to all three members of the final cast here. So we've still got a lot more to come after the break. Stick with us and we'll see you then. My name is John Irvin. I'm from Athens, Ohio. His name is uh, Stover's Charlie Creek's Bad Butch. He's, he'll be three in July. He's laid back. He don't care what the other dogs think. He's usually by himself. Uh, dogs come into him. He just, you know, he just stays back. He's, uh, he's real accurate most of the time. He, uh, when he trees, he's got coons. He's relaxed here, but when you unstrap him, he's just like, he's gone. He moves around 12, 13 mile an hour. He's probably the hardest tree dog you ever hear in the woods. First round, he made two trees. Um, he had a den tree way through, and then cut him off of that one, and he treed on another den, and uh, got lucky. I was hitting on the tree and got to see the coons, so that gave me plus points there. The other two, um, dogs that still could have beat me was treed 
and uh, one of them was on a den tree and one of them was on a slick tree so that's how we made it to the, the final four and then the final four was it started out kind of tough and then all the dogs got treated in there together and he hasn't been with the dog all week and they decided that <laughs> right out of the truck they're all going to treat together and, and then they got separated like they're supposed to do and he got way behind the cast he was treated in there for an hour and 45 minutes and I couldn't hear him I know he's treed from the Garmin and uh, two dogs got treed and we walked in there and they was on a slick tree so now I'm winning the cast the trip dog got treed way through and he was on a slick tree so now I'm still winning the cast and then the rock dog got treed before the hunt was out and uh, we had to walk about nine tenths of a mile back to him and that was a long walk <laughs> let me tell you I knew I had second locked up, but you know nobody comes to you know play for second. And we got in there, and then they started shining the tree, and it was a long eight minutes. It felt like an hour. First one up! Woo! Congratulations, buddy! <laughs> Thanks, buddy! Yes, yeah, thank you. you. Yep. Good luck, buddy. Congratulations! It feels good. I've knocked on the door a bunch, but never could make it into the final cast of anything. And well, we finally done it. Did you know that your monthly subscription to Coonhound Bloodlines comes packed with upcoming UKC event information, official UKC event results, and articles of interest about coon hunting? It sure does. Read about the top competition hunters and hounds, as well as stories about pleasure hunting and bench show hounds. Subscribe today or renew online at shop.ukcdogs.com. Slide is uh, just turned nine years old in November. He's actually one of these dogs that you don't have to hunt a whole, whole lot. I know everybody says you gotta hunt them every night and you normally do to have a good dog, but with a seasoned older dog like this, you don't have to hunt them near, near as much. But only five UKC hunts that Slide was in was last year. He's never been put in a UKC hunt until last year. And he doubled up at the UKC Winter Classic for two wins. He won a third win in the RQE. He won his fourth win at All of Moats, and he won his fifth win in the zones. He's a very special dog to my young man right here. It's his dog. <laughs> uh, the Triple Crown starts with the Winter Classic. Uh, if you win your cast down here, you get 50 points with plus points, of course. That's on Friday night. If you win on Saturday night with plus points, you get another additional 50 points. And then the second leg is actually the All Moats. If you win your cast in the All Moats, you get another 50 points. Uh, then you have to qualify for the world hunt. Uh, the RQE does not count as far as points total, but when you go to the zones, if you win your cast in the zones, you get 25 points for each night, Friday and Saturday, then you advance to the world. And for each cast you win at world, you get 10 additional points. And at the total of that, whoever's got the most points at the end of the year is the winner of the Triple Crown. The reason I even hunted Slide is the female that I was going to have come in heat and he was sitting in the pen next to her and I grabbed him and brought him down here and doubled up and I decided, hmm, let's try for the Triple Crown. And this is my little sidekick right here. He went everywhere with me. We went to the zones in Arkansas, went to all the moats in Indiana and actually drawled out, went all the way to, to Ohio and hunted up there and he was with me every step of the way. One time that I didn't hunt him, he hunted him in April, so March was when we won the RQE. In April, he carried him to the St. Jude World's Largest Coon Hunt, and he actually won the youth division 13 and under with him over there. 
the last time he's been out was in de December, which is at the youth four-wheeler hunt in Tennessee. They hunt for a brand new four-wheeler, and he won his cast and got in the top 16 with him at the youth four-wheeler hunt. It takes a consistent dog. It's a very prestigious thing. It's one of the top prestigious things in UKC besides the World Hunt and the Tournament of Champions. I used to play music, played in bands when I was younger. I remember the very first time I ever went on stage and the first time I'm playing in front of a real crowd, I walk up to that stage, to that trailer, and all of a sudden I feel my knees knocking against the side and I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting butterflies here. I get that same feeling, especially in a hunt that is a big deal. It's one thing just to uh, participate at your local club, but when you come to an event like the World Championship was always one of those for me. This is an, an important event, something that you put a lot of work into with your dog, and now that time is here and you hope your dog is going to perform like he had been, you know. Get out of the truck, go back, get your dog out, pet him up a couple times, you know, talk to him a little bit. And here we go, and then it's like you just feel those same type of butterflies. And I always thought that it's good to have butterflies. If you don't get a little bit of that excitement, you probably don't have that passion. It's amazing how many people you get to know in a sport like this. And there's a lot of sports like that, but just a lot of good people that share their passion for dogs, you know? <laughs>
They're partners, ready to do whatever it takes. Athletes that pound for pound can outrun, outwork, and outperform anybody you're watching on Sunday. No contract required. You don't waste that kind of potential. You train it, fuel it, unleash it. You activate the power that sits ready and waiting inside every fiber of muscle. You fill every last cell with the energy to push harder than whatever gets in the way. You turn drive into overdrive, natural ability into legendary status. And to do it, you need nutrition that holds nothing back. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. Built to run full throttle on protein and fat, then find another gear. Made with nutrients that are customized for what your dog does. GI technology that supports optimal nutrient delivery. And an antioxidant cocktail that helps day three feel like day one. Where your dog peaks depends on how far their fuel can take them. The Yukonuba Premium Performance Lineup. Four formulas to hold nothing back. Check out the United Kennel Club online store for all of our magazine subscriptions and UKC merchandise. Go to shop.ukcdogs.com and you'll find all the best gear to support your UKC lifestyle. Snag a new hat, hoodie, or t-shirt and subscribe to our many publications, including our world-leading coonhound publication, Coonhound Bloodlines. We even have research pedigrees and rule books available to purchase. Why wait? Shop now.
Welcome back to the 2022 United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. Jay Paul Jackson here back with you in Greencastle, Indiana. We're at the end at DePaul. Of course, alongside me tonight and last night, too, are two expert commentators. Uh, one of the guys thinks he's a little more expert than the other, but they've both been he absolutely has all great. weekend. <laughs> Got Rick Stretch over here to my left. Of course, Steve Burkholder to my right. Uh, we're sitting here. The finals are done. We've declared Connor McGregor as the cast winner. We're waiting on Connor, uh, Dominator, and Piper. Three dogs that made it to the final cast to come back in here. And in a few minutes, we're going to be getting an interview with all of our finalists as well as passing out checks. But before we do, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of things. First off, I want to give a huge shout out to our partners that make this broadcast and this event possible. Obviously, Yukonuba has been an integral part of the United Kennel Club's Coonhound and um, operations and bringing you events like this one. They're a great nutrition partner for us here at the United Kennel Club and really, really appreciate those guys. Of course, we had Lynn Carradine from Yukonuba here with us last night, filling us in a little bit about you know the way that Yukonuba helps our sporting dogs fulfill their nutritional needs. Great product, feed it myself in my kennels and we love it. But we're also excited about another partner, our newest right. partner, to come on board with the United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. And of course, that would be Dogtra. Now, if you haven't heard yet, Dogtra has joined on board as the official GPS collar partner of the United Kennel Club. And they're doing some great things. The Pathfinder collar that you're seeing uh, advertised right there on the screen, the new Pathfinder 2, it is one heck of a product. You need to check it out. If you take a look there on our graphic, of course, you'll see the scan me over the QR code. Be sure, scan the QR code and take a really, really good look at the new Pathfinder 2 from Dogtra, the latest great partner of the United Kennel Club. Well, guys, we're here. Obviously, we've declared a winner. Uh, but we still had three great dogs that made it to the finals. Let's take a moment while we wait for these guys to get back here to the venue here in the studio and take a look at the pedigree of, of all three dogs that we saw tonight. Let's start out, if you guys don't mind, with the dog that came in in third place tonight, tied in positive points at 100 with Piper but due to the fact that Dominator had more negative points, uh, I believe Dominator is, is our third place finisher. Steve, why don't you lead off? Let's talk a little bit about Dominator's pedigree. Well, you know, again, uh, Dominator is off of uh, um, a dog called a Cuz. And uh, man, this dog has produced so many big winners in the last uh, four or five years. He's probably as hot of a stud dog is out there. Uh, he's uh, obviously not living anymore, so there's not going to be any more pups off of him, uh, uh, you know, on live breedings. And uh, you know, he's produced several truck winners. It, it's no, it, it's no, um, you know, uh, it didn't shock anyone that he had a pup. It didn't shock anyone that he had a pup in uh, in here, in the final three of this hunt. Um, you know, he's out of a female called Molly who was off of Jigs. Uh, and Jiggs actually produced a, a male dog by the name of Meltdown uh, that was a number one leading uh, overall, uh, had won more money than any dog in the country for uh, quite some time. And uh, so, you know, he had, he ha both on his top side and bottom side has, uh, you know, he's just stacked there. And, uh, hey, this dog's a three-year-old dog, uh, you know. So, yeah, just, uh, you know, obviously it, it's not by accident he is what he is. No doubt about it. Well, you know, you can see his pedigree thrown up there on our graphic. Rick, any comments on well, his pedigree? I, I'm looking at the mother there, and, and uh, a name uh, jumps out at me is Medley. And I'm, 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 I'm going to ask you, Steve, is that Keith Medley uh, possibly that uh, owned the mother? I, I would think so, because I know Medley lives right down there, uh, close to where, you know, that there. So I, I, would, uh, I would think that that would be one of Keith Medley's females. And, he, and then he would have bred her to cause to get Dominator. To get Dominator. Yeah. yeah. And you notice there, when you saw the graphic for that, you're going to see this on a lot of the dogs. You saw several of them listed as PR. That PR, of course, stands for Purple ribbon breeding and you know the one of the great things about the united kennel club as a registry these guys work very very hard 
to maintain both the integrity of it and to recognize, you know, how we track these uh, over many generations. So when you see that PR, you know that that dog's history can be traced back for several generations through the registry. Okay, so Dominator, third place, to go get his pedigree. Now let's go to Piper right quick. Rick, why don't you lead us off? Talk to us a little bit about Piper's pedigree as we see the graphic pop up there. Well, Piper is a, a direct daughter of All Grand Track Rat. And uh, as we talked about earlier in the evening, uh, Nick Emmel had Track Rat. Uh, I, I believe Nick said that he purchased him when he was about five years old and hunted him in some hunts and bred him to a few dogs. And uh, so, you know, there, there's another tie in with Nick Emmel in this final three. Uh, final six, final three cast of dogs, and uh, you know, she uh, she's uh, track rat was out of track man, and uh, and uh, track rat's mother was get back Jesse, and you're looking at that top there, um, they're all grand night champions, all grand show champions, dual purpose hounds on on the top side of Piper, and on the bottom side uh, you got Y and T's chief executive. Uh, another Grand Knight champion, show champion, uh, is her grandpa on the bottom side. And Lucy Lawless, a Grand Knight champion, uh, is her mother. And then uh, her bottom side, her grandmother on the bottom side, Wallace is Lil, uh, no, no degrees or no titles on her. But uh, Piper is a, a, is a product of some great breeding right there. Um, Track Man is probably one of the most famous uh, dogs to ever, ever uh, produce the pups and um, you know she uh, she gets it honest what she's got there and uh, you know she's a grand night champion as well um, we followed her all weekend she's been right at the forefront all weekend and uh, she wasn't the shadow that she's been off and on throughout her career uh, she was she was out in front this weekend and I'm and I'm happy for her and happy for Duel. No doubt. And we definitely got the opportunity to shine the light on a pretty bride to take her out of that shadow. You know, looking at this pedigree, for her, the thing that stands out to me is, you know, you've got two grand bench champions and another bench champion in there, um, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, you're talking about dogs that have it both in the performance department and the, and the uh, confirmation. confirmation. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and confirmation is huge. I mean, we've seen, we seen this weekend, you know, these dogs are athletes. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, you, you take one, uh, you know, you, I've always said, you know, you, you take a, you can't have it all, but, but you sure would like to have as much of it as you can get. And uh, you put a good frame underneath them, you know, they got to have a good frame to last a long time or they break down early. And, you know, obviously that's not a bad thing having that behind you. No, no doubt at all. So that brings us to our new Tournament of Champions champion that we're about to uh, crown here in a few moments. Pass out the check. Connor McGregor. Steve, why don't you lead off and take a good look at this pedigree. Give me your thoughts. Well, I mean, the first thing that pops out to me, uh, it's, there's no, it's no wonder. I mean, there's no uh, surprise that he would win this. I mean, he's off of a world champion, uh, Gray's Rack Em Up Willie. Uh, that won a world hunt, I think, in 2018. Uh, Willie was off of a dog called Reason, who reproduced many fine hounds, uh, a dual grand, and also off of a, another grand night female called Gray's Stylish Page. And, uh, you know, um, <coughs> Willie had four pups in it this, you know, had four pups in the top 96. Think about that. Four pups in the top 96, and one of them goes on to win it. But, you know, what ties this whole thing together is the mother that comes out of you know we put a lot of emphasis on stud dogs but i can tell you as a, a fancier of you know reproducing you know raising pups and stuff like that you can believe the mother has just as much to do and you know what can we say about johnson creek abbey i've hunted with this female a bunch super nice female and has produced a lot of nice dogs you know including uh, two semi-finalists here and abby's full litter mate sister won a world hunt sure so, you know, it, and, and they're off of, uh, uh, and what's sweet about it is off a tracker. You know what I mean? Well, we call him, his, his kennel name was Tracker. It's all grand track rat. He was a dual grand and was off of, obviously, Immel's smoking little babe, which really was the first dog that Immel took and started. He had babe, and then he bought track rat, and he made that cross who produced Abby. And now he has a, a granddaughter of two dogs that he started out with, that, or a, a grandson, that wins the $50,000, the second annual uh, TOC. 
It's yeah. incredible, you know. So tonight, uh, those two dogs out of out of Abby, fifty five thousand dollars in earnings tonight. Wow. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's amazing. It's just, yeah. yeah. And we get, we, we got it for years to to even dream of having something that went oh, five thousand, let alone fifty five thousand. Yeah. 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 Yep. You know, we we talk about Willie a whole lot, but I mean Abby, obviously. Showed very, very well as a producer here right. this weekend in this event as well. And as a matter of fact, uh, to get to the finals, Conor McGregor and Jr. actually had to defeat a half sister, or I'm sorry, a half sibling to Conor right. out of Abbey. Yeah. yeah, both both of them in the semifinals were out of Abbey. Yeah, no uh, doubt. Yeah, well, guys, thank you for breaking down those pedigrees for us. Uh, still got. Just a couple minutes, but I think our guys are getting really, really close. In just a moment, we're going to break down the set, take a break, and come back with our winner and the two runners-up. But before we do that, I would like to really hear some final thoughts from the guys sitting to my left and right. Now, also, on a personal note, I want to thank both of you guys. Uh, my job as the host has been really, really easy and then, without a doubt, enhanced by having the two of you guys here. Yes, having Rick here has definitely enhanced it for me. No, seriously, y'all have been great. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed working with you guys, and I think definitely uh, we need to hear. You know, why don't you start us off, Steve, and give us your closing thoughts here. Well, it's just been an incredible, incredible, incredible weekend, you know. I believe that, you know, being been to a lot of these type of hunts, I don't know if I've ever been to a hunt that from top to bottom was as awesome as what this one was. And it starts out with a lot of planning. But then even after you do that planning, you know, it's, you know, I th felt like, you know, the guides, you know, we had a tremendous, as it showed all weekend, the guys did an incredible job. The guides did an incredible job, you know. People take time out of their weekend to come judge these events. You know, that's not no easy task. Some of these guys have drove several hours. They're going to be traveling home tomorrow just to come judge these casts, you know. And, uh, you know, the club. The club did an outstanding job. I've known Doug Cundiff and his dad, Charlie, for years and years. When I first started hunting the hunts, uh, Charlie was one of the main master of hounds. And it's no strange, I mean, it's no uh, surprise that this went off the way it did because Doug and, and his entire staff, it's not just Doug, but his entire staff done an amazing job, you know. So uh, obviously, want to thank um, you know the catering company. I thought last night, you know, or Friday night, eating supper uh, there, you know, just a, and you know, and I think it's almost home is what it's called here. If you're ever in this area, stop by that restaurant. They do an outstanding job. They did an outstanding job. And hey, I want to I want to thank uh, UKC. Uh, for giving us the opportunity. This has been a real blast for me. This is uh, something that we talked about uh, four or five years ago on a golf course uh, with, with Alan Gingrich, yeah, just a couple of country boys, and to watch this whole thing unfold, it's been a true honor. It really has. To, you, know, you know, the people that, you know, you guys see us up here, but if you've seen the work that these people do behind the scenes, they work tirelessly, you know, for several hours to make so all this comes together. I just have a really new light of... of you know, of what people do to make, pull this off. And obviously, respect. obviously, J. Paul Jackson, it's been a real honor working with you. It's, uh, you know, I got to meet you at Auto, or I believe it was uh, here it, last it, year. Okay, here last year. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, just we're very thankful to have the opportunity. And hey, kudos to all the hunters. Uh, that come and participated. They competed hard. At the end of the day, the ones that got beat, uh, you know, was respectful. And uh, kudos to J.R. Gray and the new TOC champion. And, hey, I can't, you know what, next year can't get here quick enough. Amen. So absolutely well, enjoy Thank you it. very much, buddy. Yeah. I enjoyed working with you. I guarantee you just as much as you enjoyed absolutely. working with me. Absolutely. Enjoyed it. And I definitely enjoyed working with this guy. And, Rick, before you check out of here, give me your closing thoughts on this 2022 Tournament of Champions. Um, as soon as I pulled in on Friday, I was, I was uh, just in awe of the facility out there at Three Fat Labs. And uh, as I interviewed some of the winners uh, in the middle of the night on Friday um, and asked them about the event, asked them about what, what they thought about it, it was nothing but thumbs up all the way through. And uh, it, just, it just really makes me proud to be a part of it. I am super proud to be asked to help out this weekend. I've enjoyed every minute of it. I'm telling you, I, I really wish it wouldn't end. I mean, it, it, it's been a fun time. 
working with you and Steve, uh, working with the folks here behind the scenes, as, as you said, Steve, it, it's, uh, it's an honor to be setting where I'm setting today. I don't deserve it, but I, I'm, I'm going to relish it. I promise you that. Well, buddy, I think you do. You have been a wonderful analyst here and partner in the broadcast uh, with Steve and myself both. And I, I do really mean it. I'm not patronizing when I say that I appreciate you guys and I feel privileged to have gotten to work with you, you guys on this. And hopefully uh, we'll all three be sitting back here at the table next year yeah. again because this, this is just the second one. This is just the beginning. It's nowhere. Oh, and, and where are we going to go from here? Mm -hmm. Only up. Only up. Only up. Only up. There, there's and, no other way. You know, Rick, I can tell you, I know we jostled back and forth this weekend, but I want to tell you, uh, share with you, it's been a blast. I've had a blast working with you. I know we talked back and forth leading up to this. And uh, honestly, it's just, it was just a lot of fun. And, to get uh, the chance, it's, 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 a, it's phenomenal. No Absolutely. doubt about it. I can't thank them enough. So before you guys start hugging and kissing, maybe we ought to throw this to <laughs> nah. guys. No, nah. seriously, a lot of respect for <laughs> both of you guys, that. and thank you for the job that you guys have done. Now, we got just a little bit of housekeeping to do here. We're going to tear down the set right quick. I think that our cast is maybe actually in the parking lot right now, but they're definitely getting close. So this is going to be a pretty short break. We're about to throw up the Be Back Shortly graphic, and when we say that, we mean that. So please... Uh, don't go away. These guys are going to have to move out of here, but we're going to have the winners in here soon. And thanks again to both Rick and Steve for being here tonight. Uh, I'm J. Paul Jackson, and I'll be right back here in just a few minutes to pass out some checks and bring this thing to a close. Stick with us.
Welcome back to the 2022 United Kennel Club Tournament of Champions. J. Paul Jackson here back with you again for what is going to be for at least one of these guys probably the most exciting moment of the night as we uh, pass out the checks. We've got all three of our final cast members here in the studio with us and we're going to go through them one by one right quick starting with our third pl place finisher here, uh, Dominator. So, I'm so sorry, Joe. Uh, Apologize. Starting with our third place finisher right here to my right hand side. Coming in uh, to present the check, Mr. Alan Gingrich, Director of Hunting Ops for the United Kennel Club. Mr. Joe Manning, congratulations. Thank you, my friend. You're our third place finisher here. $20,000 for you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Yes, congratulations. So, Joe, you and Dominator had a great run to make it all the way to yeah. the finals. Uh, tell me your thoughts coming in here on this final cast. Man, just had a great time, I tell you. Um, our guides were fantastic. Judges were great. Sportsmanship was wonderful. What do you think about Dominator's performance? I think he did all that he could tonight. Um, took a bad break, uh, but uh, it happens. But, shoot, I'm happy for the other winners for certain. Um, no doubt about it. You know, we, we saw a little blurb of you from the interview this afternoon when you made it, and you were all smiles, and you even said then, you know what, no matter where, I'm guaranteed $20,000, I'm going to be a happy man, and it looks like that came true. It certainly did. You still did. look very, very yes, happy. Yes, sir, without a doubt. Yeah, well, congratulations. Thank you so much. Y'all had a great performance here um, at the Tournament of Champions. So now we're going to turn around to – our second place finisher who also had just one heck of a run, Duel and Piper. Congratulations, buddy. I think uh, Alan's got something to present you with here. Yeah, Duel. Congratulations, man. It. I know the, it didn't work out in your favor. The win had a little bit to do with it. She yeah. got out of pocket on you. Oh, yeah. But uh, that's the way hunts go sometimes. But 30000 yeah. probably isn't too bad. Yeah, we'll take it. There you go. <laughs> Yes, sir. Now, you guys also have been on a tear all week long. And, and really, in, in that semifinals, it was very, very impressive with the comeback Piper made from actually being in the negative to finish with over 700 points uh, in the positive to even make it here to the finals. Tell us a little bit uh, about that semifinal performance, please. Yeah, it was uh, in the early round. Uh, she uh, ended up treating a slick right out of the truck, and uh, Bonnie had a coon. And... Uh, Right then and there, I was like, man, this, I might take this 5,000 home, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, I think it was in the last 38 minutes, she ended up training four coon quick, you know. And, uh, I mean, she does that stuff at home a lot, you know, but I didn't know what she was going to do. So we rolled with it. Yeah, and then, you know, at the end, it came down to the wire when we were sitting here talking about it. You know, we knew her speed and how fast she moves. I I'm sure it had to be awfully nerve-wracking when you had her out there and, and she'd struck and treat and you were so far away from her. How did all that unfold? Yeah, it was uh, actually in the last 30 seconds. I had 550 and Bonnie had 575. And uh, she come treat in the last 30 seconds and I got her treat in. And uh, it took us like probably 25 minutes to get over to her. And uh, thank God there was a coon up there. Yeah. And you had a similar situation here in the finals tonight as well. You know, you were just a little bit behind Connor McGregor uh, sitting there with 400 uh, to the plus, and, and she'd struck and, you know, treed. But you guys, it seemed like we're a long way away from her. What was going through your mind then? Yeah, I was, uh, I was just hoping we could hear. That wind didn't help me at all. And uh, I think she was sitting over there for over an hour, uh, treed with another coon, but couldn't do nothing in the wind, you know, but. It played out how it's supposed to play out, so we we're just happy to be here. You know, Jr. and Joe, they're, they're some of my good buddies, so I'm just happy for everybody. Yeah, well, congratulations. You had a very, very respectable run, and it was great to watch it unfold. I appreciate it. Okay, guys, so now we're finally at the moment of truth. We've got our 2022 Tournament of Champions champion, Jr. Gray over here, and uh, Connor McGregor. Buddy, congratulations, and I think that Alan's probably got something somewhere around here that he's going to slip into your hands as well. Well, I've got a check here for $50,000 for our overall winner. Congratulations, Mr. J.R. Gray. Thank you, man. Check out for you. World Championship last time, and now the TOC overall winner. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Let me tell you. This dog, oh, by the way, I've got to tell you this too. 
the three of us, Steve, Rick, and I, we had a, a pick em going on in the semifinals uh, and in the finals. We all uh, were looking at this dog closely, and I actually picked Connor to do it here in the finals. So thank you very much for making me ride on that one. But tell us a little bit. Uh, man, you're all smiles. Tell us a little bit about tonight. Man, it just, you know, when it's your time to win, it's going to be your time no matter really what you do. Uh, you know, Joe caught a bad break, and Dual couldn't hear his. He set out of hearing, and Connor just, he done what he's supposed to do, tree two coons, and he's just happy to be here. Yeah, now Connor's a very young dog. I think, what, 28 months old, yeah. what we were told? What do you see in his future? Well, hopefully a little bit more winning. Amen. How many cast wins in a row does this make for Connor? Let's see. We hunted him at the zones. We got two, and then two Friday night, two tonight, so six. So six cast wins before that coming into this, was he on a roll too? I think this year uh, we took him to the Winter Classic. He doubled up. We uh, went to the Super Stakes. We lost the first night, lost the second night. Then we doubled up on Thursday, and then we lost Friday early round. Or, yeah, let's see, no, Friday late. So, so he's been a very consistent performer all the way through, it sounds like. Good to me. Yes, sir. Well, congratulations again, man. I know all you guys are all smiles, very happy. It's 4 a.m. and nobody looks exactly worn out here. Pretty easy to still be feeling good when you've got a trophy like this and uh, a check like that that you're taking home with you. So, folks, that's just about it. Uh, obviously, you can see here we've got the trophy, $50,000. We have our UKC 2022 Tournament of Champions champion, Conor McGregor and J.R. Gray. On behalf of everybody here at the United Kennel Club and my co-host, our expert analyst that we had here tonight with us and all weekend, Steve Burkholder and Rick Stretch, I'm J. Paul Jackson. Thank you so much for sticking with us through this live stream, guys. Look forward to coming back next year. It's been a great, great night, and we really appreciate everyone watching, and congratulations again to our winners.